Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto reincarnated with the power of Primordial Gohan? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. The laughter of a young child drifted over the heavily forested land close to the Sun residence. Chi Chi, wife of the legendary hero of Earth, Sun Goku, stopped her work in the kitchen to look out the open window at the speck that was dancing in the sky with more agility than any bird or plane. Though her face twisted into a frown, she couldn't help but feel proud of her son. After all, how many mothers in the world could brag that their kid had single handedly saved the world from the threat posed by the freakishly powerful android, Cell? Now her eldest son was 13 and was currently taking a break from his studies. Chi Chi would not have another karate bum in this house. Gohan would get an education and be a productive member of society, damn it. She loved her husband dearly, but really, the man needed to get a job. Though that possibility had vanished at the Cell Games, she had found out about what had happened at that vile tournament. Goku had committed the ultimate sacrifice to save the planet from the newest threat to the Earth. It hadn't been enough though, and Cell had returned, greater and more terrible than ever. Her son had taken his father's place as the protector of the planet and killed the evil android in one final Kamehameha duel. Peace had returned and Chi Chi had suggested, more like bullied, but she would never admit that, that Gohan resume his studies. High up, at the altitude that most aircraft cruised at, son Gohan grinned his father's grin and cut his kai, allowing himself to fall out of the sky. He sent himself into a series of tumbles and spins that would have made any normal human pilot pass out. Gohan was anything but normal. In fact, he wasn't even pure human. He was a half Saiyan, because his father was a full blooded member of that warlike race, and his mom was a normal human woman. He was just glad his dad wasn't an arrogant mean guy like Vegeta. His face lit up at the sight of a cloud rushing straight up at him. The half Saiyan cut his free fall and powered straight down an aura of blue key blazing into existence around him. The boost in power meant he could go even faster and he streaked down towards the airborne pocket of water vapor like a meteor falling through the sky. The cloud suddenly sprouted a tentacle as Gohan's passage blew the white object in half. The boy himself emerged from the tentacle, heading straight down at a speed approaching Mach 1. Seconds before he hit the ground, he stopped dead before flashing off in another direction blasting through undergrowth and making hurricane winds that shook leaves and rattled trees for close to a mile to either side of him. Chi Chi smiled as her son blazed out of the trees with a roaring wind right behind him. Gohan touched down, skidding from the tree line nearly 50 yards away right up to the front door of the house. She caught a glimpse of his windswept face before the front door opened and Gohan came in. The woman's face brightened as she heard Gohan's footsteps head up the stairs, followed by his bedroom door closing. Now there was a good boy. Going right back to his studies like a good boy. Gohan listened at the door carefully, checking to see if his mom was coming up the stairs to see if he really was doing his homework. Nothing, guess she wasn't going to come check on him. Good thing too. Bulma had invited him over to Capsule Core to see a new invention she'd come up with. The inventor had promised that the Demi Saiyan had never seen anything like this before. The owner of the world's leading capsule manufacturer had called Gohan close to three months ago, asking him if he wanted to see the machine. He would have taken off during the flight he just had, but he knew that his mom would be timing him to the second. The teen had quickly agreed and promised Bulma that he would come just as soon as he could. That had taken a while because Chi Chi kept coming up to check on him whenever she felt like it. She'd caught him training once and there had been hell to pay. That had happened once and kept training knowing he had to protect the world from people like Cell and Bojack. Now he had a chance and he wasn't about to pass it up. He snuck over to the window, even going as far as to float a little bit to keep his footsteps non-existent. Gohan lifted into the sky and made sure that he stayed above the house, so Chi Chi wouldn't be able to look out the window and see him leaving. When he was finally above cloud level, he turned to face West City and blasted off in a flash of blue. Bulma was in a special room in Capsule Corps. It was her private lab, where she performed all her most dangerous experiments. She didn't even allow Vegeta in here, not that the prideful Saiyan prince ever bothered to take a break from his vicious training schedule to come and visit. She was expecting Gohan to come and see this, 
but knew that it might be a while. Chi Chi had her son in a death grip and kept shoving his nose in the books. The blue haired genius felt glad that Vegeta trained as hard as he did. At least one of her family and friends would be able to step up to defend the planet should the need arise. Which it did every few years. The intercom buzzed, startling her. Hitting the key, she said, Yes, Ms. Bulma, a son Gohan is here to see you, her secretary said. Bulma grinned. Finally, she would be able to have Gohan's input. The boy learned fast, she would give him that, so she had started giving the half say and more, hands on, lessons in physics and things like that. Every now and again, she would invite him over to spend the day helping her with inventions. Thank you, send him down to Lab 66A. Yes, ma'am. The intercom clicked off and Bulma crossed over to the console that controlled the massive machine in the center of the lab. All the unnecessary things like the tables, beakers and flasks, basically everything that defined a lab, had been capsulized and put in a little bin sitting behind the console. The machine itself was a monster. A huge ring sat on a large steel plate, the edges of the slightly oval-shaped ring reaching almost to the walls of the lab. It was steel gray with purple squares inset with blue gems of some kind at the top, bottom, and each end. Cables as thick as Vegeta's chest trailed from all over the bottom of the steel plate. Some held coolant, some siphoned off waste generated during the power up, and one brought power up from the nuclear generator that supplied the electricity to run this thing and tear the fabric of space time. A hiss sounded behind her, and Bulma turned to greet her visitor, a warm grin on her face. Hey, Gohan. Hi, Bulma. The black haired teen strode into the room, wearing a blue and white t shirt and jeans. He looked surprisingly normal compared to his father and Bulma's husband, who both wore workout clothes or a GI 24 hours a day. Bulma suspected that Gohan's overprotective mother had something to do with this. Seriously, Chi Chi was good girl, but she really needed to let go and let Gohan do what Gohan wanted to do with his life, is this it? Yep, she said proudly. This thing can open a doorway to other dimensions. It's still a little unstable, but I think that most of the bugs that would make the transition lethal to anyone below you guys' stamina are gone. Have you tried to send anything across? Gohan asked interested with this pretty cool machine no until now i've been just trying to get a stable connection want to see it work sure wait a sec bulma went to the console that ran the whole operation while gohan stood at the base of the steel plate that held the portal now the half saiyan noticed thick channels carved into the spaces in between the four gems he had just enough time to wonder what the heck they were for when he heard a deep whine that quickly escalated straight up the scale and passed from the range of both human and Saiyan hearing. Gohan looked back and saw Bulma hard at work, flicking switches and turning dials. The four gems lit up, glowing brighter and brighter before lighting surged from each gem and raced through the channels in the oval until a ring of pure energy outlined the thing and each gem glowed like a supernova. Bits of energy coalesced in the ring gathering in the center, making a spot that shone with the intensity of a sun with a sharp crack, the sun erupted and formed a shimmering window that looked like water or mercury suspended in the air. Next images began to flash across the screen. There was a huge moon-sized space station blowing up. A swordsman with flaming red hair wielding a katana with supreme skill, another red-haired guy that wore a black kimono and had a sword shaped like a kitchen knife. The images flashed faster and faster before stopping on a bird's eye view of a dirt road lined with trees. So peaceful looking. Gohan thought as he stepped up on the plate. His messy hair stood up on end like it did when he transformed to Super Saiyan 2 the closer he got to the portal. He was mere inches away from it, looking with great curiosity at the image displayed. Bulma finished up at the control station, the portal finally stabilized, and looked up. What she saw froze her heart. Gohan was inches from the portal and was slowly getting closer, centimeter by centimeter. Gohan. No, that was the wrong thing to do. Her shout startled him and that jerk was enough. Before her eyes, Gohan pitched forward and fell through. The instant he did, the portal began to go critical. She had no choice. The generator wasn't meant for such a huge mass to be introduced at once. Now it was in danger of exploding which would only wipe out all of West City. Hating herself every moment, Bulma lifted a cover and exposed the emergency cutoff. She flicked it without hesitation, not willing to sacrifice a whole city just to get Gohan back. All the cables blew away, 
propelled by explosive bolts on the connectors and the resulting energy backlash from the sudden disconnection fried every circuit in the control panel, raising the acrid scent of melted silicone and wiring. Deprived of power, the portal winked out from existence almost immediately. Bulma could only hope that Gohan had made it through in one piece. She didn't want to have him stuck between dimensions for eternity. Gohan hurtled down a swirling vortex of color and light. The tunnel seemed to stretch for eternity. The tunnel scintillated and sparked with every color in the rainbow and a few new ones too. Static electricity flared from the Saiyan's body as he flew forward. In front of him, long trains of glowing green balls of energy, looking like spirits hung on a rosary, twisted and contorted around him, making him dizzy. After what seemed like forever, a white light began to shine in the distance, growing ever closer. In between him and the exit, were two yellow streaks that were heading straight toward him. Suddenly, Gohan was uneasy. Something was screaming at him not to let those balls of light touch him. He tried to twist out of the way, fire a blast of key, anything. There was nothing he could do. His scream didn't make a noise in void between dimensions as the yellow light hit him full in the chest, vaporizing his shirt and exposing his torso. He was too busy screaming from the pain that assailed him to care. It felt like someone had pushed a branding iron to every nerve in his body. His eyes were closed, so he didn't notice what the light had left behind. Two black kanji had etched themselves into his skin. They were the symbols for the numbers one and two. In the next instant, he was passing through the white light and into the world beyond, a world that would test him just as much, and even more, than the battles with Cell and Bojack combined had done. Twelve-year-old Uzumaki Naruto strode down the quaint lane with not a care in the world. It was his first time outside the gates of Konohagakure and he was psyched. It didn't matter that he was here with that stuck-up Prissy, Sasuke, and his beloved Sakura-chan was always fawning over the brooding Uchiha. Nor did it matter that Kakashi-sensei wouldn't teach him anything cool. Hell, even the old bridge builder that Team 7 was escorting couldn't bring down his spirits. That old man could sit on a railroad spike for all he cared. It was a beautiful day and the temperature was warm. The sky turned an angry end of the world black, blotting out the sun a chill wind whipped down the dirt road the group was traveling on, tousling hair and whipping Sakura's dress around. Thankfully, she wore shorts underneath so she didn't have to worry about showing off her panties. Odd. Sakura turned to look at her masked sensei, her long pink hair whipping in the strong gale. Sensei? What is it? The masked ninja turned his only visible eye, the only part one could see of his face, onto her. Strange weather we're having a. Eh? Now Sasuke broke in. What does that have to do with anything? Yeah, Naruto added, hyper as ever, so it got a little stormy. What's wrong with that? The masked ninja sighed heavily, wishing, not for the first time, that he'd remained with Anbu. But no, he just had to leave and teach Jenin's. Great. What a way to earn a living. Naruto, it was clear a moment ago. There wasn't any hint of a storm. So why is it getting all gloomy now? Some kind of enemy jutsu? Sasuke asked, thinking it to be the most probable explanation. Kakashi shook his head. No this would be beyond cage level at the very least, and I don't think that there is anyone that powerful in existence right now, he trailed off as another phenomenon made itself known in that moment. The sky began to swirl, like someone would see in a hurricane. Lightning arced over clouds, most of it coming from the eye-like hole that had opened up. The electrical storm began to pick up in intensity and frequency before a bulge of white light pushed at the edges of the hole. Naruto thought it looked like something was about to push its way out. The blonde was proven right a moment later when something blasted out of the hole with enough force to hit them with a shockwave, even as far away as they were. The thing crashed into the ground a few miles away, sending a cloud of debris screaming towards them. Kakashi had just enough time to make a cage bunshin to knock the genin to the ground and tackled a cursing Tazuna to the ground himself before the dust cloud and shockwave hit them. Kakashi waited a split second and was rewarded for his caution as a searing heat blast slammed into them with enough force to make him break out in a cold sweat almost immediately. After semi-quiet had been returned, only then did the copy Nin let his charges up. Let's move out, he commanded sharply showing the serious side he usually hid under a cloak of laziness and chronic tardiness. Someone may have been near that. We need to make sure that if anyone's there, they're not dead. Yes, sensei. 
The three genin shouted before bounding into the trees with more strength and agility than any normal person close to their age. Tazuna was left to run at the classic human pace, accompanied by Kakashi's shadow clone. Kakashi was right to see if someone was there in the epicenter of the blast. Now, under a clearing sky, there was indeed something to behold. Sun Gohan laid face down, shirtless, and clearly either dead or out cold. If someone got close enough to his literally smoking body, though, they would see that the young teen was still breathing, having survived the harrowing trip from his dimension. The first thing that Gohan became aware of was the all consuming pain that rumbled up and down his nervous system. He stirred, picking himself up with a groan, only managing to get his chest, suspiciously bare of any kanji etched into him, before collapsing back. His head throbbed viciously and made the world swirl around him. Nausea and disorientation proved to be too much for him, and he dry heaved for close to a minute before his stomach decided it had done enough to torment him. Blackness swirled around him, and as it consumed him, he heard someone shouting for help. Who could it be? Then everything went away and Gohan knew no more. Kakashi cast an appraising and cautious glance over the crumpled form of the kid who'd been in the center of the disturbance. The boy was young, around his squad's ages, if a little older. He was muscled, very well defined, as if he was like them, built for power and speed. A general rule of thumb was that the more defined your opponent, the faster and stronger they were. It wasn't a solve-all rule, especially in cases like the Akamichi, but Hitaki thought that it would apply for this scenario. If it was true, this kid could be just as strong as Kakashi himself. This teen also seemed to be able to take a great deal of punishment and come back for more, if the numerous cut, bruises and lacerations were anything to go by. Sakura was busy smearing an ointment that helped to speed the healing process on the worst of the kid's wounds. She thought it was a good thing that she followed that old saying that said, always be prepared. This ointment, combined with a few common herbs in the area would cut the healing time in half, and with this kid, any cut was good. Sasuke was indifferent, who cared what happened to this loser? It wouldn't matter in the end, the Uchiha would ascend beyond all opposition and kill his older brother. His pride wouldn't allow him to admit that he was a little intimidated by this guy. He only looked a year or two older than Sasuke himself, but he had physical strength. That was quite plain, he, like Kakashi, had picked up on Gohan's build and knew that this would be something to watch out for. Sasuke only hoped that this guy knew some half-assed techniques to teach to him. Naruto was trying to not poke this weirdo with a stick. He knew Sakura-chan, though, if he even tried, he would be hit really really hard by that heavy backpack of hers. As it was, the hyper-blonde contented himself with squatting a few feet away and staring at the unconscious kid with his squint face. Just who the hell was this guy? Ah, all this wondering and thinking made his head hurt. He decided to stroll over to the bushes to see what he could dig up. Naruto, wait, we're leaving. Kakashi's voice drew everyone's attention to him. I'll carry our friend here at least until we get to Tazuna's village. We can decide what to do then, or if he wakes up, we can ask him. The three genin nodded and followed their sensei over to Tazuna who was just catching up. The Kakashi clone poofed from existence and the group of five continued on their way, with Kakashi carrying Gohan. Night fell, and the group stopped to camp for the night, and Kakashi decided to give his bedroll to the mysterious visitor. After getting the kids settled in, they set the watch and began to drop off to sleep. Hitaki had decided that he would take first watch, and settled into the most comfortable tree branch he could find. As he scanned the darkness, careful not to look at the fire and fry his night vision, Kakashi's gaze fell on the strange kid that they had picked up. The masked ninja didn't know why they had taken the boy with them. What if he was an enemy shinobi? It wasn't that strange for other villages to send even new genins out on hunt and kill missions. Konoha didn't do it, preferring to keep the green genins at home until they could get promoted to Chunin. The first thing that Gohan became aware of was that his aches and pains had greatly diminished. It actually felt like he'd be able to sit up without puking up nothing again. Next he registered that he was warm. He could hear the crackling of a fire and could just make out the gentle chirping of crickets. It had to be nighttime. Finally, he stirred and opened his eyes. He was in a very comfortable sleeping bag, in a clearing of some kind. Arrayed around him were four other people. Three appeared to be kids his age, a boy with blonde, 
a boy with black hair and a girl with pink hair. Some might find it strange to see someone with pink hair, but Gohan was used to seeing aliens and people change their hair color at will. Pink hair was pretty tame after all that. So, you're awake? The young Saiyan whirled at the sound of the voice and saw a lanky man with only a single visible eye. The rest of his face was hidden beneath a headband with a metal plate that had a stylized leaf etched into it. He also had a green flak vest on over a black bodysuit. He also had pouches that clearly had weapons inside. Who, where am I? Gohan asked, feeling real groggy. He could remember the portal incident, but what happened after that was a big black blank. Something happened to him on his way to this dimension, but for whatever reason, he had no clue what it was. You're on a road about halfway to the Wave Country, the masked guy told him. Wave Country, was kind of name was that. It was pretty self-explanatory, but still, he decided that he had to know who he was with. Who are you? He asked, feeling a little more alert now that his brain was starting to process again. Now he just had to figure out how to get back to his dimension. Gohan didn't think that Den knew that he was gone and something told him that Kaiosama, the guy his dad was living with right now, wouldn't pick up on it, seeing as he was a lord of the northern section of his galaxy. Gohan was on his own. His only hope was that Bulma would be able to get the generator working again and pull him back. I am Hitaki Kakashi. The masked man's deep voice startled the young fighter and he jumped, forgetting that he'd even asked the guy his name. How about you? It would be rude not to tell me your own name after asking me mine. Gohan thought the guy had a point, so he answered. I'm Sun Gohan. Sun Gohan, Kakashi murmured, as if he was trying out the kid's name. Where are you from? Gohan frowned, wondering how to phrase this without coming off as insane. I'm from, a real long way away. There, that would have to do until the half Saiyan could figure out how to break this down to believable levels. Somewhere not of this world. Kakashi's question threw Gohan for a loop. It was clear that the man knew that he wasn't really from around this particular dimension. Hataki, for his part, knew that he'd hit the proverbial nail on the head. Gohan had come from that anomaly in the sky this afternoon. The child should consider himself fortunate that Konoha Nins had found him and not others. Other shinobi, especially the Mist Village Ninja, weren't known for their hospitality and travelers on the roads needed to watch their backs at all times. Yeah, I'm from another dimension, whatever Kakashi had been expecting, it sure wasn't that. The look on his face would have been comical, if one, the situation wasn't so serious, and two, if the Junin's face had been exposed. Another, dimension? The masked man repeated, thunderstruck. How's that possible? Gohan sighed, running a hand through his messy black hair. Then, he took a deep breath and proceeded to tell Kakashi the whole story. He didn't know why he did it, but Gohan's reasoning was that he owed these people his life. It would be rude not to tell them just who they'd taken the time to save. Kakashi looked thoughtful at the conclusion of the kid's story. All this talk about generators and dimension jumping was making the Junin's head spin, even if he wouldn't show it. And that's what happened. Gohan finished, finally stopping. He'd told Kakashi everything that happened at the lab. He wanted to let off on what he could do. Gohan knew Kakashi could tell that Gohan wasn't normal. After all, how many normal people could survive a trip like that? Well, Gohan looked at this masked man who had an unusual feeling key, as if he was hiding most of it. Since you have nowhere to go and no place to get home, why don't you come with us? My team and I are on a mission to help that old guy over there. After we complete it, you can come and stay with us in Kanahagakur. We'll have to clear it with the village's leader, but the Sandam Hokage is a benevolent man. We shouldn't have a problem. Thank you. Gohan murmured quietly, meaning every word. Now he had a place to stay. The Super Saiyan had no problem living in the wilderness, but really, who actually wanted to do that? Piccolo would say that he would, but that was an outright lie. The Namekian lived at the lookout with Dend, not out even farther than Gohan did. Don't mention it, Kona has a big place. One more person won't make a difference. With the finality implied in Kakashi's voice, Gohan knew that the conversation was over and it was time to rest. But first the young visitor had something to take care of. He got up, stumbling a little. Gohan still felt a little woozy from the dimension shift. Once in the woods, 
he pulled a little item that looked a lot like a makeup compact. It couldn't have been any different. This was his capsule case. He popped it open and selected one of the pill-looking gadgets inside. He pushed the little plunger on the top and waited just a moment. There was an explosion of smoke and the little capsule had turned into Gohan's favorite GI, complete with the weighted cape that Piccolo had given him just before the start of the Cell games. The young guardian of the earth scrambled into the soft, worn clothes and tied the blood-red sash around his waist and pulled on the thin but durable shoes. The cape and tattered remains of his jeans went back into the capsule along with his tennis shoes. Now appropriately attired for this latest adventure, Gohan returned to camp, startling Kakashi with his sudden clothing change, but the masked Junin said nothing and waited until Gohan was asleep before waking Naruto up for his shift. The next day found everyone up, helping to break camp. Gohan was noticeably missing from the proceedings as Kakashi had asked the Z fighter to go and see if he couldn't gather some fish from a nearby stream or something before everyone woke up. Hey, Tazuna said suddenly, looking around puzzled. Where's that weird kid you decided to take with us? Kakashi sighed. Tazuna had caught it before his students, who were supposed to be able to recognize things like this. The other three members of the little party stopped what they were doing and looked around. Hey, he's right. Sakura exclaimed, isn't he supposed to be unconscious for a little while longer? Yeah, what gives, Kakashi-sensei? Naruto added, asking what was on the minds of all three genins in the process. There was a sudden rustling in the bushes that had all the ninja, except for Kakashi, reaching for weapons. The bushes parted and Gohan emerged. Five very decently sized fish slung over his shoulder on a rope that Kakashi noticed had been woven out of some kind of wild grapevine the young Saiyan had found while scouting for fish. Ah! Gohan, excellent work, I see you found us breakfast, the lanky Junin remarked, breaking the sudden silence over the camp. The black haired powerhouse headed over to the fire and set his catch down. He straightened up and grinned the infamous sun grin at the lazy shinobi. Thanks, Kakashi san. It wasn't that hard. If you go in the early morning they're easier to catch because they're eating. The Junin nodded approvingly, knowing that himself, and added the fact that Gohan could fend for himself to the list of attributes that he'd already picked up about the boy. Gohan appeared to notice the other three kids for the first time. He strode over to them and the four stood in a stare down, waiting to see who would do what first. The young Z fighter finally smiled and raised a hand in greeting. Uh, hi? He sounded like he was really unsure of himself. In fact he was. All the training he did, combined with where he lived and all the studying he did meant that he never really got to meet many kids his age. Um, my name is Sun Gohan. Well, that wasn't so hard. I'm Haruno Sakura. It's nice to meet you Gohan-san. The girl with the pink hair said brightly. She didn't seem so bad. This was going rather well for his first chat with people his age. Next up was the blonde. Gohan could feel pure energy pouring off the boy not key, even though he had an abundance of that, including an ominous, evil feel that was underlying his normal key signature. Gohan didn't feel as if the blonde was evil, but he definitely held a power to be wary of. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. I love ramen and I'm gonna be Hokage. Gohan had to grin and shake his head at the blonde's exuberance and energy. This would be very exciting getting to know this kid. Now Gohan's gaze rested on the last child in the group. He had an arrogant feel to him. This guy also had the look of someone who had something to prove and would go to any length to do it. H.N. Uchiha Sasuke, he said simply before turning and walking away. H. Hey. Sasuke kun. Wait up. Sakura called, chasing after the brooding kid. Gohan's face fell. Did he do something wrong? Just what had he done to deserve such a cold reception? Ah. Don't mind him. Naruto told Gohan with a bright grin folding his arms behind his head. Sasuke bastard's just a stuck-up spoiled brat. The hyper kid changed the subject fast. Come on. Let's help Kakashi sensei get ready. It was past noon almost five days later and everyone had gotten comfortable with Gohan being around. Sakura had even gotten friendly enough with him to add, Kun, to his name. Nothing much phased Naruto and the blonde didn't take much time to adjust and was treating the half saiyan like he'd known him for years. As for Sasuke, well, not much progress had been made there. The stoic genin almost seemed to regard Gohan as a threat, or perhaps, didn't consider the fighter human because of his method of arrival in this dimension. 
Either way, the Uchiha rarely said anything to their newest arrival, and when he did, his answers were monosyllabic and cold. After a particularly frosty snub, Gohan decided that he would take it up with Kakashi. Hey, Kakashi? The silver-haired Junin looked down at the young warrior. Yeah? What's with Sasuke? He's always blowing me off. His reward for the question was an eye smile from the copy Nin. Don't let it get to you, Gohan. Hitaki replied, Sasuke has a lot of grief in his past. The Uchiha clan was once a very prominent clan within Kanahagakur. They had everything, power, prestige. They commanded the police force within Konoha. The Uchiha even had a very powerful Keke Jenke called the Sharingan. Sasuke had even more, being the son of the clan head at the time. Then his brother decided to go rogue. Rogue? Yeah. Uchiha Itachi was the single greatest genius that clan ever produced. Then, for whatever reason, he decided to kill his entire clan. The entire clan? Gohan was clearly shocked by the Masked Shinobi's story. It was akin to his father, son Goku, deciding to butcher the entire human race. Kakashi nodded at Gohan's exclamation. Yeah, everyone including his own family. Except for Sasuke. No one knows why Itachi left Sasuke alive, but the big thing now is Sasuke is driven by the desire to restore his clan and kill Itachi. To that end, he has gotten it into his head that he doesn't need anyone but himself to do what he desires. I know Naruto told you not to personally and he's right. Sasuke's like that with everyone. That was the only major thing that happened that day. Little did anyone in the group know that it was about to get a lot more interesting. The day had started on a tense note. Naruto had managed to really piss Sasuke off and the Uchiha had made a biting remark that had the blonde genin out to prove his stuff as a shinobi. I'll show him. Pounded through Naruto's head again and again. He hopped forward, scanning every little detail. He jumped at a small noise and whipped a shuriken at the source of the disturbance. The enemy had proven to be a rabbit. Naruto you idiot, Sakura yelled, driving her fist into Naruto's head and sending the blonde skidding, stopping a few feet from Gohan, eyes swirling. While Gohan looked over Naruto for any major injuries, Kakashi was more interested in the rabbit, now very dead from Naruto's attack. Odd. That's a snowshoe hair. They should have brown coats this time of year not white. This one's been raised in captivity. That means it was sent here as a distraction. He had just registered that this was a trap, and they had just waltzed right into it. Get down! Kakashi yelled, just as a huge disc of death spun from the trees behind them. Gohan saw the spinning sword clearly, his eyes being used to high speed combat. He had just enough time to grab Sakura and Naruto and throw them to the ground as Kakashi handled Tazuna and Sasuke. The spinning blade slammed and stuck in a tree. Gohan picked himself up, snapping into a stance, ready to do battle with the shirtless figure now standing on the long hilt of the sword. The man was glaring back over his shoulder at them with flinty eyes and, though the bandages on the lower half of his face obscured it, a malicious bloodthirsty sneer. Just who is this guy? Gohan wondered. His key was fearsome, pressing around them like an unseen blanket. A hard hand on his shoulder made him look up at the owner. Kakashi glared down at him, his harai ate in the proper position, revealing his left eye. That side of his face had a vicious scar that ran vertically from his hairline down to the edge of the mask, but that was nothing compared to the eye itself. It was a vivid crimson, with three comma-like dots etched into the iris. Gohan, Kakashi rumbled his personality doing a complete 180 from what it had been. This was the true Hitaki Kakashi. Kakashi the former Anbu captain, who'd been in the shinobi world since he was a young child. No let me handle this. Go protect Tazuna with the others. All right. Gohan agreed, knowing that this was not the time to be arguing with the Junin, sprinted the distance to the bridge builder, taking up a position with the other three to keep this guy at bay. Between the four kids, they had every possible approach covered. Cruel laughter floated over the break in the trees where the group was. They were on a dirt path that led to a small lake. The source of the laughing was the man on the sword. Hitaki Kakashi. The infamous copy ninja. You're listed in the Mist Bingo book as a wanted criminal. The bandages around the lower half of the man's face stretched and warped as the man grinned even bigger. He knelt on the sword's handle as easily as if he was on a sidewalk. He grabbed the handle, 
bracing his foot on the tree before pushing off and blurring out of sight. A disembodied voice drifted from the forest around them. Kakashi, I'm going to enjoy killing you. The chilling statement was accompanied by another bout of chilling laughter. What the hell's going on here? Naruto whispered to no one in particular. Momochi Zabuza, a missing nin from the Mist Village. They want him for an attempted coup d'etat on the Mizukage. It failed and Zabuza was forced to take a few loyal followers and flee. He's been on the run ever since. Kakashi answered, mismatched eyes scanning everywhere as an eerie mist began to roll in on the area. Gohan felt his heart pounding like a drum against his ribs. He felt apprehensive about this, thrown into a battle that wasn't his, but his father and Piccolo would kill him if they ever found out that he could have made a difference and done nothing. A quick sweep with his senses had revealed nothing. Zabuza, it appeared, was just as adept at concealing key as Piccolo or Cell were. It would be tough to pick him out when the missing nin didn't want to be found. This mist wasn't helping matters any. Gohan couldn't see all that well, which meant his reaction time would be severely limited. That was obviously the point of this technique. Sasuke. Kakashi's sharp voice startled everyone as the mist began to blow away, coinciding with a sharp spike in Kakashi's key that hit Gohan like a hammer. Clearly the masked shinobi was more skilled than he let on. The silver-haired man continued, calm down. I will not allow my comrades to die. That is absolute. Sasuke was shaking like a leaf in the wind. Gohan figured that Kakashi had picked up on the boy's discomfort, even as he tried to locate their enemy. Shinobi, it appeared, had excellent situational awareness. Gohan would have to remember that in the future. Too bad you'll have to break that promise, Kakashi, said a familiar voice from the center of the Genin's defensive formation. There were shouts of surprise and shock from the three green warriors, but both Gohan and Kakashi whirled, trying to the find a way to help Tazuna. To the young Saiyan's eyes, Kakashi appeared paralyzed, just staring at them helplessly. Zabuza swung his giant meat cleaver and bisected Tazuna at the chest. Gohan's eyes widened in horror as the two halves of the old man sprayed blood everywhere and thudded to the ground. Something splattered against Gohan's cheek and the half Saiyan touched it with a trembling hand. He got a surprise, though, when he looked at it. Water. He murmured, wondering how water had splashed him. What did you say? Zabuza asked, having heard the young guardian's voice, did you say? Water. A third voice interrupted as cold steel touched Zabuza's neck. Yes, he did. Kakashi Sensei. Naruto and Sakura shouted together. Somehow, Kakashi had managed to substitute Tazuna with a Mizu Bunshin hiding the real bridge builder safe in the brush of the forest-ringed lake. The real Tazuna scrambled out of some bushes a moment later. A mirthless laugh split the chill misty air. Zabuza apparently found the fact that he was being held at knife point highly amusing. Kakashi held the kanai a little closer to the mist nin's neck. What's so funny? The leaf junin growled out. His mist counterpart's laughter just redoubled, his sides shaking from it. You, Hitaki. The other ninja gasped out, you actually think that I'm real? With that, the man dissolved into nothing more than a splash of water. A bunshin? Kakashi yelled at himself, not believing that he'd fallen for such a simple trick. He hesitated for but a half second, but it was enough. Look out! Sakura's yell came too late. Zabuza was already behind him, swinging his sword. Kakashi had to act and he had to act fast. His gloved hands flew together making a seal for a jutsu that he hoped would be able help him survive. Zabuza's sword slashed Kakashi in half, and everyone had a look of horror, just before the blood and body parts turned into a spray of water that drenched the four kids at the scene. Another clone? Naruto asked, dumbfounded. So this was what it was like to be involved in a battle with a real ninja? The blonde suddenly realized that he had no place in this clash, and that thought scared the crap out of him. Meanwhile, Kakashi burst out of the surface of the lake with a gasp, having made a successful getaway, but instantly realized that something wasn't right here. The water was dense, as if it was a solid and not liquid. Not good. Kakashi thought desperately as a shadow fell over him. He twisted around the best he could and saw Zabuza looming over him, hands flying together to use a jutsu. His bandages warped as an insane grin lit up his features. This time, the grin was large enough to cause a gap in the wrappings and allowed Kakashi a glimpse of his mouth, complete with teeth filed to points. 
clearly he took his name as the demon of the mist village very seriously suro no justu kakashi's mind went blank as he was enveloped in a bubble of chakra enhanced water this was definitely not good how was he going to protect his squad and tazuna in this condition oh well at least zabuza had to keep contact with the water prison to keep it active then the masked shinobi caught sight of a column of water that rose up to man height and began to take on a shape crap this was about to get worse gohan watched in horror as the water took on the shape of another zabuza one was bad enough but two come on this was almost as unfair as cell's regeneration ability the situation was bad enough what with kakashi being trapped in that freaky bubble of water it looked as though the original zabuza had to be in constant contact with the bubble or the technique would dissipate if the arm he had lodged in the bubble was anything to go by well that made him an easy target for a key attack gohan slipped into a familiar stance cupping his hands at his side the heels of his hands touching no one noticed what the young saiyan was up to all attention being either on kakashi or tizuna depending on which side you were on ka me ha me he whispered softly not wanting to draw zabaza's attention to him it wouldn't matter when the kamehameha actually formed but until then best to remain as insignificant as possible run kakashi's yell stopped any thought of retaliation from all the children's minds this was over the moment i got caught take tizuna and go his water clone can only go so far yeah right and leave you here naruto shouted in return i'm not gonna let that happen the others nodded in agreement kakashi wanted to pull his hair out these kids were going to be the death of him well except for gohan the feel the kid was giving off at the moment just didn't compare to what the others looked like his squad looked scared his sharingan could just pick up the trembling knees in all three of the genins gohan on the other hand had no shake whatsoever as if he'd been down this road enough to not be afraid of confronting an enemy who was stronger than him damn it naruto just do what i say kakashi's yell froze everyone solid the masked junin hardly ever yelled much less swore so to hear him doing it now made it even more shocking take tizuna and go complete the mission no naruto's defiant yell came as no surprise to anyone what about what you told us huh you told us that if you abandon your friends you're worse than trash gohan was watching the kid as if he'd never seen him before this kid would be a great man that was apparent to the slightly older child naruto would be in the same league as people like piccolo and his dad the club for people who could lay down their life for their friends and not think twice about it the blonde's bright blue eyes blazed as he whipped out a kanai i'm gonna save him gohan's hand shot out and snagged the other kid by the scruff of his blazing orange jacket a flick of his wrist had naruto flying backward to a hard landing flat on his back gohan kun sakura's startled voice fell on deaf ears as the protector of the world stepped forward moving to stand in front of the three genins and tazuna the zabuza clone began to laugh what's this a kid who thinks he can take me on are you delusional kid you've lost it sasuke said in a low monotone you'll be killed he's a junin and you're just a kid with no obvious shinobi talent give up sasuke gohan said without turning around you don't know what i'm capable of just let me do this and don't interfere gohan kun now sakura's voice held a note of question in it as if she was seeing him for the first time what was the other boy planning gohan felt nothing but the supreme confidence of a saiyan warrior now they would all see what he could do the water clone grabbed its sword and swung it off its back waving it experimentally the bunshin grinned this would be fun gohan no you can't win kakashi screamed as loud as he could this kid was brave and resourceful that much was obvious but kakashi had yet to see the newcomer use any type of genjutsu taijutsu or ninjutsu zabuza would slaughter him even with a clone that had only 25 percent of his full strength no you're wrong i can win though gohan said it softly it was heard as clearly as it would have been had he shouted it the young half saiyan could feel his heart beginning to pound at the prospect of a fight as it always did it was the heritage that flowed through his veins saiyans lived to fight and gohan though he didn't enjoy it was no different perhaps he didn't like the thought of hurting anyone 
but he didn't mind matching his power with someone else in the ultimate test of survival. Gohan tensed, digging deep within himself to pull at his key. To everyone's surprise, the air around the Super Saiyan began to ripple, as if the kid was giving off a great heat. Ha! Gohan's war cry split the sky and the ground underneath his feet began to crack, as if the earth itself could no longer support the weight of his power crushing down on it. What the hell, Kakashi thought, Gohan's chakra just went through the roof. Who knew that that kid had so much? He's at least as strong as Zabuza and me. Kakashi's mismatched eyes widened in shock a moment later as a blue flame-like aura burst into existence around the teen's body, surging wildly from the constant increase in Gohan's power level. The three genin could only watch in horrified fascination as their new friend's chakra did amazing things to the environment around him. Trees were bending backward, as if the giants wanted to be nowhere near the power that this mere kid was giving off. The cracked earth beneath his feet split again and gave way even more, making jagged spikes of rock. Gohan tensed once more before letting out an even louder yell than before. His chakra reacted in kind, blasting out from him and kicking up a wall of topsoil small pebbles and made the lake on which Zabuza had Kakashi trapped writhe as if in a hurricane. Silence followed the roaring wind, and when the smoke finally cleared, Gohan stood there, bathed in the blue aura. Slowly, it began to fade and flicker, before it popped out of existence with a pulse of static electricity. I will say it once, Gohan said with more seriousness than he felt. He knew the thing in front of him was just a clone and he had no problem killing a copy. What did make him apprehensive was killing a human. Cell had been anything but, so Gohan's hands were still clean of any blood. Zabuza, on the other hand, was human. The young Saiyan really didn't want to kill a human. Let Kakashi go. Hard onyx eyes bored straight at the real demon of the hidden mist, making the man shudder slightly. G Gohan Kun. Sakura couldn't believe what had happened just now. Gohan had released some enormous energy so much so that it was visible to the naked eye. Was, was this who he really was? Everything looked pretty tame now, but the aftermath of the release of Chakra was still around, the abused ground beneath his feet, the windswept earth, and more than one blown over tree. Even the lake was still rippling from the force of the energy the new guy had let out. Sakura. You, Naruto and Sasuke protect Tazuna-san. I can handle this guy by myself, Gohan said with a dangerous voice. Things are about to get ugly around here and I don't want to hurt some new friends of mine. Laughter met the Saiyan's words. Yeah right, a little squirt like you is gonna handle me single-handedly. Don't underestimate me, Zabuza's clone yelled before it sprinted straight for Gohan, who had his hands relaxed at his sides. The Mizu Bunshin leapt high into the air, his Zanbeidu ed back to strike. Gohan did nothing as the sword came straight down striking the ground with enough force to kick up a debris cloud. Gohan. Sakura screamed as Naruto and Sasuke just watched with horrified eyes. This Sabuza guy really didn't like to kid around. He just killed a 13-year-old boy without a second thought. Too bad, Kakashi. The real Zabuza said to the imprisoned Leaf Nin. That kid really had some spunk. Shame he couldn't play longer. Kakashi only glared at the sadist Mist Nin vowing to get out of this thrice damned prison and make the bastard pay. No matter what it took, Momochi Zabuza would die. The clone shouldered his sword. Now, he said, who should I kill next, the four that he had his sights set on gulped, trying to figure out a way to get rid of this annoying jutsu. A voice halted any plan that they might have come up with. You haven't killed anyone yet. The clone's eyes widened when he felt his sword rock a little. Its head snapped around and saw Sun Gohan in one piece and without a scratch, standing lightly on the edge of his blade as if it was a thing he did all the time. Ignoring the cries of relief from Sakura and admiring whoops from Naruto, Gohan simply disappeared. Shocked looks passed between everyone at the sudden vanishing act. The clone didn't even have time to form a question before a fist slammed into his gut with enough force to split a mountain. Water sprayed everywhere as Gohan lowered his hand and turned to glare at Zabuza. One more time. He called to the Mist Shinobi. Let Kakashi go. This time he actually got a reaction out of his enemy. Zabuza did what Gohan told him and pulled his arm out of the bubble that held Kakashi hostage. Except, instead of retreating as Gohan hoped, he charged straight for him like a runaway bull, Kakashi hot on his heels, 
trying to catch the other shinobi before he could get to Gohan. Sure the kid could handle a clone, but this was the real. Zabuza mated to the half Saiyan and swung his sword in a flat arc. Damn, Kakashi was too late. Gohan saw the sword incoming and casually raised a hand, palm out, to intercept the swing. Gohan kun. No, he'll slice your hand off, Sakura yelled at the top of her lungs, trying to get the fourth teen in their group to at least dodge. Zabuza's sword made contact, with a ball of key that formed in the Saiyan hybrid's hand. Impossible. Zabuza shouted, bloodshot eyes wide, shocked that the boy had been able to channel chakra without the need for hand seals, and what's more, made the chakra visible and dense enough to stop a sword. Such a thing was unheard of. Gohan made the key go critical and explode, sending Zabuza's sword spinning out over the lake and sent the man wielding it flying backward. He didn't get very far, because the Z fighter grabbed his arm and pulled the older warrior into a vicious knee strike. Zabuza felt the blow and saw stars as the wind was knocked out of him. He didn't get any time for a reprieve, though, because the kid followed up with a left back fist, spinning to add momentum and force to the strike. The missing nin was sent screaming away, flying just a few feet from the ground, out over the lake and ripping an ice white wake in his path because of the air his body displaced. No, way, for once, Naruto was at a loss for words as a geyser of dirt erupted on the far side of the tiny lake the group had turned into a battlefield. Before the debris could settle, Zabuza tore from the cloud, sprinting across the water at Gohan intent on finishing him off, sword or no sword. Gohan let out a short ki, his weird blue aura blasting into existence before he blazed off across the surface of the lake like a comet, speeding to a collision with his opponent. Now he can fly, Sakura yelled, holding her head, seriously, how many amazing abilities was this kid about to pull out of his ass? It would appear so, Kakashi said as he walked over to them pulling his Harai 8 into its usual place, seeing no need to help Gohan. And it also seems that our new friend Gohan has some rather unusual abilities that are at once similar to, and completely different from, what we're used to. A massive explosion of water sprayed up into the air, from which Zabuza emerged, tumbling like a rag doll, followed closely by a blue comet that could only be Gohan, both fighters streaking high into the air. It still doesn't explain how he does it, Sasuke stated bluntly, trying to keep the burning jealousy out of his voice. How had Gohan done it? What were his methods? And just how in the hell could he knock a Junin around like he was nothing? A condensation bubble erupted above them as Gohan hit Zabuza with a punch that exceeded the speed of sound, sending him screaming down from a few thousand feet up. Before he could impact, though, Gohan disappeared from sight up above and reappeared floating a few feet above the ground unleashing a brutal roundhouse kick that connected soundly with Zabuza's ribs and sent the helpless man speeding off in another direction. Zabuza finally managed to get his feet underneath him, despite the pain that surged through every inch of his body. As he skidded backward along the shoreline of the lake, he began making hand seals, hoping to buy himself a little breathing room. Gohan was blazing toward the mist nin, drawing back for a punch that would probably knock Zabuza's head off if it connected his fist rammed headlong into Zabuza's cranium, which promptly exploded into a spray of water. Another of those water clone things, Gohan realized, looking for the real man. A key spike made him whirl and look out to the middle of the lake, where Zabuza stood, making seal after seal. Sweden. Swiryuden no jutsu. Zabuza yelled as the water around him writhed and shot into the air a lot like Shenlong did when the Z fighters used the Dragon Balls to summon him only it was made completely out of water. The water took on a dragon shape and locked its yellow eyes onto Gohan before letting out a shrieking roar and diving towards him. Look out! All the spectators cried as the jutsu closed the distance. That was a very high rank jutsu and one that Gohan probably wouldn't be able to withstand. But, once again, Gohan displayed a weird way of thinking when he lowered himself into a stance and cupped his hands at his side once again. This time, everyone saw what he was doing and heard what he was saying. Ka, me, ha, me, he held the last syllable as a blue-white orb of ki burst into existence in between his cupped hands and began to shine with the intensity of a star, so much so that the people watching had to advert their eyes or risk being blinded. Gohan stared down the dragon as it closed on him, fast. Finally it was at the range that it wouldn't be able to dodge. The star in his hands glowed just a little bit brighter, a distinctive high-pitched pulsing noise becoming even louder. 
Ha! He shoved his hands forward and released the key. A giant ball of blue energy, almost as large as Gohan himself, erupted from his cupped hands and blazed toward the dragon. The two techniques hit each other with full force and the dragon was blown apart by the overwhelming might of the Kamehameha. The attack lanced out over the water, throwing up walls of water on either side as it raced for Zabuza. The criminal shinobi's eyes widened as the powerful light given off by the attack illuminated him, and then he was lost from view as the river of pure energy engulfed him. Get down! Kakashi yelled, tackling his students to the ground as the Kamehameha exploded with enough force to make the ground jump then slam into them. They were enveloped by a hail of dirt, hurricane winds and rock a second later as Gohan's immense strike expended the last of its energy. Then the light began to fade and the debris shower subsided. Finally, Kakashi felt secure enough to let his charges up. When they got their first look at the scene, their jaws dropped. Gohan was striding towards them with a massive crater and a billowing pillar of smoke as his backdrop. The young half Saiyan stopped and looked down at them before grinning sheepishly and scratched the back of his head. Whoops, sorry. I think I overdid it a little. My control isn't as good as it used to be. The others just looked at him with unbelieving expressions, as if they had never seen a 13-year-old go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a dangerous shinobi, kick his ass, and then finish the fight by vaporizing a lake and replacing it with a huge smoking crater. Gohan laughed nervously, I guess I have some explaining to do, huh? Just a little, Kakashi agreed before he stood and helped Tazuna up. But it can wait until we get to Tazuna's village. Let's get there first and then we can decide what to do from there. Right. The four kids chorused and resumed their trek to the bridge builder's village. On the other side of the column of smoke, a ornately dressed person who wore an equally ornate porcelain mask, supported a heavily injured and unresponsive Zabuza on his shoulder. He'd managed to rescue the missing Nin just before the elder shinobi could be vaporized by the unusual chakra attack from one of the copy Nin's students. Now Haku's first priority was to get his master to their hideout, provided for them by the corrupt businessman who ran this entire country, and get Zabuza San back on his feet in time to strike at the bridge builder before his masterpiece could be completed. Haku made a weird hand seal and vanished in a swirl of wind and ice shards. Finally, Team 7 made it to their destination with all members in one piece. Tazuna seemed to become a different man, walking with a spring in his step and greeting everyone he knew, although, the warriors of the group couldn't help but notice that the elderly man kept flicking a nervous glance at the bridge, fully visible now that the morning mist had dissipated. Eventually, the group arrived at a run-down shack that sat on a pier that stretched out over the water. Home sweet home. Tazuna announced brightly before rushing inside. A squeal sounded almost the moment he walked in the door. When Team 7 entered, they saw Tazuna being hugged tightly by a much younger woman. Ah. May I introduce my daughter Tsunami? The carpenter said with a distinct note of pride in her voice. Tsunami was a very pretty woman in her mid to late twenties. Like everyone in this little town, though, she was dressed in rough, homespun clothes that denoted a hard and unforgiving existence. Thank you for protecting my father. I'm sorry we had to lie about the mission statement, she said with a traditional bow. Don't worry about it, Tsunami-san, Kakashi said easily. We've already been informed of the error and have decided to continue with the mission regardless. Tsunami bowed again before bustling off to get a dinner ready for her weary father and their guests. Seeing the woman occupied and Tazuna disappearing out the front door, Kakashi decided that it would be a good time to discuss some things with his students and visitor. Come on you four, he said. We have some talking to do. The four shinobi dropped their backpacks in the guest room that Tazuna had given to them and then all the warriors left the house and followed Kakashi deep into the woods. It was close to a half hour before they finally stopped in a clearing that was ringed by redwoods just as big as the ones back in fire country. Okay. Now, Gohan, tell us just what the hell you did back there. The masked Junin said without preamble. He decided when they arrived here that he would take this matter straight to the source. Gohan shrugged. I didn't do anything that amazing. All I did was use some simple key attacks. Utter silence followed his words. What? You can use key? Sasuke asked, trying to keep the jealousy from his voice. That's impossible. Hey, Naruto said, clearly lost. He had his squint face on. What's key? It sounds a lot like chakra. Everyone else sighed, exasperated by the boy's thick skull. Sakura, Kakashi said. 
Too lazy to explain things himself to the blonde. Maybe they should get Naruto checked for ADHD. Care to explain? Sure. Okay Naruto. Listen up because I'm only gonna go over this once. You what stamina is right. Naruto nodded. Good. The body possesses two types of energy, stamina, which our body uses whenever we do something strenuous like running. The second type of energy is spiritual energy, also known as ki or kai. Chakra is made by mixing both stamina and ki together and then using it for various jutsu through the use of hand seals. Follow me so far. Yes. The blonde said, a hint of annoyance in his tone. So Gohan uses chakra. What's the big deal? A vein bulged out of Sakura's forehead. No, you idiot. Gohan uses ki not chakra. It's two completely different things. Ki can also be called life energy. Using ki is a lot more dangerous than using chakra, because whenever you use a jutsu, essentially you are using part of your life force. The kunoichi raised a threatening fist. Get it? Naruto patted the air in a gesture of submission as Sakura's shadow loomed over him. Got it. Ki, despite the dangers of overuse, is also much stronger than chakra because ki is not mixed with stamina. It also has an advantage in that the user is not required to use hand seals. Kakashi added. However, the drawback is that overuse results in death, and that the variety of techniques available to the user is very limited. Really the only difference between some of the key techniques is the power that they possess. Overuse doesn't necessarily result in death. Gohan interrupted. You have to willingly tap into your life force to use it. Key, on the other hand, is the latent power within the body. Everyone has it, it's just a matter of finding and tapping it. So, what you're saying is that I could use key? Sasuke asked, trying to be nonchalant about it. This could be the key to killing Itachi. Kakashi was the one with the answer. No shinobi cannot use ki. At the puzzled looks he got, he continued. Look at it this way, when you are first learning a technique, you practice and practice until the technique becomes second nature, right? The four teens nodded, hanging on his every word. Kakashi continued. To unlearn what you have already become accustomed to is very difficult and almost impossible. It is the same with ki and chakra. Before you became shinobi, you had the potential to use both ki and chakra. Now that you have been using chakra for a few years, your body has adapted to it. To learn to use ki now would be next to impossible. It goes the same way for a ki user as well. Gohan here wouldn't be able to use a simple bunch and jutsu, just as we wouldn't be able to use that technique that he used against Zabuza. So what happens to the ki we don't use? Sakura asked, wondering what happened to all that unused energy. We shinobi haven't really been able to figure that out yet. Kakashi answered. But the current hypothesis from many of the top medic nins is that, over time, ki gradually develops into chakra reserves. Once all that ki has turned to chakra, you hit a glass ceiling and cannot become any stronger. So then how long do we have until we can't go any higher? Sasuke asked. If this ki stuff ran out now he wouldn't be able to kill Itachi. It's only a theory and right now most of the evidence is speculation, but most of the experts say that the conversion rate is very very slow. It could take more than a lifetime for all of it to convert. Ki is also in great abundance. Gohan added. Some of it is apparent right from the start, but most of the ki is hidden deep within a person as hidden potential. Once they tap that potential, they can become exponentially stronger. I doubt that most shinobi use up all their potential in one life. Kakashi nodded in agreement. He noticed that they had been talking for so long that it was twilight. Time to go back, he said, standing up from the log he'd been sitting on. We have some training to do tomorrow. Why, Kakashi sensei? Sakura asked. Gohan killed Zabuza, didn't he? The masked Junin sighed. These kids still had a lot to learn. I doubt it. Zabuza is one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. He won't die that easily. Besides, it's better to be safe than sorry right? Now come on. I'm hungry. His tone left no room for argument and the four teenagers followed after the copy nin. Gohan awoke and noticed that it was still dark outside. He tried uselessly to fall back to sleep for close to half an hour before realizing that it was useless. Great. Up before the sun is. I hate getting up early, he groaned to himself before grabbing his capsule case and heading for the door deciding that he might as well train if he was going to be up this early. He arrived in the clearing that the five warriors had been talking at yesterday. 
or was it still today? And pulled out the capsule with his cape in it. He pulled the white garment on and shrugged a little. The thing felt a little light for him. Gohan would have to up the weight sooner or later. Maybe Konoha had a weight shop he could look at. If he got money to buy some weights with that is. The young Saiyan stretched out and began to run through some basic exercises as a warm-up. It didn't take long before he was bouncing all over the clearing, nothing more than a blur, locked in combat with enemies only he could see. Kakashi was the next to wake up, though much later than Gohan had. The sun was bathing the room in a gentle golden light. Then he noticed that Gohan's sleeping bag was empty. Odd. Where'd he go? I thought teenagers liked to sleep in. Still pondering the mystery, he entered the modest kitchen that seemed to double as a kitchen and family room for the less than rich Tazuna household. The lanky Junin was surprised to see Tsunami was up as well, getting breakfast ready for her guests. You know you don't have to do that, he said, startling the young woman, who clearly had not heard his entry. Oh, Kakashi san. You scared me, she exclaimed, one hand over her heart. It's okay though, I don't mind cooking for you. I wasn't talking about that, Hitaki answered. He swept one hand around the room, indicating the bare pantries and cabinets. I meant that you have so little. It would be rude for us to eat you out of house and home when you have barely enough for yourselves, much less three growing teens. Tsunami shook her head forcefully. I don't mind, she repeated, really I don't. It may be rude to eat up our food, but it would be even more shameful for me to allow you a room without any meals. Kakashi could see that the young woman was adamant about this and there would be no use in further pressing the argument. Suit yourself, he answered with a shrug. I'm gonna go and see if I can't find Gohan. Is he missing? Hardly. I can feel his presence on the other side of the village, I just want to make sure that he's okay. When the other three decide to get up, tell them to come to the clearing where we were at yesterday. They'll know where to go. He left and Tsunami busied herself with the kettle that sat on the meager wood burning stove. When the Junin found him, Gohan was floating some ways up, locked in a sparring match with no one. Kakashi was amazed at the boy's abilities. He was even faster than he'd let on during his battle with, no, more like pounding, of Zabuza. The young Saiyan was punching faster than anyone Kakashi had ever seen, excluding Urashi Sensei, of course. The Junin just couldn't bring himself to admit that the Yandaimi Hokage was human. Something about that blonde haired man had seemed so, godlike. He'd always given off an aura of being able to handle any situation and defeat any foe. It had been that presence that had kept many a shinobi from fleeing when the Kayubi had come to decimate the village. Finally, Gohan's furious movements slowed to the point of being visible, then stopped altogether. Sweat soaked the boy's face and G.I. Kakashi made a mental note to chuck him into the ocean if he didn't jump in himself. No way would the Junin have a member of his team reeking like a hippo on a humid day. Gohan was exhausted. He'd been going non-stop since he'd woken up and he was beat, now would be the time to go back and get breakfast, take a dip in the ocean to get this stench off of him, and then see what Kakashi had planned for the group that day. Very impressive. Speak of the devil, there was Kakashi now. No wonder you were able to go toe to toe with Zabuza. How'd you get so fast? Gohan grinned. Piccolo sensei wasn't exactly gentle when he was training me. Dad didn't take it easy on me either. Really? So you've been trained by two people? Yeah? And there's nothing like it. Let me tell you. Both of them didn't hold back or pull any punches. The kid stripped off his cape and tossed it out to the side. Kakashi's hidden jaw dropped when the clothing made the ground crack just from hitting. Man, if Guy got his hands on this kid, Kakashi didn't even want to think about it. Still, maybe Gohan would be able to give that little protege of his a run for his money. Maybe Team 7 would have to bump into Team Guy during a training session. The scarecrow grinned a little impishly. Gohan pulled out a little pill looking thing and hit something on one end before tossing it at the cape. It hit and there was a small explosion, and when the smoke cleared, the cape was nowhere to be found. The only evidence of it being there was the abused ground where the heavy thing had landed. What is that? Kakashi asked as the young Saiyan picked up the pill. He held it out to Hitaki who took it and turned it around in his hand. It was rather plain, just white with a red band running around the middle and a number on it. It didn't look like anything special, nor was there evidence of a heavy cape hidden inside. They're called Dynacaps or just capsules. A friend of mine invented them. You can hold just about anything in them 
from some clothes to a whole reservoir, if you really wanted the water. Most people put houses or something inside of them and then go camping. Kakashi whistled gently, hardly believing what this kid was telling him, even if he'd seen it with his own one eye. I assume that little tray thing has more. Yep. What do you have in there? Um, Gohan pulled out the tray and began looking at the capsules, comparing the numbers with a little card at the top, which told him what was in each capsule. I've got my training gear, a fully stocked refrigerator, some books to read in my spare time, and one empty one. Could you put people inside of one? Kakashi hoped he sounded nonchalant about it. Wouldn't it be nice? Whenever his team needed a timeout, just shove him in a capsule. Nope. Damn, so much for that idea. My little brother Godin got mad at me one time and tried to do that to me. It didn't work, which just made him even angrier. Gohan smiled at the memory, remembering how his mom had yelled at Godin for trying to stuff Gohan in a capsule and for disturbing his big brother's studies. The younger half Saiyan hadn't been able to sit down without flinching for close to a week. Kakashi. Sasuke's voice cut off the conversation the two seasoned warriors were having. They turned around and saw the other three members of their little team standing behind them. We're here. Now what did you want? Gohan thought that Sasuke sounded a little too demanding to be talking to a superior that way, but somehow the Saiyan didn't think that Kakashi would care too much. We're gonna do some training today, Sasuke. Kakashi replied, seemingly ignoring the raven haired Uchiha's rudeness, flipping the capsule back to Gohan who caught it and put it away. So what's this training we're gonna be doing, sensei? Sakura asked. Kakashi scratched his mask, making a show of thinking about it. Well, I thought we'd do something fun today. Gohan noted how all of the genin seemed to shudder at that phrase. The young half Saiyan couldn't help but wonder why. Kakashi couldn't be nearly as demanding as Piccolo had been, right? Hitaki threw a hand out behind him as if he was a game show host unveiling the grand prize. We're going to do a little tree climbing. One son Gohan couldn't help but notice that the three genin's reactions were a little underwhelming. Could, you repeat that? Sakura deadpanned, unsure if she'd heard Kakashi sensei right, did he seriously want them to climb trees? How is tree climbing training? Naruto asked, voicing the thoughts of everyone there. Oh. Kakashi sounded as if he'd remembered just why it was training but none of the teens in the group believed that for a second. You seem to be thinking that you'll be allowed to use your hands for this training, sorry, I guess I forgot to mention that little fact. No hands allowed. Uh, no hands? Naruto asked with a squint face. Then how the hell are we supposed to climb the tree? The other two nodded with his assessment. You use chakra. Shinobi generally regard the feet as the hardest place to channel chakra, even more so since the feet are usually covered by sandals. Thus it is that much harder because you have to force chakra through the rubber. Of course, it varies from person to person, but I guarantee that all three of you will fall at least once. With that, the masked Junin faced the tree behind him and proceeded to walk straight at it. When he got to it, Kakashi just kept walking, straight up the ancient giant, never once breaking stride, and finally reached the lowest branch, some ninety feet over their heads. The four teens gaped at the ease at which their leader had done it. Trust me, he called down to them, this isn't as easy as I make it look. On the plus side, though, when you're done with this and get all the way to the top, your chakra control will be much better and you'll be that much stronger. Then he dropped three kanai down to the shinobi members of the group and they got to work. Kakashi-san, what about me? Gohan asked as the junin dropped from his perch above and landed smoothly beside the Z fighter. What about you? He asked in return as he straightened up. Well. It doesn't seem fair for them to be training and me just doing nothing. Kakashi looked thoughtful for a moment before he gave Gohan an eye smile. Well, when they're done with the training, the three of them are going to go and help Tazuna out at the bridge. I've noticed that he's always a little shorthanded. Why don't you and I go there? But, if you're worried about those three, don't be. Sasuke and Naruto are both too stubborn to let someone dote on them all the time, and Sakura will be just fine as long as those two are here. The lanky man began to walk off, signaling a close to the conversation and Gohan had to scamper to keep up. Elsewhere in the wave country, not too far from where Team 7 was busy training, there was a conical hut, suspended between some trees by thick ropes of some kind, and had narrow prison-like windows cut into the exterior. This was the hideout for Momochi Zabuza. 
The demon of the mist himself, though, was busy sleeping under the watchful eye of his feminine-looking companion, Haku. The boy had removed his mask, revealing his long hair, which he kept tied up in a traditional bun, though the former hunter Nin had untied it and allowed his hair to spill down his back in a brown waterfall. As for Haku, he too appeared to be asleep, but ask any shinobi who'd been around the block a few times and they'd tell you that Haku wasn't sleeping. What he was doing was more of watching with your eyes closed, using every sense, from hearing to touch, to get a feel for his surroundings. It was proven true when the double oak doors to the bedroom opened. Though the well-oiled hinges made no sound, Haku's brown eyes flew open in an instant, his left hand, the one away from the door and out of the intruder's line of sight, flashed into a hidden pouch, grabbing some senbon needles. Now the hand withdrew, sliding the thin weapons out of the holster without a sound. Zabuza also woke up, seemingly in a coincidence, but the timing was too good for that. He'd woken up with enough time to throw a kanai, should the need arise, and with this man, that just might be necessary. Well, 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 the new arrival's voice grated on Zabuza's nerves even more than the thought of the brat who'd kicked his ass. Gatu was a short little bastard, complete with pinstriped suit, walking stick, glasses, and hired guns. The mist nin conveniently forgot that, right now, he was one of those hired guns. Never thought I'd see the day when the great demon Zabuza got his ass handed to him by a friggin' kid. How do you know about that? Zabuza asked, knowing that Haku would have withheld that information in his report. The businessman laughed, waving his cane, I got eyes in all the right places. There wasn't anyone else at that lake, bastard. The disabled shinobi ground out. I would have sensed them if there was. Now Gatu laughed outright. Whoever said that my eyes were living? Ever hear of cameras? Sheesh. You damn shinobi never really give a crap about technology do you? Always thinking those weird just you of yours will get the job done. The tiny man held up his hands in a helpless gesture as he spoke before leveling his walking stick at Zabuza. When will y'all learn that the ultimate weapon is money? Look, thanks to money, I can afford people like you. And I can bribe fools into doing what I want. No blackmail or evil jutsu needed. Face it. You're obsolete. You will not speak to Zabuza san that way. It was the first time Haku had spoken in the tiny bureaucrat's presence and there was some heat to the kid's cold tone. If you will not leave now, I will kill you. K, you kill me? Gatu asked, now rounding on Haku. He took a couple of steps forward and reached up with his cane, poking Haku roughly in the cheek a few times, like you could. Haku's arm flashed and Gatu's cane went flying, shattered into two pieces by the force of the kid's blow. The businessman stumbled backwards, almost tripping, but he bumped into a hard object. Before the tiny man could see what he'd hit, an arm snaked around his neck and a hand on the back of his head pushed forward forcing Gatu into a choke that had the man turning blue and gurgling for air in a matter of seconds. Yes. I could kill you. Haku's breath tickled the side of the man's face, and his voice was low in the short man's ear. Gatu would have even called it why if there wasn't an incredible amount of malice just beneath the surface. Haku, Zabaza's voice was filled with dark amusement at his student's actions, release him. We don't need him dead. Yet. The pressure that prevented Gatu from breathing vanished instantly as Haku promptly obeyed his master's command. He didn't get any time to catch his breath as the hunter Nin seized his arm, crunching the bones together, and hurled him to land at the feet of his hired samurai. All three took one terrified look at Haku, who raised some threatening senbon in warning, then fled. Zabuza watched as his best weapon strode over to the doors and jerked them closed, the only thing betraying his irritation. You didn't have to do anything. Haku, the laid-up Junin told the icy shinobi. He lifted the covers on his bed, revealing the hidden kanai that he could have killed Gatu with in a heartbeat, had the little idiot given him the chance. The removal of the covers also revealed just how much damage Gohan had done to the mist nin. There were bandages over much of Zabaza's bare torso, holding broken ribs and other bones together, most of them bulging from some form of hidden swelling. A massive bruise decorated what little exposed skin was visible, and, just hidden by Zabaza's body, was his right arm, bound up and splinted. Haku had been using what little medical ninjutsu he knew to speed the healing process, but it was still taking time. The sight of the injuries reminded Haku what he had wanted to ask his master when the man had the time. Zabuza san, what are you going to do about the boy who did that to you? Zabuza looked thoughtful for a minute, 
Then he looked at Haku and told him, I'm going to let you handle him. Me? His voice betrayed his surprise before he could stop himself. Yes. You're so much faster than I am and with you Keke Jenke, there's no way that brat will be able to keep up with you. Just get him alone and trap him in your little funhouse. Haku stared off into space, pondering the best way to lure Gohan into a trap. The young hunter Nin knew that it wouldn't be easy, but he'd never failed Zabuza-san before and he wasn't about to start now. It was past dark when Sasuke and Naruto dragged themselves back to Tazuna's place. They'd been training ever since Kakashi had put this little test before them, and now both boys were running low on chakra and completely exhausted. The fact that Sakura had managed to make it all the way to the top of the tree on her fourth or fifth try didn't help either of the pair's egos. So my dad uses this technique called the Kaioken and beats the big bald guy in a flash. That was when, Gohan trailed off as the door opened and Naruto and Sasuke lugged each other into the room. He'd been telling the rest of the household, at Sakura and Tsunami's insistence, about his little adventure when Vegeta and Nappa had come to Earth to try and use the Dragon Balls to attain immortality. He'd just been at the part when his father, son Goku, had shown up after training for a year with Kaiosama, and used the otherworldly guru's training to wipe the floor with Nappa. Wow! What happened to you two? Tazuna asked. You both look like you got run over by a steamroller. I suppose they were training all day. A young voice said derisively. All heads turned to the doorway that led outside and allowed one to go to other parts of the house. Standing in the door was a little kid with a blue and white hat. He had been the one who'd spoke. Why do you insist on going against Gatu? Because it's what we were contracted to do, Sakura answered, not getting why this boy was acting this way. Well then you're all a bunch of dumbasses, ignoring Tsunami's startled, Inari, at his behavior, he plowed on. You're all going to die, with that, he turned around and dashed away, slamming the sliding door to the outside as he did. Everyone looked at Tazuna and Tsunami, who both had saddened expressions. Inari. My grandson, Tazuna told them without being asked. Sorry about that. He's been that way ever since his father died a while back. His father? Kakashi asked simply. Tazuna nodded, yes, but not his biological one. The man Inari called father was a great man named Kaiza who came to us from out of nowhere. My real son-in-law had died a year or two prior, but not before he and Tsunami had Inari. Inari never really did get what it meant to die, Tsunami added. Then my husband showed up and Inari found someone he could rely on and talk to. She smiled wistfully. After seeing how those two got along, it was only natural that I marry Kaiza and let Inari have a father once again. Those were happy times, Tazuna continued with a wistful smile. Inari idolized his father like every little boy does. He looked at Gohan. Your father sounds like a great man, and Kaiza was no different. He even built a treehouse for the kid. I take it something bad happened? Kakashi asked, picking up on where this conversation was going. Tazuna scowled. Gatu. That man moved in and began subjugating us one by one. Before long, all of us were in his pocket. Kaiza was one of the few who openly opposed him. In payback for that defiance, Gatu had Kaiza executed. That stole Inari's light and he's been like this ever since. That's a shame, Sakura said sadly. She couldn't imagine what it would be like to lose your father at such a young age. Hey. He's just a spoiled little brat, Naruto said viciously, slumping forward onto the table. Naruto. How can you say that? Sakura asked scandalized. Yeah, bastard. Inari yelled, opening the door again. He'd probably stuck around to see if the shinobi and their weird friend would leave after hearing his story. What would you know about losing someone? That was a mistake. In a heartbeat. Naruto had picked Inari up by the front of his shirt and slammed him into the wall. Naruto. Kakashi snapped, his voice having the edge of a knife. Stop it, put him down, he was promptly ignored. You think I don't know? Naruto growled, his voice low and dangerous, his livid face inches from Inari's terrified one. Get over yourself. You think it's cool to sit around and cry and mope all day? Get real, crying won't get you anywhere, instead of crying. You should get off your ass and actually do something. Inari grasped the genin's wrists in a feeble attempt to pry them off. You don't know what it's like, Inari repeated. Naruto pushed him harder into the wall. The creaking of stressed wood filled the tiny kitchen. 
If Naruto wasn't careful, he might push Inari straight through the wall. No, I do know. At least you have a family. I'm hated by everyone in my village. The blonde shouted. He let go of the terrified kid, who hit the floor and stayed there, curled up, trying to make himself as small as possible. Naruto turned around, eyes shadowed by his bangs. I'm going to bed. He jerked the door open and closed it, perhaps much harder than was necessary. Kakashi Sensei. Sakura asked quietly. The Junin didn't respond right away, and when he did answer, it wasn't what they wanted to hear. Bed. Now. None of the teens were willing to question him, not with that steel in his voice. They knew that Kakashi was angry with Naruto for what he'd done. The three kids weren't wrong either, but Kakashi wasn't as mad as they thought he was. Truthfully, the silver haired Junin could understand where Naruto was coming from, probably better than anyone, barring Sasuke who'd lost his entire clan in the course of one night. Heaving a sigh, the masked man stood and headed for the door that Inari had disappeared out of. The boy whom Kakashi sought was just outside, sitting on the planks that jutted out over the water, extending the pier on which the tiny hovel sat the kid gave no sign of moving, even when the door rattled shut. A second later and the despondent child was joined by the masked guy. You shouldn't blame Naruto for what he did, Kakashi said, getting straight to the point not willing to waste time on trying to cheer the little guy up. He could tell from the kid's earlier behavior that that would be a futile effort and waste of both their time. He probably understands your pain better than anyone. He didn't have to be so mean about it, Inari grumbled, sulking. No, perhaps not, Kakashi agreed, but you can't deny that what he said was true, you really won't get anywhere if you don't do anything about the problem. His only visible eye took on a shadowed look, most of us on this team can understand you. Inari gave the Junin with a startled look. Kakashi pretended not to notice. My father was known as the White Fang of Konoha. When I was still a young boy, he committed suicide and left me all alone. Sasuke's entire clan was murdered by his brother in a single night. Naruto's already told you that he never knew his parents and that he's hated by the entire village. He's probably lying, Inari interrupted, returning to his self pity. No, he's not. Naruto really is despised by the whole of Konohagakure. Even when he was barely old enough to walk, the people of the village would beat him to the point of unconsciousness. No one would let him even shop in the stores. He had to get everything he owned from third hand shops who overcharged him even then. So why is he the way he is? The boy asked, Why isn't he? He trailed off, clearly not able to bring himself to admit it. Like you? Kakashi finished, making the moping boy wince. Well, I imagine that at one point he was. There were times when I would pass him on the street and he looked like a kicked puppy. Sometimes he would just hide in an alley and break down, but I suppose over time he got tired of it and decided to just hold his head high and go for it. Kakashi smiled. Inari didn't know how he knew, but he did. Naruto just said, enough, and quit crying. I wouldn't doubt that he hasn't shed a single tear since. On the way here, he got his hand sliced by an enemy's poisoned weapon but he didn't even blink. He just took out a kanai and stabbed his own hand to let the poison bleed out. Am I supposed to be impressed? Inari asked mulishly, so the blonde jerk could stab himself, big deal. No, but what I hope you will see is that you really don't have it so bad and that, instead of belittling your mom and grandpa, you will find a way to help them. With that, the Junin stood and headed back inside. Inari sat in the chilly breeze for a little longer then stood and ascended the exterior stairs to his room. He grabbed the picture of his father, torn from the one downstairs, and looked out at the rising moon. Father. What would you have done? He asked to thin air, but the whispering wind coming in off the sea gave no answer. A week later found everyone but Naruto at the bridge, he and Sasuke having made it to the top of their trees, but Naruto being too exhausted to even consider waking up from his coma-like state. Kakashi had decided to take pity on the boy and had given the blonde the day off. Tazuna had wasted no time in putting the three shinobi and one Saiyan to work on the bridge. He made full use of Gohan's unbelievable strength, having the 13-year-old moving thousand-pound beams and multi-ton slabs of concrete, made the week or two before. Everyone had been amazed at the boy's sheer muscle power and control when he'd lifted a three or four thousand-pound slab and set it gently in its place where the building crew had promptly attacked it like a hive of bees. Gohan-kun, doesn't that hurt? Sakura asked, not believing her eyes the first time she'd seen it. 
The black-haired boy just shrugged. Not really. All I have to do is up my key a little bit and I can manage. Besides, it's good training. That's the spirit, Gohan, Kakashi said from the railing with an approving nod as he flipped the page in his Icha Icha Paradise book. He was hit in the head by a metal pipe soon afterward. That hurt, he said, rubbing the bump on his abused cranium. Serves you right, Sakura yelled, shaking an angry fist in his direction. All you're doing is reading that stupid book while we do all the work. She leveled an accusing finger. How about getting off your lazy butt and helping? But I am, the crafty man answered with an eye smile. Someone has to supervise. That had brought on a whole new wave of shouting from the pink haired Kunoichi. That's so pathetic, Zabuza to his companion as he watched the interaction up on the bridge from the boat the pair of missing nins had borrowed from the marina. Just watching them makes me want to puke. The Junin hefted his sword onto his back and looked at his stoic partner whose face was hidden behind his blank porcelain mask. You ready? Yes, Zabuza san. Okay then. He grinned manically, causing the bandages on his face to stretch. Let's go have some fun. All fun and games stopped on the bridge for the moment as the crew took some time off to return home and eat lunch. Team 7 decided to give some much needed business to the sparse restaurant in town and went there with Tazuna in tow, who had no reservations about helping out his village. Kakashi scowled when they'd returned from lunch, something's not right. Huh? Sakura asked him. Kakashi sensei? Gohan stepped up beside her, his eyes hardening. You're right. There's something funny going on around here. Let's move, but be careful. Watch each other's backs. The masked Junin cautioned. The fighters moved carefully onto the bridge, each one's eyes and head never ceasing the endless watch. Sasuke was the one who saw it first, the hell? What happened to the crane? Everyone looked around and saw what the raven-haired boy was looking at. The yellow piece of construction machinery was twisted and mangled, as if a giant had taken a hammer and decided to pummel the machine into the ground. The latticed girders of the boom were bent back over the cab section and the end looked like it had been twisted off, leaving nothing but mangled steel behind. The cab itself was a mess of broken glass and electronic hardware. The crane. Tazuna stammered, seeing his vision vanish before his very eyes. The crane had been the one piece of hardware that the group who decided to work on the bridge had been able to afford. It had taken a lot of ranting and coercion on Tazuna's part to convince the rental company that letting the poor construction workers have the machine at half the usual rent price wouldn't matter once the lifeline to the mainland was finished. The devastated man took a few steps toward the twisted hulk with his hand up, as if trying to ward off a nightmare. Gohan caught a blur bound out from behind the wrecked crane and lance for Tazuna. He tensed and phased out of sight, surprising everyone. Next thing Tazuna knew he'd been knocked over when an invisible something hit him hard, shoving him onto his rear end. He caught a glimpse of Gohan, just before the kid ducked faster than anyone had ever seen and an eerie blur passed inches from the top of his head, ruffling his messy jet black hair. All of the warriors present snapped into various fighting stances as a heavy, unnatural mist began to roll in out of nowhere. Soon, Gohan and Tazuna were obscured from the rest of the group's view by the thick vapor. Booming laughter rang out all around the shinobi, which seemed to multiply by the second until it surrounded them. Get ready, Kakashi said bracingly as he and two of his genins stood back to back, eyes looking out, trying to pierce the soup that surrounded them. Yes, a sinister voice answered. Get ready. To die. Six shapes shot towards them and no one needed to be told who it was. Kakashi. I've got this. Sasuke yelled as he seized a kanai and blurred from sight. All Sakura caught was each Sabuza getting viciously slashed before the Uchiha reappeared and the clones burst into nothing but puddles. Clapping filled the air as the mist let up some, revealing Haku and Zabuza walking towards them, the amusement on Zabuza's face clear, even through the bandages. Kakashi. Gohan reappeared next to the Junin. What now? The masked man sighed, reaching up and bearing his Sharingan to the air. We have no choice. Gohan, let's go. Sasuke. Sakura, stay here and make sure Tazuna stays safe. On the other side, Zabuza grinned when he heard Kakashi's orders. Well, well, they're playing right into our hands, Haku. You know what do. Yes, Zabuza san. The shinobi guarding the bridge builder gasped as Haku disappeared. What? Sakura gasped. Where? Sasuke asked, 
Only able to see blurs, unable to make out any significant details. Where's he coming from? Haku watched his prey as he sprinted in random directions, hoping to throw Gohan off guard. It seemed to be working, as the boy made no effort to track Haku's progress. It is clear that he cannot see my movements, the stoic hunter observed quietly as he continued his random patters. Now is the time to strike. The boy hit the ground and rebounded. Now he was speeding straight at the other fighter's back, who made no effort to see where Haku was coming from. The masked shinobi drew back, all his fingers seared together, ready for an attack on a vital pressure point that would either kill Gohan or render him an invalid. His fingers flew forward, aiming for the base of Gohan's neck. Time slowed down and Haku watched in shock as the other teen's head swiveled around and a single dark eye glared him. No, he can see me. There was no time to correct his trajectory or withdraw his strike. He was wide open. Gohan leaned to the side and seized the shinobi's wrist as he sailed past. The Saiyan hybrid jerked the limb and Haku felt a jolt in his stomach as his path went from linear to circular as the other warrior began to spin, adding Haku's redirected momentum to his own centripetal force. The two genin present at the battle watched in awe as their newest friend leaned so fast he seemed to leave afterimages of himself, right before his hand snapped up and seized at thin air. By the time the genin's brains had processed what their eyes had seen, Gohan had spun once, twice, three times before he released his grip on Haku and sent the hunter Nin flying away. Kakashi and Zabuza were shocked when Haku came flying out of nowhere coming from somewhere behind the copy Nin. Hitaki smiled faintly as he realized just who had done the throwing. Looks like Gohan and this hunter Nin haven't wasted any time. Kakashi thought wryly as Haku shifted his weight in midair and landed cat-like, skidding off into the mist. Just then, a force passed the two Junin, moving so fast that even the Sharingan had trouble picking it up, and drilling a tunnel straight through the Kirigakir no Jutsu. Haku managed to stop his backward progress, screeching to a halt, just feet from the incomplete section of the bridge. That was too close. Another few feet and I would have gone over. His thoughts were interrupted when he heard a rushing noise behind him. What? He managed to turn just in time to catch a glimpse of Gohan, hanging over the water, horizontal, one leg ed back. The force of the brutal kick made Haku go flying once more into the mist, though this time, he was bouncing the whole way, kicking up debris geysers each time his body hit the unforgiving concrete. The ice-wielding shinobi could barely stand after his painful ride came to a skidding stop. He tried to raise himself up to continue the fight, but it was at a snail's pace. I have to turn this around. The hunter's blood froze solid when he heard slow and deliberate footsteps heading his way. The sound stopped behind him. This is it. Haku realized. I'm going to die. I deserved such a fate. He has bested me. I'm going to give you one chance to leave Tazuna alone. Haku couldn't believe his ears. This warrior, who had thrashed him just as soundly as he'd done to Zabuza San, was going to show him mercy? Haku smiled. Unseen behind his porcelain mask. This could work to his advantage. The hunter's hand, the one not bearing most of his weight, began making one handed seals for his Keke Jenke. He could do so much better if he used two hands, but that would tip the enemy off. In the meantime, he needed to stall for time. I cannot do that. Gohan was taken off guard by the softness of his opponent's voice. It was soft, almost musical, completely opposite from the harsh tones he'd expected from a partner of Zabaza's. Why? If the young Saiyan could convince this guy to leave peacefully, Gohan wouldn't have to continue to overpower him, which hurt the gentle kid almost as much as it hurt Haku to be on the receiving end. I am Zabaza's weapon. I follow his orders to the end, that is why I cannot let the bridge builder go. Haku's hands continued to flash through one seal after another. It was getting close to completion. Another 10 or 15 seconds at the most. It cannot be helped. I am a shinobi and shinobi follow orders. I was ordered to kill the bridge builder and so I shall. The ice nin's hand landed on the last seal. It was time. Just as I was ordered to kill you, Gohan raised his guard as the temperature of the area he was in dropped dramatically in a matter of seconds. He could tell it was close to freezing, and sure enough, ice began forming. Though, it was forming in sheets floating a few feet off the ground. This is one of their jutsu, Gohan realized, too late, that he'd been caught in a trap. In seconds, the young Saiyan was surrounded on all sides by slabs of chakra-enhanced ice. 
What is this? He shouted, his voice echoing off the hard frozen water. Haku's answer was just as cold as the solid water surrounding the trapped Saiyan. This is the beginning of your end. He strode forward and touched one of the panels he'd created, entering the ice, becoming one with it. Gohan's eyes widened as the shinobi was swallowed by his own jutsu and didn't reappear in front of him. The Super Saiyan knew that he was in a tight spot, and his suspicions were realized when images of Haku appeared on every slab surrounding him. Mirrors, he murmured, now realizing the true purpose of these ice sheets. His voice was too soft for Haku to hear, but the shinobi could still read lips. Yes. I can reflect my image onto a mirror I choose. The reflections held up a hand containing Senbon needles. You are fast, but even you cannot keep up with my speed now. We'll see about that. Gohan yelled as he began to sprint for a mirror. If he could just break one down, his eyes went wide as pain seared up his leg, just before the appendage went numb completely and Gohan, without any feeling in his leg, crashed to the ground. He twisted around and let out a shocked gasp when he saw a slim, silver Senbon needle sticking out of the middle of his calf. How? I told you. Your chance of escaping this place, the Haku reflections held up more needles, is zero. The ice shinobi was satisfied when Gohan looked around, apprehension beginning to show in his defiant eyes. Kakashi ducked as Zabaza's oversized meat cleaver passed through the space the Junin's head had previously been occupying. He retaliated by whipping out a kanai and slashing for the mist nin's throat. Zabuza, for his part, showed surprising dexterity as he followed through with his strike, going behind his back before he brought it up and over, forcing Kakashi to withdraw his attack and parry, pulling out a second kanai to brace against the mass of the weapon. Both men grunted, trying to force the other back. The Konoha shinobi was down on one knee, just before he let out a yell and threw off the Zanbadu in a shower of sparks and ringing steel. Both men hopped back trying to get some distance from the other, Zabuza so he could get his balance back, and Kakashi, who was trying to buy himself a little breathing room. Kakashi's mismatched eyes narrowed as the shadowy outline of his adversary faded due to the thickening mist. Damn, he cursed, I really hate that jutsu. His instincts began screaming at him at that moment and he whirled to see Zabuza in the air above him, massive sword already beginning its descent. A plan to end the match began to form in Hitaki's mind and he crouched, waiting until the right moment. When it arrived, he shoulder rolled out of the way, allowing Zabaza's sword to embed itself in the bridge. The missing Nin was forced to focus on pulling out his heavy weapon, which gave Kakashi the opening he'd been looking for. He lunged, whipping out another kanai from his pouch, flipping the blade into a reverse grip before he gave an extra spurt of chakra and flashed past, slicing Zabaza's throat wide open. The mist demon's eyes went wide with surprise as blood poured from his open neck like water from a hose and then he slumped forward over the hilt of his sword. Kakashi gave a satisfied snort as he spun the kanai on one finger and returned it to his pouch. He began walking away, but he hadn't gone more than a few steps before the splash of water made him freeze, as if Haku had caught him in an ice mirror. Can't be. The copy nin thought, surprised, as he turned around to see the place where Zabaza's corpse was. Nothing was there but a puddle of water. How? He was real. My Sharingan can tell the difference between the original and a Mizu Bunshin. Hitaki couldn't figure out how the man could be a clone, but that was before another realization hit him like a ton of bricks. Kawarimi no Jutsu. That was how he did it. Just before Kakashi had cut his throat, Zabuza had switched places with a water clone he'd previously made. Probably just after the mist thickened. Nice try, Kakashi. The son of the White Fang turned and was just able to catch a glimpse of the Zanbadu, right before it sliced through him. Or at least it tried to. Kakashi's eyes widened when he saw Orange. Close to 15 cage bunchins had stopped the sword cold. He had just enough time to think, no way. And hear a soft curse from Zabuza, just before the area was enveloped in a massive explosion of shinobi smoke. A loud voice burst from the cloud. Have no fear, Uzumaki Naruto is here. You have got to be kidding me! Zabuza shouted. His fatal attack on Hitaki had been thwarted by a loud genin. Just who the hell is that kid? Kakashi sighed as the smoke cleared, revealing Naruto, dressed and ready for battle, apparently showing no signs of fatigue from his harsh training the night before. He's Konoha's number one hyperactive knucklehead ninja, he answered in a tired voice, though, he had to hand it to the loudmouth, 
the kid had actually saved his life. Hey, Kakashi Sensei, Naruto close to shouted as he approached the shinobi with a shit eating grin on his face and his arms folded behind his head, Did I do good? The lazy Junin sighed again. Yes, Naruto, he said in a bored and tired voice. You did fine. His gaze sharpened and he glared over his shoulder at Zabuza, who stiffened at the sharp gaze of the Sharingan. Now, as for you, the Junin trailed off as he dropped without warning, planting one hand on the ground to help balance himself as he swung one foot in a wide arc, catching the sadist shinobi in the temple with his heel, sending him skidding away. Wow, Naruto commented as Kakashi straightened. Smooth moves, Kakashi sensei. Thanks. Now go help Sasuke and Sakura with Tazuna. Naruto's reaction was predictable. Ah. Uh, why? I want to help you, he whined. Why was he always being shoved off into the background? No, you'll just get in the way. The Junin put a hand on Naruto's head when the boy looked downcast. Naruto, you saved my life and I'm grateful for it, but you'll just be in the way. The others need you more right now. The blonde's blue eyes looked mutinous as he brushed off his instructor's hand, but he turned and ran off nonetheless. The Junin sighed, knowing the kid would be the death of him someday. He reached casually into his pouch, once again producing a kanai. Now Zabuza, where were we? He asked calmly as the other Junin strode out of the mist, his Zanbadu still somehow in his hand. The Konoha Nin knew he would need to deprive him of it somehow if he wanted to win the battle. Sakura and Sasuke were nervous to say the least. They knew that two brutal battles were going on out there, even if they couldn't see them. The mist had thickened greatly a little while ago and they could hear the sounds of battle not too far away from them. It had been quiet for a bit then both Genin had heard Naruto's loud declaration. Naruto. Sasuke asked, wondering how the Dobi could be here when the last the Uchiha had seen of the flamboyant kid, he had been sleeping, dead to the world. Sakura's voice held equal confusion. What's he doing here? I thought he would be out for the rest of the day at least. Sasuke didn't answer, but that was because footsteps had both Genin raising weapons in preparation for an attack. Grumbling met their ears, and Sakura caught phrases like, Who the hell does he think he is? And, I saved his ass, he could at least be grateful. They relaxed their guards a little, but still kept the kanai up, just in case it was Zabuza using a henge. N Naruto. Sakura called nervously. The mist parted and the orange clad Genin meandered into their line of vision, arms behind his head and a squinty pout on his face. Hey Sakura chan, Sasuke bastard, he muttered sulkily. HN. What the hell are you doing here, Dobi? Sasuke demanded rudely. Naruto's face contorted into an angry scowl. Hey, you guys are the jerks who left without waking me up, he retorted loudly. But we though that you would be out for a day, Sakura protested, coming to Sasuke's defense. Hey, you think I'm that pathetic? The blonde demanded, not believing that his team had so little faith in him. Yes, Sasuke said simply. Naruto brandished a fist at him but before he did anything, Sakura, trying to be a voice of reason, cut him off. But even Kakashi sensei would have been out after using that much chakra. It's not like you can just bounce back after only one night's rest. But I did, Sakura chan, and I even saved Inari and Tsunami from some evil bandit guys. What? Tazuna interrupted, panic in his voice. My family's in danger. Hey, didn't I just say I saved them? Naruto yelled. Clean out your ears, old man. That degenerated into an argument between Tazuna, who in his protective panic for his family wanted to run back to his hut and Naruto who kept yelling they were okay. The other two just shrugged and sighed, knowing it was useless to try and stop them. Gohan grunted as another burst of needles from the mirrors around him struck his body. The situation with Haku had turned from bad to worse in a heartbeat. The shinobi had lived up to his statement that Gohan wouldn't be able to keep up with him. His enemy's speed had increased to the point of being invisible to even say in eyes. A faint whistling behind him made the half-blood warrior lunge forward and roll, just managing to dodge the senbon that lodged in the pavement behind him. Damn, he raged, losing his composure in a brief bout of cursing. If this keeps up, I'll run out of energy before he does. The Z-fighter winced as a line of senbon drew a neat line down his upper right arm. The warrior lost no time in pulling the offending weapons out of himself, letting them fall among the hundreds already littering the ground. 
He knew that shattering a mirror wouldn't work. Gohan had tried that already. He'd been surprised at his fortune and sprinted for the exit, but a hail of Senbon from the mirror above it had rebuffed him, forcing him to dodge. After he'd managed to get his footing, the gap had already closed with a new mirror, sealing him in this funhouse once again. The Saiyan supposed he should count himself fortunate that these needles weren't as thick as the kanai everyone else seemed to favor. If they had, he would be dead, as much as his pride wouldn't allow him to admit it. Haku watched the young teen below him. The ice warrior was currently hiding in the topmost mirror of his jutsu, the one that looked straight down, allowing him to see the whole area his technique occupied. The shinobi had to hand it to this strange fighter, he'd done something no one else had. He'd actually made a way out of the jutsu. Thankfully, the hunter Nin had been able to repel him and reseal the exit. Now Haku was being extra careful not to allow the kid near another mirror. He'd been timing and placing his attacks in such a way that kept Gohan in the relative middle of the Keke Jenke. Zabaza's best weapon was making progress. This kid had fantastic stamina, endurance, power, and pain tolerance. But Haku had managed to surpass him in speed thanks to this jutsu and now was taking full advantage of that gap in order to chip away at the rest of Gohan's strengths. Haku was also sure that the boy was unused to situations involving complex strategy. Whoever had trained him had done a decent job with strategy to be sure, but had focused more on the physical aspects of battle, and that would be this powerhouse's downfall. Gohan looked at all the blank mirrors ringing him on all sides. Well, he couldn't sense Haku. Probably something in these crazy mirrors. Haku was obviously faster than he was by a wide enough margin, and it was impossible to predict what mirror he would attack from next as the other boy seemed to have the ability to teleport between one mirror to the next without leaving them. Key blasts would shatter these mirrors he knew, that was how he'd managed to make the opening the first time. Theoretically, Gohan could put up a barrage that would shatter every ice mirror, but that taxed his key to the limit, and Haku would probably re-emerge just to kill off a worn-out Gohan, so that option was out, as was just breaking one and going for it, as the previous attempt had shown him. Oh yeah, the son of Goku was in a very tight spot. I have no choice. I didn't want to transform, but this guy's left me no option. Gohan's legs spread wide, his fists clenching at his sides, putting the fighter in the basic stance known as Kiba Dashe, or horse riding stance. It was the first stance he'd ever learned and all of Piccolo's basic hand and foot movements had been taught to him here before he moved on to more advanced stances and techniques. Haku watched as his enemy sank into a basic stance and closed his eyes, concentrating. Curiosity took hold of the ice user as he wondered just what the heck the kid was up to. Using such a basic footing wouldn't give him any more advantage over Haku. In fact, it would only slow him down, the horse riding stance being a very immobile way to distribute weight. He was obviously up to something, but for the life of him, Haku couldn't figure out what. HRAAAA. Gohan let out a cry that split the heavens and, just like at the lake, the ground beneath him cracked and splintered, only this time the fragments began to float, held up by nothing other than the force of Gohan's key. Hurricane winds blasted up, blowing Kirigakure no jutsu away in a flash, and exposing the battlefield for all to see. Kakashi and Zabuza were locked in a clash when the mist was blown away so fast, the copy Nin wondered if it had been evaporated. Gohan's yell reached him next followed closely by winds. Both Junin were blown off their feet and the force of the transforming Saiyan's key crashed down on them an instant after the winds. Kakashi felt the wind knocked from him just from the force of the power the fourth teen was emitting. What the hell's going on here? Zabuza yelled, to which Hitaki had no answer. Zabaza's got a point, he thought in amazement. Gohan, just what in the seven hells are you? Sasuke, Sakura, Naruto, and Tazuna were all blown off their feet by the explosion of power. What the hell? Naruto shouted over the roaring wind, which seemed to be coming from that freaky ice dome near them. I think it's Gohan kun. Sakura shouted back, shielding her face from all the bits of shattered concrete, dust, and other stuff in the wind. Sasuke had no answer either as he imitated the Kunoichi on the team, protecting his eyes from the brutal forces raging around him. Inside the dome, Haku's unseen eyes widened as his mirrors began cracking from the forces that assailed them. He's doing this with Chakra alone. Just what is he? Below, Gohan tensed up, curling in on himself, as if he was trying to get into the fetal position while still on his feet. His yell, 
having died off and been replaced by sporadic grunts, returned in full force as he uncurled, forcing his power to even greater heights. A gold aura blasted into existence, further increasing the chaos raging around everyone at the bridge. Over the lake, close to two miles away, at the Tazuna house, Tsunami hummed as she washed dishes in the roughly hewn, but smooth, sink. She was so happy. Somehow, Naruto-san had managed to get Inari's light to return and, the woman was knocked off her feet as a huge earthquake hit, slamming her to the floor. Tazuna's daughter landed so hard that she thought her ears were filled with a rushing noise. Then it dawned on her that the rushing noise wasn't her, but the ocean outside her house. Mom, mom, you gotta come quick. Inari's panicked yells had her crawling to the wooden door and when she opened it, her first thought was that the apocalypse had come. The ocean was writhing in swells never seen in wave country, even during hurricane season. Winds stronger than any gale were ripping shingles off her roof and planks off the pier like they were feathers. Inari was sitting down a little ways past the door, probably knocked there by the earthquake, and he was staring, white as a sheet, in the direction of the bridge. He looked at his mother with terrified eyes. SS something's happening at the bridge, he cried, his gaze returning to the bridge, whatever was happening over there was so riveting that he couldn't tear his eyes off of it for more than a couple of seconds. What, Inari? I don't know, a bright light, as gold as the rising sun, spilled over them now, and Tsunami looked over at her father's creation. What she saw made her body shake like a leaf and her mind go blank from panic. A star. A star had settled itself near the end section of the bridge and it shone brighter than anything Tsunami had ever seen. Both mother and son could only watch the spectacle in horrified awe as the thing's light seemed to increase in intensity. Gohan's yells had reached a crescendo deafening everyone within earshot. As Haku looked on, wondering how he was going to deal with this latest development, lightning began flaring off of the Saiyan's chest, flying up into the air in a double helix that shattered the mirror the hunter Nin had been occupying a moment earlier. Gohan himself felt the power of the ultimate form a Saiyan could attain surge through him, energizing every cell, awakening him like no adrenaline rush or energy drink could. As much as he didn't like admitting it, the young warrior loved this feeling. It made him feel as if he could do anything. Without warning, his rocketing key slammed into a glass ceiling and rebounded, turning the Z fighter's cries of focus into screams of pain. The lightning that had been spiraling into the air reversed direction, revealing, just for an instant, the kanji for the number one shining through Gohan's GI before it attacked him. The teen felt as if he was on fire from the inside out. Why was he reacting this way? It was like all the key he'd built up just now was being forced into a massive backlash that blew him off his feet in a pulse of white light. The protector of Earth slammed into one of Haku's already cracked mirrors, damaging it even further. When he slid away from the ice, a spider web pattern of fractures could be seen, a testament to just how hard the kid had been thrown by his own key. Gohan slumped, unconscious, and all the phenomena caused by his attempt at a Super Saiyan transformation vanished as if they'd never happened. Kakashi looked around, startled at the sudden cutoff in the chaos of the world ending. He managed to spot Gohan's limp form, slumped up against the mirror he'd crashed into by the backlash of his own key. Gohan. When the kid gave no response, the masked man tried to get to him, but Zabuza sliding to a halt in front of him stopped him. Just where do you think you're going? He asked, amusement at Kakashi's desperation clear in he voice. We're not done here. The missing Nin forced the copy Nin away with a swing of his huge sword and proceeded to press the attack, taking advantage of Hitaki's distraction. Damn. The Konoha Nin raged. Gohan's in trouble and I can't do anything with tall dark and ugly here. Guess there's no choice. He swore again, regretting the decision he was about to make, but knowing that there was no way out of it. Zabuza stopped to brace for another attack and readjust his Zanbadu. Kakashi knew that now was his chance. Naruto, Sasuke, help Gohan. Any further order was cut off when the Demon of the Mist renewed his attack. Naruto and Sasuke looked at each other. Despite hating each other's guts, both boys could tell that the other was scared shitless at the idea of taking on someone who'd managed to put Gohan down for the count. Sasuke smirked. Try not to get in my way, Dobi. Naruto reacted by shaking a fist in the stoic Genin's direction. Screw you, Sasuke bastard. I'm the one who's gonna rescue Gohan, so you stay the hell out of my way. 
The rival's argument suddenly dissolved into the past and both shinobi nodded seriously before sprinting toward the dome of ice mirrors. Aren't you gonna go with them? Sakura turned and looked at the bridge builder, who was watching her with curious eyes. The kunoichi shook her head. Nope. I wasn't ordered to and besides, even if Naruto and Sasuke don't get along, you'll never find two people who can work together like they can. The girl's emerald eyes became downcast as she continued. Besides, I'm just not strong enough. I'll just get in the way. She watched both Jen and reach the dome and jump through without hesitation. Sasuke kun, Naruto, Gohan kun, come back alive. Haku dropped from his mirror like a ghost, landing without making a sound, as a shinobi should. He slowly withdrew a senbon from one of his pouches and approached Gohan, who was still out cold from the strange reaction during his attempt to transform into a Super Saiyan. This boy, Haku thought as he approached the incapacitated warrior, this boy is a threat to Zabuza san's plans. Therefore, he must be eliminated. I'm sorry, the quiet hunter Nin said out loud, though he was sure that the other warrior couldn't hear him, you fought well and courageously, but I must eliminate you. The slim weapon in his hand raised for the sky, the sun, exposed once more due to the mist being blown away, glinted off of the needle. His hand dropped. The sound of whirling shuriken cut the finishing blow short and the hunter was forced to jump back or get killed. Two blurs entered his vision, one angling for Gohan, the other coming to a stop right in front of him, the blur materializing into Uchiha Sasuke. The raven-haired Uchiha smirked and let loose with a vicious roundhouse that was much faster than Haku could have expected. The blow landed squarely in Haku's face and the boy felt the concussion rip through the mask and slam into his skull. He flew back, but managed to get his feet under him and skid to a halt. Sasuke pulled out a kanai, whirling it on his finger as he brought it up and snapped it into a reverse grip. Get him out of here Dobi! Sasuke shouted over his shoulder, I can't hold this guy off forever. Naruto glared at the other genin as he slung one of Gohan's arms over his shoulder and heaved the boy up. Shut up Sasuke. I'm going already. Holding tight to the unconscious teen, the blonde jumped for the gap between the mirror that had been fractured by Gohan's impacting body and the one next to it. No, Haku shouted inwardly, he must not be allowed to escape. The hunter prepared to move and Sasuke, catching the movement out of the corner of his eye, snapped all his attention back on Haku tensing in preparation for a potential attack. Instead of the anticipated full-on attack, the masked shinobi jumped up and away. Sasuke thought it was a stupid thing to do. That was, until the hunter Nin hit one of those weird mirrors and melded into it. A split second later and the Uchiha was surrounded on all sides by reflections of the other shinobi. A cry of pain sounded from behind him. He looked and saw Naruto flying back into the Dome of Mirrors slamming into the senbon littered ground with a heavy thud gohan jarred from the blonde's grasp by the whatever it was that blew naruto back in landed a short distance away what the sasuke's curse was cut short and the last of the uchiha felt something slam into him from behind as hard as a charging rhino and the genin flew forward landing on his stomach and going into a skid he managed to stop himself and stood up wincing as he bled from a few superficial wounds caused by Senbon on the ground stabbing into him as he'd passed by. He raised the kanai he'd somehow managed to get a grip on and waited, hoping to find what had hit him and pay it back. Something told him it was this pretty boy in the mirrors. Ow! What the hell was that? Naruto asked as he picked himself up, rubbing his head from where it had cracked against the concrete of the bridge on landing. Sasuke bastard, what hit me? For once the Uchiha gave him a straight answer without any comments on his stupidity in it this guy in the mirrors. Somehow he hit us both in the span of a few seconds. Haku was surprised by the black-haired kid, Sasuke's, comment. Not many people could figure out that it was him in the mirrors. Even some of the junin he'd killed with this technique took a while to catch on and they'd had many times this boy's experience. He is a talented shinobi, Haku observed. It appears I may have to watch myself around him or this could be tough. Naruto stepped up beside his teammate, drawing a kanai as he did. So, Sasuke bastard, just how are we getting out of here? The other genin reached into his kanai pouch, drawing out some wire. He tied a length around the ring of the kanai and drew out as much slack as he thought he'd need. The Uchiha had an idea of how to get out of this mess, and to do it he would need Naruto's unusually high stamina. Naruto, 
he murmured, trying to keep his voice low and not move his lips so this guy wouldn't be able to read them. I'm gonna try melting the mirror that Gohan hit. Keep this guy distracted as long as you can. Naruto nodded, grinning in determination. Okay, you can count on me. On three. Ready? Naruto nodded. Okay. One, two, three. Haku was caught semi off guard when the raven haired kid turned around and hurled a kanai at the fractured mirror. He was forced to concentrate on the other genin though, because he was trying to make a getaway. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Ten copies of Naruto headed off in every direction, making a break for the gaps between the mirrors. Haku dropped from his hiding place and zipped around the dome faster than any eye could hope to track. To the hunter Nin, it appeared that the clones were moving in slow motion and he could hit a vital spot on each one before they had time to react, or even sense he was there. Sasuke ignored the popping noises of exploding cage bunchons behind him, throwing his kanai at the fractured mirror, the weapon trailing a slivery strand of near-invisible wire as it lodged in one of the cracks in the ice. The Avenger raised the end of the wire to his lips and made a sequence of hand seals, inhaling deeply as he did. Kaden. Ryuka no Jutsu. He let his breath out with a rush and a river of fire shot down the wire and slammed full on into the weakened mirror. The fire from the technique shot into every crevice in the ice and for a second, there was a spider web of fire on the surface. Then there was a sound like a gunshot and the mirror shattered. Let's go Naruto, Sasuke yelled, hoping his companion would be able to grab Gohan because the Uchiha was too far away. Naruto ran for the passed out Saiyan and scooped him up into a fireman's carry sprinting for the hole Sasuke had made, using chakra to reduce the friction between his feet and the ground, allowing him to go faster. Both boys made it to the exit, and Sasuke had even gotten one foot on the outside, then both were grabbed roughly by their shirt collars and heaved back inside, once again, both Genin thudded to the ground. Sasuke struggled to pick himself up and caught sight of his enemy, real and in the flesh, not some reflection, standing in front of them. Both of the Genin watched, horrified, as the gap that they'd made in the dome resealed itself. Damn it! Sasuke thought angrily, we're never gonna get out of here at this rate. Damn you! Naruto shouted, showing off his amazing stamina by vaulting back to his feet. He leveled a defiant finger at the masked hunter. I'll kill you! He ran straight at Haku, drawing back for a haymaker, ignoring Sasuke's yells to stop. Haku watched with mild amusement as the blonde approached. When Naruto leapt into the air to add momentum to his strike, the hunter Nin made his move. His arm flashed faster than the eye could see and Naruto yelped as a senbon needle embedded itself in his shoulder, making the blonde lose focus. Haku caught him as he came down and whirled around, using Naruto's own momentum against him. He let go of the genin and sent him crashing into Sasuke, who had just managed to get back to his feet. Both cried out as they collided and, before the pair had hit the ground, Haku had slipped back into his mirrors. That was a clever idea, the masked kid said as his reflection popped up in all the mirrors. Using the fire to deliver a shock to a weakened mirror was truly a brilliant plan. However, I will tell you the same thing I told your friend. You cannot escape. I do not wish to kill you, but if you continue to push me, you will die. Sasuke glared at the masked kid before charging him with a savage yell. Haku merely sidestepped and shot a leg out tripping Sasuke and causing the Uchiha to crash to the ground. I told you that it is futile, he stated coldly as he merged back into one of his mirrors. The raven-haired Genin bid back a curse as he found himself surrounded by reflections once again. Every single Haku held up needles. The arms flashed and Sasuke began to dodge once again, trying not to get hit by streaks of light. Kakashi grunted as he backpedaled. Zabaza's humongous meat cleaver smashed into the ground and kicked up debris. When the bandaged Junin pulled his weapon out of the ground, there was a vicious gouge in the hard pavement of the bridge deck. This is bad, Kakashi thought to himself grimly. I'm starting to get tired, I can last maybe an hour more and that's it. It was true. The Konoha Junin could feel fatigue digging at the barest edges of his consciousness even as he thought that. If he couldn't end this battle soon, Hitaki and everyone he was fighting to protect would be killed. A cry of pain made him look away towards the ice dome that held Naruto, Sasuke and Gohan. What he saw made his blood turn to ice water. Sasuke was slumped in the middle of the jutsu, his shoulders and back riddled with senbon needles. Zabuza noticed the other shinobi's gaze. 
He chuckled darkly when he saw the results of his tool's handiwork. Beautiful, isn't it? He asked. Haku is a true shinobi. He'll kill anyone without hesitation. He looked over at the copy nin with amused eyes. Too bad for you, Kakashi. All of your brats are gonna die, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah? Kakashi retorted with a confidence he did not feel. This battle wasn't going his way and both of the junin knew it. Hitaki would need to do something drastic if he wanted to win this fight. Then you don't know my team. He looked the demon of the mist with a hidden smirk. First there's Sasuke. Tell me, do you know his surname? Why the hell would I care about a snot-nosed brat's last name? I'll tell you why. His name is Uchiha Sasuke. Zabaza's eyes went wide. So, the rumors about a kid surviving the massacre of his clan were true after all. Konohagakure had done a lot to hide the fact that one of their most prestigious clans had been wiped from existence by one of the clan's own. So you're telling me that that kid could awaken the Sharingan? The silver-haired shinobi nodded. Yep, and since your little hunter Nin is pushing him into a corner, it's getting more and more likely that his keke Jenke will show itself. You're lying Kakashi. The other shinobi shrugged. Maybe, but even if it doesn't, and Sasuke is somehow killed, there's still Naruto to deal with. Zabaza's derisive snort cut the scarecrow off. Really, that kid's nothing but a dead last. No you're wrong. He may not be the smartest of shinobi. That honor goes to Sakura, but Naruto will never ever give up. And Sakura, well, she may not be the strongest member of the team, but she'll whip up a strategy to kick your ass. Now Zabuza burst out laughing. Ha 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 ha. Come off it Kakashi. You're telling me that any one of these genins could kill me? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. You're bluffing. Kakashi shrugged again. Perhaps, but there's still Gohan. If any one of us fail, that kid won't. I don't know just how strong he is, but you know better than I do that he can fight. Zabaza's eyes went wide as he remembered the vicious beating he'd received at the young Super Saiyan's hands. A hand went to his left side, where the broken ribs still hadn't healed properly and were still tender. Hitaki grinned. The only outward sign of it was his mask warping. See? But you don't need to worry about them. Why? Kakashi's grin turned into a grim glare, because I'm about to kill you. With that, the two Junin picked up their weapons and charged headlong into battle, becoming nothing but blurs bouncing off each other with a shower of sparks and the crisp, clangs, of steel meeting steel. Naruto struggled to get back on his feet. Damn it, it can't end like this, the blonde thought desperately as he finally managed to stand. Sasuke. The Uchiha turned at the blonde's call. Naruto. We gotta get out of here. Give me a hand will you? The other genin nodded, determination shining in his eyes. The two rivals regarded each other, then, at some unspoken signal, sprinted for the edges of the dome. They hoped that Haku wouldn't be able to take both of them on. Unfortunately for them, the hunter Nin was more than capable of keeping up with them. Naruto yelled as something struck him in the Achilles tendon, making his ankle go numb. Sasuke faltered for a split second but recovered and continued his charge at the Ring of Mirrors. Sadly, the moment of hesitation was more than enough and Haku's foot, invisible to the unaided eye, slammed into his gut, making him cough blood and crash onto his back. Naruto grunted as he pulled the needle out of his heel, son of a bitch, he yelled, his frustration finally getting to his head, he pointed defiantly at one of the reflections. You're not keeping me here, you bastard, he made a hand seal. Cage bunch and no jutsu. There was a burst of smoke and a group of blonde-haired copies sprinted in every conceivable direction. One of them stepped in a puddle, probably left over from one of the Zabuza clones from earlier in the battle. Haku blasted from his mirrors, striking down clone after clone. Sasuke's eyes widened as he saw the water droplets kicked up from the clone's step get shredded in several different directions. No way. The arrogant Uchiha smirked. He had it now. The basis behind this guy's attacks. He would leap from mirror to mirror and attack faster than the eye could see, but it was only a one-shot pass. He had to re-enter a mirror if he wanted to do it again. I've got it now, plus he's slowing down. I can feel it, I have to hand it to the dobi, he's given me the way to get out of here. Sasuke looked at Gohan's limp form with reluctant eyes. And I guess we wouldn't be at this point if he hadn't beaten the crap out of this jerk. Naruto cried out as the masked hunter rebuffed him again. 
he growled as his frustration levels continued to rise. He was starting to run low on chakra. Before long, he would pass out and then Sasuke Bastard would be all on his own. Naruto. The blonde looked over his shoulder at Sasuke, who was crouching on the ground. There was a light in his dark eyes that told the loud Genin that he had a plan. Can you do that again? The orange clad Genin smirked. K. Who do you take me for? Of course I can do it. He made the seal. Cage Bunshin no jutsu. For a second time, the air was filled with leaping shadow clones as they tried to find a way out. Sasuke ran forward and dropped into a slide, going right through a puddle and throwing water droplets in every direction. He began to make hand seals even before he stopped sliding, looking for the movement he knew was coming. A droplet burst apart, then another and another. There, Kaden. Gukaku no jutsu. Sasuke exhaled, shooting a fireball at the bursting droplets. It was more of a desperation move on his part, but somehow, he managed to singe the hem of Haku's pants. Haku merged with the mirror and looked down at his burnt clothing. He hit me. It was just an observation, but there was surprise and puzzlement in the hunter's mental voice. Despite all of Zabuza san's teachings that emotions were a thing to be suppressed and ignored, Haku wasn't able to keep the surprise from radiating through him. No one has ever managed to hit me while trapped in my Keke Jenke. He continued to watch the Uchiha as he looked around, trying to find the real Haku. This one is dangerous. I must eliminate him as quickly as possible. Sasuke glared down at Naruto as the weary kid tried to drag himself upright again. Come on, loser. The dark haired Genin barked harshly. He knew that the best way to get Naruto back in the game would be to piss him off. Get on your feet, we've got to team up. The loudmouth's reply was interrupted by his heavy breathing shut up saw suk i no that simple remark sapped the last of his strength and naruto keeled over backwards giving into the exhaustion that seeped into his bone marrow naruto naruto damn it of all the times sasuke's rant was cut short by a barrage of senbon from the mirrors he did a pretty good job of evading the attack but when one managed to stick him it ruined his concentration and he got hit again the senbon lodging in his legs arms and back Kakashi wasn't faring any better than Sasuke was. Sure, he wasn't being turned into a living pincushion, but one strike from that damn sword of Zabaza's and he'd be cut in half. A plan on how to defeat the missing Nin had fully formed in his head, but the masked shinobi just couldn't figure out how he was going to pull it off. Zabuza landed, skidding from the latest clash of Kanai against Zanbatu. The missed Nin really had to give Kakashi a few points. The guy was good. Not many people could fight off a sword as big as his with just a couple of kanai. But still, this battle was dragging on for far too long. Tiredness was already beginning to wear at Zabuza and his attacks weren't as fast or precise as they had been in the past. Kakashi's not my real target anyway, he thought. His hard gray eyes fell on the old bridge builder, who was watching the duel inside Haku's ice mirrors with a tense look. This is perfect. He's not paying attention and neither is his guard. The pink Kunoichi, who had been so highly praised by her mentor, wasn't watching him as she should have been. It was a mistake that was about to cost them dearly. Kakashi's mismatched eyes narrowed as Zabuza disappeared. Huh? Now where'd that little son of a bitch run off to? He wondered. Then it hit him, Tazuna. Sakura screamed when Zabuza appeared right in front of her, getting ready to slice both her and Tazuna in half with one swing. Kakashi sensei poofed in and took the hit. Blood spraying everywhere, and the Kunoichi screamed again, her yell echoing across the bridge. Sasuke stopped dead at hearing his other teammates' screams. What's going on over there? He wondered. Where's Kakashi? Haku had noticed the other boy's gaze. It is over, he said plainly. The Uchiha gave him a glare that was as cold as the air inside this icy house of mirrors. Zabuza san has succeeded in his mission. Your teammates are dead, and you will soon be as well. Like hell. Sasuke spat out, venom permeating his voice. He still had things to do in this world. He was not about to die yet. I'll take you down first. How? Haku asked, raising a valid point. You cannot track my movements, even if you did get lucky with a fireball. He held up another handful of Senbon. The masked shinobi was abruptly reflected in every mirror. Now it's time for you to die. I'm sorry that it has to end like this. The boy's arm rose to strike. 
Haku let fly with his senbon and the air was filled with slender needles. One of those was sure to hit a pressure point and kill the defiant genin in the blink of an eye. After that was take care of, Haku would take his time and finish off the strange warrior in Naruto, the blonde who continued to surprise everyone. I, will not, let it end, here, to Haku's very great surprise and chagrin. Sasuke reached down and seized one of the senbon buried itself in his arm and yanked it out. Clinking filled the air as Uchiha's arm moved faster than Haku would have ever thought possible, deflecting each and every senbon, no matter which direction it came from. The hunter Nin watched his prey in suspense as Sasuke managed to get his ragged breathing under control, his eyes shadowed by his bangs. Even the normally emotionless Haku gasped when Sasuke looked up and glared at him with angry red eyes. Sharingan eyes. The Uchiha knew immediately that he'd done it. He'd unlocked the Keke Jenke of his clan. His eyes felt warm, and every illusion of Haku had disappeared, leaving him with the real hunter and also the ability to track every Senban needle flying at him. It was faint, but each of the needles had a slight double of itself, just ahead of the weapon's current path. Sasuke had taken a gamble and blocked the first needle based on where the projection was. When the first block had been successful, the raven haired Avenger had wasted no time in doing the same with the other needles. He smirked, once again the arrogant genius. Now, where were we? So, he has a Keke Jenke as well. To unlock it during battle is a very rare thing indeed. Haku had to admit that he was impressed with this genin from Konoha. I will have to end this now before my chakra can decrease any more. The boy held up more Senban, phasing from mirror to mirror. Sasuke's immature Sharingan tracking him the entire time. He has turned the tables. I can no longer kill him the way things stand now. Haku's gaze shifted to the limp forms of Gohan and Naruto. So I'll attack his friends. Sasuke's red eyes widened when he saw Haku's eye slits on his mask shift past him and focus on Naruto and Gohan. Those same Sharingan eyes saw Haku leap from the mirror, speeding towards the two fallen fighters. Damn it, no. That one thought pounded through the Uchiha's head as he forced Chakra into his feet and moved as fast as he could, trying desperately to intercept the hunter before he could kill the two fallen warriors. Time slowed for Sasuke. In perfect clarity, he saw the arm with the Senban raise into the striking position, the wan sunlight, obscured by overcast clouds, glinting off the tip of the needles. The thin silvery weapons flew, the sleeve that encased Haku's arm rippling slowly in Sasuke's enhanced vision. Then he was there. Pain flooded him as the twin Senban struck him in the chest. His strength was draining rapidly, but the determined Genin still managed to grab Haku and spin him around, letting him go and sending the hunter crashing into his own just you. The masked hunter stood easily, only bruised from the hit. Truly impressive, he commented, the respect in his voice real. You found the strength to protect the people precious to you and were able to stop me from killing them. Haku watched as Sasuke coughed violently, blood bursting from his mouth to splatter on the bridge's deck, now used and abused from the battle that had taken place and Gohan's transformation. Sadly, you were not able to evade me, despite the power granted to you by the Sharingan. Even as he spoke, Sasuke swayed on his feet, his crimson eyes fading back to their usual obsidian hue. That was when Naruto awoke. The first thing his eyes fell on was Sasuke, wobbling like a drunk man. Numerous Senban needles sticking from the shirt that so proudly bore the fan-like crest of the Uchiha clan. Sasuke? Naruto had to wonder. Since when did Sasuke bastard defend him like this? Something was really wrong here. Naruto could feel it deep inside. Hey. You're such an idiot. Sasuke wheezed out, the world beginning to grow dark. Death was creeping into the edges of his vision and soon he would completely fade away. He looked over his shoulder a weak attempt at a smirk on his face. His eyes, though, ruined the effect. They held a light of sadness and warmth in them, as if Sasuke was happy he'd done what he did, but at the same time regretting it. Sasuke, K, you, should see, your, face. Naruto was shaking all over. The voice of his greatest rival sounded so weak and open, as if he knew his time was near. Why? Naruto shouted, closing his eyes as he shouted his question. I never asked for this. I don't know why I did it, my, body, just, m, moved. No longer could the last of the Uchiha hold himself upright and he tipped backwards. 
Sasuke braced himself for the pain that would accompany him hitting the ground, as the senbon in his back would be driven deeper into him. The pain never came. Instead, hands reached up to grab him and slowed his fall. Naruto lowered his friend to the ground, even going out of his way to find a position that wouldn't drive the needles in deeper. Sasuke looked horrible. What little color his pale skin held was fading fast and there were bags under his eyes, as if he hadn't gotten a decent night's sleep in days. Twin streaks of blood ran from each corner of his mouth and flecked his chin as well. Naruto's eyes widened in horror as his rival's own began to flutter, like he couldn't keep them open anymore. He's, still, out there. Naruto forced himself to look Sasuke in the eye as the Uchiha breathed out his last words. My brother, he's the one, I, have, to, KK kill. The last word was said in a rush of escaping air and Sasuke's eyes closed, not opening again. The loud blonde found that the world looked oddly blurry. Haku watched the whole scene unfold before him. He wanted to spare the life of this blonde genin, but knew that Zabuza san would never allow it. All three of them had to die. Though, perhaps he would be able to convince his mentor to spare the life of the Kunoichi. It was the least Haku could do for the memories these three were about to become. He was a brave shinobi, and he died protecting the ones who meant the most to him. Such a death, it's the greatest a shinobi can ask for. Shut up. Naruto murmured, grief and mourning heavy in his voice. It seemed odd for such a happy person to have such a tone. Sasuke. Now he was addressing the body. I swear to you right now that I'll kill your brother in your memory. A new emotion washed over him like a breaking tsunami. Rage. It flooded every inch of him, warming him, waking him up like nothing could and bringing with it a renewed sense of power. But first, he glared at Haku and the masked shinobi took a step back in fear. Naruto's one visible eye, the other hidden by shadow and his bangs, was as a bloody red as the Sharingan. The pupil slitted like a cat's. I have to kill this bastard. Power blasted up around the grieving genin, ripping furrows in the concrete as two rings of bright red chakra began swirling around the blonde. Not good. What is this? Haku thought, experiencing fear for the first time since becoming Zabuza San's apprentice. The chakra burst off the ground, becoming a spiral that arced high into the air. Chakra cannot be seen, but yet, I can see it. The hunter nin's hidden eyes widened when the senbon that riddled Naruto's body were abruptly pushed clear as the wounds healed themselves. Just what is he? Haku continued to watch in horrified fascination as, for the second time that day, a frightening transformation took place right before him. Naruto's hair fluffed and became wild, Haku just barely able to pick up a resemblance to ears of a cat or fox. The whisker marks thickened, darkening to become like real whiskers. The genin's canine teeth elongated and sharpened, turning into fearsome fangs. Kakashi and Zabuza stopped their battle when a cruel and oppressive force pounded them over and over. Zabuza looked at the ice mirror dome that his tool should have been killing Kakashi's brats in. What is this feeling? The swordsman wondered. It's foul, like some kind of demon. Kakashi was stopped cold and a chill passed over him. The battle with Zabuza had taken a turn in Kakashi's favor. He'd managed to give himself an opening by getting wounded. Sure, he had a vicious and painful gash that ran from one shoulder to the opposite hip, but he'd turned it around by sending his ninkin after the blood that still clung to Zabaza's meat cleaver. Now Zabuza was short the use of one arm, and once again the two Junin were on semi even ground again. Is Zabuza creating this or is it Gohan again? Kakashi wondered briefly, before a pulse in the power laid its true nature bare for him. No, I know this chakra. He whirled and saw something that truly scared him. A red whirlwind was raging inside the ice dome and it seemed to only get more intense. The Kyubi. This was bad. If the Kyubi no Yoko got out now, everyone and everything for miles around would be wiped out by a vicious and bloodthirsty fox. Kyubi. Zabuza repeated, not knowing what the hell Hitaki was talking about. But that was before the memories of horrors past surfaced. When he spoke again, there was a definite note of panic in the brutal Junin's voice. You don't mean. Kakashi nodded, forgetting his duel with the other in light of his latest development. Yeah. Kayubi no Yoko. The nine tailed demon fox. The greatest menace to ever befall Konohagakir. But I thought that your Yandaimi sealed it away. He did, but it looks like that seal is weakening. Haku shuddered in horror from the sheer amount of hatred and killing intent in this chakra. 
He watched as the chakra storm began to subside, but not before the spiral twisted itself into the form of a snarling fox head. The head flew away, then everything went still, but the hatred and blood lingered like a wet sheet. Naruto was crouching in the middle of his icy funhouse, growling and snarling like some kind of animal. His red eyes, clouded by fury, were looking at each mirror in turn, trying to find the real hunter Nin. I have to kill him, Haku thought quickly, drawing a handful of Senbon. Before he kills me, something about the movement that Haku made in reaching for his Senbon pouches drew Naruto's full attention onto him. The masked shinobi had barely enough time to wonder how Naruto had managed to find him before the enraged and superpowered genin charged the mirror right in front of him, coincidentally the one Haku was occupying. No, Haku didn't hesitate, ejecting himself straight out the back of his mirror. His quick action saved his life as Naruto's fist shattered the hard ice as if it was nothing more than a single pane of glass, sending ice fragments flying like a shower of shattered diamonds. The ice user had no time to wonder how impossible it was that his mirrors had been defeated so easily, nor could he evade when Naruto phased into existence before him, livid, vengeful eyes and demonic features inches from Haku's blank mask, his right arm at back for a strike. The shinobi had to time to counter. He was this creature's plaything, and the incensed blonde knew it. The world went white as Naruto's fist crashed into Haku's face with all the gentleness of a stampeding bull elephant. Haku went flying away, corkscrewing in the air. By habit he'd tried to roll with the punch, but it hadn't helped and Naruto had still had the strength and the momentum to knock him flying. The flying nin crashed hard to the cement bridge deck, skidding and making a furrow of debris that hid everything except his masked face. Both of the junin were ignorant of the epic battle unfolding on the other side of the bridge. Kakashi had been about to go after Naruto to stop him when Zabuza had attacked, taking advantage of Kakashi's distraction. Now Zabuza had recalled his mist, though it seemed to be localized to just the two of them. Hitaki knew that it was probably because he was trying to give Haku all the advantage he could to use against Naruto. Great. Now I can't see him. Well, might as well use a different method. Kakashi thought casually as he reached up to the wound across his chest that was still bleeding a little, though the flow of blood had been slowed as the wound began to clot. He swiped a thumb across the wound, wincing a little as his ravaged nerves in the area protested against the sudden stimulation. A scroll dropped from one of the pouches on his flak vest and the junin unrolled the scroll with the grace of one of those ribbon dancers, passing his blood-covered thumb across the kanji scribbled across the page. Kakashi tossed the scroll into the air, the roll of parchment snapping shut with a crisp rustling noise and his gloved hands began flying through a set of seals that would end this little skirmish. Let's see if Zabuza could slice his way of this. Kachiyose. Doden. Suiga no Jutsu. Kanji for summoning poured out of the scroll and into the ground, a twisting web of hairline fractures racing off into the mist. Kakashi smiled grimly beneath his mask. His ninkan had yet to fail at tracking a target. Zabuza was about to get a present. The scarecrow could hardly wait to see how the demon of the mist was going to handle this one. Zabuza hefted his sword onto his shoulders with his good arm. Kakashi was going to die. That Sharingan of his was limited by this mist and because the Junin himself wasn't an Uchiha, which, in turn, meant that the effectiveness and duration the Dojutsu could be used was further reduced. The Junin estimated that Kakashi had a little more than five minutes of use left in him at the most. After that, he would pass out from chakra exhaustion and then Zabuza would be able to kill the Konoha Nin at his leisure. Now Kakashi, the missing Nin said to himself, time to die. Before he could take any action though, a cracking noise split the air and Zabuza looked down in time to see a massive black bulldog wearing a Konoha Harai 8 and a vest with some kind of symbol that looked like a face on it, lunged from the ground and bit into his right shoulder. Close to seven or eight more of the pooches, ranging from a tiny pug puppy to another massive dog, appeared from the ground and all sank their fangs into him. Kakashi grinned as he stood from his kneeling position and pulled his headband back into its usual position. Now, now was the time to end it all. Haku struggled to his feet, swaying as drunkenly as Sasuke had done before. His mask, which had held up surprisingly well from the vicious right cross Naruto had given him, cracked with the sound of ice breaking and began to slide in pieces off of his face. Naruto was looking at one of his clawed hands with curiosity in his red eyes, as if he was trying to determine which position would be the best way to kill Haku with. 
The hand clenched into a fist and the demonic eyes locked onto the boy with the crumbling mask once again. The Konoha Genin let out a primal roar and charged wildly for Haku. The Ice Nin himself watched with the calm that takes over when one knows that their death is at hand. He wasn't afraid to die. He'd failed Zabuza San and now he was about to be punished for it. He was but a broken tool now, nothing more than a thing to be thrown away and forgotten about. Naruto leapt into the air, clearly going to add the momentum of his fall to the punch and put his fist through Haku's head. The last piece of the hunter Nin's mask fell away and clattered to the ground. Why did you stop? Haku asked, staring at Naruto's fist without fear, even though it was mere inches from his face. It was close enough for the cold shinobi to feel the heat, close enough to smell the scent of trees and flowers on it. And blood as well. The blood of his friend as he'd held the dying boy in his arms. Why do you not kill me? Naruto's face, back to normal, complete with the blue eyes and six scar-like marks, was alight with surprise and wonder. Haku was able to read the questions flitting across it as if Naruto was asking them aloud. I know him. Why is he here? Isn't he with Zabuza? I almost killed him. Haku smiled gently. Aren't you going to kill me? He asked gently. Naruto's fist lowered and the boy straightened, wonder still painfully obvious in his sky blue eyes. What, what are you doing here? Back inside the circle of ice mirrors, Gohan began to stir. The half Saiyan pushed himself upright with a groan, but collapsed almost immediately because his arms felt like overcooked spaghetti and his body felt like it weighed as much as an armored truck. His eyes opened and he looked around as much as he could from his lying down position. The ring of mirrors around him was still intact with the exception of one, straight across from him. There was a gap from where the mirror used to be, but the mirror itself was shattered, the tiny fragments of it glittering on the ground, as if someone had just dumped a bucketful of diamonds at the foot of the gap. What happened here? Gohan wondered to himself as he tried to once again push himself up. This time he managed to get to his knees. Then he saw the body. Sasuke was lying just a few feet away from him his face deathly pale and there was no sign of a rise and fall in the genin's chest. No, can't be. Gohan thought desperately as he crawled over to the limp form, trying to fell out the other boy's key. There was no sign of it. Curiously though, there still seemed to be the barest hint of color in his cheeks that hadn't been there when Naruto had last seen the Uchiha, but Gohan didn't know that. Sasuke, please don't be dead. The Super Saiyan pleaded silently as he reached a trembling hand out to touch Sasuke's still one. To his surprise, there was the faintest hint of heat to the kid's skin. Was it just some residual heat that had yet to fade, or was it possible that Sasuke was still alive, no matter how remote the possibility? This kind of thing wasn't Gohan's forte by any means. Still, he did know basic first aid, so he could at least see if it was possible that the Uchiha had yet to pass to the next world really hoping that the kid wouldn't wake up in the middle of this, because it would be really hard to explain, and something told Gohan that Sasuke was more like Vegeta when it came to things of this nature. The young Saiyan crawled over to the death-like boy and placed an ear to his chest, careful to avoid the Senban needle protruding from it. Gohan's eyes dropped closed. The softest, thump thump, of a heartbeat reached the warrior's ears and he reared back in shock. He was still alive. So why didn't that guy with the mask kill him? he'd certainly done his best to kill Gohan, even forcing the boy to take it up to the next level? Speaking of which, Gohan shouldered his way out of his GI top and let it fall around his waist like his dad did sometimes. One eyebrow raised in puzzlement as he looked at his torso. There was no sign of the whatever it was that had made his key backlash with enough force to throw him across the area and knock him out. So what had it been? Gohan didn't know. He would have to ask someone who did later. Maybe Kakashi would know now to see where everyone had run off the super saiyan heaved himself to his feet clutching an aching shoulder most likely from his collision with the ice mirror and staggered towards the hole in the jutsu naruto and haku regarded each other their battle completely forgotten each wondering different things naruto wondering why haku was even here in the first place and haku wondering when naruto was going to get around to killing him any conversation that the boys could have had was stopped before it could even begin by shuffling footsteps and ragged breathing. Both boys looked to see just who the newcomer was. Naruto felt hope spring up in his chest, thinking that it was Sasuke, back from the dead. That hope was mercilessly crushed when he saw that the new arrival was Gohan, who looked like he'd seen better days. 
dried blood clung to the various puncture wounds all over his body and the purple GI that the boy had been wearing since they'd met was ragged and tattered at the edges. One eye was drooping and he held his side, as if the young warrior had a few broken ribs. Haku saw all this and more. Unlike Naruto, he knew that Gohan wouldn't be doing any more fighting that day. The Saiyan looked exhausted, if the panting breaths and the fact that he was leaning on a mirror were anything to go by. Gohan! Naruto cried, running over to his newest friend. Are you alright? You look like crap. The Demi Saiyan laughed weakly, the fatigue from the grueling battle evident in his voice. I'm alright. Trust me, I've been worse. It was true. If the blonde kid got all worked up over this, then Gohan would have loved to see his face after the battle with Cell was done and over with. The Super Saiyan hadn't been able to even move a finger for close to a day after he'd killed that accursed android. Piccolo had had to carry him to the lookout. The hunter Nin a short distance away looked on with wonder at the two as Naruto laughed at some comment Gohan made and the two began arguing good-naturedly. He turned his attention over to where Zabuza and Kakashi were. A heavy bubble of mist hung over their area, obscuring anything that the ice user would have been able to see. But his senses told him everything. Zabuza san was losing, and Kakashi was preparing to deliver the final blow, a sudden surge in chakra telling the hunter everything. Gohan's eyes flickered, picking up the surge in Kakashi's chakra at the same time that Haku did. Wa? Is this Kakashi san? He looked over at the mist bubble, obsidian eyes wide at the scale of the surge. No way. It stole his breath away. It felt like his father's key did when the legendary warrior had used a Kamehameha. By concentrating his key into a single point, the strength was put through the roof. Zabuza watched with wide eyes as Kakashi held a fistful of lightning, so intense that it charged the air around him, making a ring of the stuff on the ground. Impossible! Was the only thought that could make it through the blank wall of shock that had settled over the shinobi's brain and that single word chased itself around and around like a yapping chihuahua chasing its tail. Rakery! Kakashi roared the electrical storm becoming even more intense as the Chidori upgraded itself to a rakery. There was no real difference in the look of the jutsu, however, it was like Gohan's Masenko and Kamehameha. Outwardly, the two were practically identical, but the difference in power was astounding. The jutsu complete, Hitaki looked up, cold fury in his eye. He wouldn't need the Sharingan for this one, not with Zabuza held down by the leaf Junin's Ninkan. Die. He rushed forward. Zabuza san, Haku phased out of sight, forcing Gohan and Naruto's conversation to a halt. Zabuza shut his eyes, giving in to the cowardly instincts that hadn't shown themselves since before he was a genin, this was it. There was a sickening, splurch, and Zabuza opened his eyes, marveling at how painless Kakashi's jutsu was. Blood splattered him as his eyes opened. And they opened wide, matching Kakashi's surprised look, when he saw just whom the other junin had hit. Impaled on the Konoha Nin's electrically charged fist was Haku, eyes glassy with the look only a corpse could have. Zabuza looked on helplessly, strange new emotions that came from nowhere swirling inside of him as he watched his best tool. No, his only friend crumpled to the deck of the bridge, laying there without so much as a single twitch when Hitaki withdrew his hand. Kakashi looked close to startled as tears, actual tears, welled up in the missing Nin's eyes. Gohan shuddered as a key signature was violently snuffed out. Hey, Gohan? Naruto's voice held concern for the Saiyan. One moment the two had been talking, and the next the warrior was leaning even more heavily on the mirror, sweat beating on his face, even with the chilly temperatures that came from the mirrors. Some, someone just died. Gohan said with a shudder. It was a feeling he'd felt several times before, but never got used to no matter how often it happened. I think it's that ice kid. He was the only candidate. He'd vanished, then a second later, the key had vanished. As if to prove Gohan's point, the ice mirrors shattered as one with the sound of breaking glass, diamond like fragments glinting in the sun as the fell in slow motion towards the ground. Now it was Naruto's turn to go pale as the realization dawned on him. No, not him. He doesn't deserve this. Without waiting a second longer, the loud genin hurtled off toward the dissipating mist cloud, ignoring the other boy's yells to come back. Damn it! Gohan swore, not bothering to wonder what his mother would have thought of his language. He shoved to his feet and staggered off, going after the blonde before he did something stupid. Kakashi watched impassively as Zabuza looked at Haku's body with dead eyes, 
looking for all the world like a man who was totally out of his element. The feelings of grief. It was a whole new and strange experience for the demon of the mist. Harsh laughter caught everyone's attention and there was a flicker of emotion in Zabaza's eyes, and it didn't look friendly either. The annoying, tap-tap, of an expensive cane began sounding as Gadu strode onto the bridge, looking smug, with a miniature army of ronin, thugs, and assorted criminals in tow, all leering at the weary shinobi. This is bad, Kakashi thought numbly, not wanting to go against so many enemies in his current state. We're all too tired to fight, not against these numbers. Well well. The tiny businessman crowed triumphantly as he continued his advance on the ninja. You sure talk big, Zabuza. I expected a little bit more out of ya. He looked down his bespectacled nose at Haku's corpse with a superior look on his face. Even you little boyfriend bit it. Rage passed through Zabaza's eyes at the insult. Kakashi. The demon's voice was weary and low, probably because of anger and fatigue combined with loss. Knowing he had the Junin's attention, Zabuza continued. It looks like I've been betrayed, which means my contract is null. He didn't have to finish. The scarecrow nodded in agreement. Right. So, what are we gonna do about this little jam that we're in? Zabuza wasn't given a chance to respond. Well, Zabuza. It's been fun, but it's time for you to disappear now. I'm sure that you'll see this little runt in hell. That was when Gatu made the biggest and last mistake of his life. He spit on Haku's body. Kakashi blinked and Gatu was falling back with his chest brutally slashed open, blood spraying everywhere, face frozen in surprise and pain. Zabaza's sole good arm dropped, his Zanbatu falling from limp fingers to clatter to the ground, the wielder no longer having the strength to swing it. Boss. One of the ronin cried. It wasn't so much the fact that he was loyal to Gadu, but more of the fact that he wanted to get paid. The disowned samurai's face contorted with rage. You bastard. Before Kakashi could move to help, Zabuza was run through by a lightning fast Iido draw that seemed to defy its user's grubby appearance. The mist nin just looked down numbly at the red blade that stuck out through his stomach. He coughed and blood soaked the bandages covering his mouth. He grinned at the men that surrounded him leering at every single one, as if daring them to try an attack. Damn you! One of the other henchmen shouted, holding his yari high. Don't get why when you're about to die. Kakashi watched, horrified, as the tip was buried into Zabaza's already ravaged shoulder. Zabuza! The copy nin shouted as he drew a kanai and prepared to help out, it didn't matter that the two had been enemies just minutes ago, no one deserved the slow death that Momochi was clearly going to get. No. Zabaza's shout brought the Junin up short. The missing Nin looked at his former adversary and shook his head. No Kakashi. I'm gonna kill this riffraff myself. If we hadn't met Gatu, Haku would still be alive. An insane light that Kakashi had gotten accustomed to seeing directed at him entered the Demon of the Mist's eyes and killing intent swept over the battlefield. I'm gonna make that bastard pay by killing everyone associated with him. Zabaza's one good hand began flashing together in one handed seals. The henchmen seemed to realize what that meant and they all rushed forward to stick the helpless missing Nin with their weapons, hoping to kill him before he finished his jutsu. Hitaki recognized the sequence, even without the Sharingan. After all, Zabuza had used it on Gohan not too long ago. Sweden. Swiryuden no jutsu. From below the bridge, a churning could be heard as the ocean below began to writhe and toss. A shrieking roar filled the air as a column of water shot high into the sky and took on the form of a dragon with sinister yellow eyes. What the hell is that? One thug shouted, just before the creature lunged and swept over them, slaughtering all the opposition with impunity, either crushing them with tons of water or drowning them in an instant. Zabuza was in the middle of it all. Kakashi ran over to the other shinobi, expecting him to be dead, but the second Junin was still clinging to life despite the weapons in him and the damage done by his own jutsu. The masked shinobi didn't ask why Zabuza had done what he did. It had pretty obvious that the missing Nin had blamed Gadu for what had happened to Haku, and there was a sick and twisted logic to the dying shinobi's thinking. Ka. Kashi, Momochi gasped out, hacking from the water and making more blood stain the bandages that hid the lower half of his face. Take, me, too, he didn't need to finish. Kakashi picked up the other Junin and carried him to the motionless form of his best weapon and friend. As Hitaki set Zabuza down, he couldn't help but marvel at what the other ninja had done. 
It had been a stupid and ridiculous action, but the missing Nin hadn't had a choice. He'd been mortally wounded anyway. He'd probably thought it would be best to go out with a bang. Gohan watched as life continued to slip away from Zabuza. He felt sorry for the guy, he really did. It had taken the death of his friend to make him realize what the concept meant. Kakashi? He asked tentatively. Will he? The Z fighter trailed off as the masked man shook his head before Gohan had even finished speaking. No he was hit by too many weapons and he's inflicted even more injury to himself by using the Swiryuden on himself. There was a somber pause as the two lapsed into silence, watching the blood pool beneath Zabuza and the sky begin to get cloudy as a high-level overcast blew in. A shock ran through both warriors without warning. A quick look at Zabuza's corpse told them everything they needed to know. He was gone, the flinty eyes, once filled with malice and blood, were now blank and glassy. They wouldn't be terrifying anyone ever again. Is this the first time you've ever seen someone die? Kakashi's question caught the other fighter off guard and all he managed in response was an eloquent, huh? Hitaki repeated his question and Gohan's eyes shadowed as he hung his head. I wish I could say it was. He trailed off and the Junin knew that no other explanation would be forthcoming. The copy Nin felt a rush of sympathy for the boy. Gohan wasn't that old, so if he'd already seen death, he'd have been very young indeed. Well, that's one person I won't have to give the death speech to. The silver-haired shinobi sighed to himself as he turned around and began walking back to where Sakura and Tazuna were. I'll get Naruto. Gohan volunteered and headed for the stricken-looking blonde a few yards away. With a thrill, the half-saiyan realized that Naruto had probably seen the whole encounter with Zabuza. Great. Looks like Kakashi will have to give that speech sooner than he thought. Gohan? Naruto asked, his voice devoid of emotion, his eyes conveying nothing but shock. Unlike Gohan, whose first brush with death had been to witness his father's and uncle's deaths at the hands of his eventual sensei, Piccolo. Raditz hadn't been any cause to lose sleep over, but Goku's death had torn the young fighter up for days during his time in the wild. What happened? Suicide, the other boy sighed in return, running a hand through his shaggy hair. His mom insisted that he get it trimmed, but Gohan had been able to stave her off in the months since the Cell Games. Zabuza and Kakashi beat each other up pretty badly and when Gatu's goons showed up, well, he gestured to the devastation behind him, letting the scene behind him do the talking, complete with soggy bodies, puddles of diluted blood and a very soggy bridge. Naruto glanced at Sasuke's still form, what about? He's not dead, Gohan interrupted. I dunno what you saw that made you go crazy, but when I looked he had a faint heartbeat and he was breathing. He looked at the motionless Avenger as well. I didn't do anything cuz I wasn't sure about the needles. The young Z fighter wasn't too keen on pulling out the needles only puncture Sasuke's heart and kill the Avenger for real. Now he approached the motionless boy and slung an arm around his shoulder. Help me, maybe Kakashi will know what to do. Naruto looked frozen by indecision, but eventually nodded and jogged over, slinging Sasuke's other arm over his shoulder. Together the two boys half carried half dragged the unconscious Uchiha over to the others. Kakashi was busy discussing what they would do now with Tazuna and Sakura when the Kunoichi abruptly screamed and ran off behind the Junin. Hitaki looked over his shoulder and his visible eye widened when he beheld what Sakura had been screaming about. Naruto and Gohan, bloody and tattered, were walking slowly over to them, dragging the limp form of Uchiha Sasuke between them. Kakashi was stricken with a sudden burst of grief as he beheld what he believed to be the Avenger's body. The Genin's feet were dragging on the ground with a rough rasping noise and his head hung limp, lolling from side to side with each step of his two supporters. It was faint, but the Junin could also see a darker spot on his chest, barely visible against the deep navy blue of his shirt. In the center of that spot was a bright speck. Kakashi wondered what it was for a second then he realized it was one of that ice nin's senbon. Damn, he swore softly before he followed the team's Kunoichi who had reached the other two and was busy sobbing her eyes out over the pale boy. Up close, Sasuke was even worse looking. Dried blood clung to the side of his face and there was a streak on the corner of his lips too, a bad sign for sure. Sasuke's skin was pale, even compared to normal. Before the Junin could ask how the kid had died, Gohan spoke. Kakashi, you gotta pull that needle in his chest out. At seeing the shinobi's inquiring gaze, the warrior continued, he's still alive, but in some kind of death-like sleep. 
Surprise rippled through Kakashi and he leaned in closer to inspect the area where the Senban had lodged. Drawing on the dusty knowledge he had from his Anbu days, the copy nin realized that the needle had missed the fatal pressure point by just a few millimeters. It was too close to be a chance. The ice nin had deliberately aimed to disable and not kill. You're right, Gohan, he murmured, almost too softly for the others to hear. Ignoring Sakura's noises of disbelief, the Junin reached up and placed the needle between his index and middle fingers, pinching gently to ensure that the Senban wouldn't move that crucial few millimeters and kill Sasuke. He grasped the tip with his other hand and pulled, guiding the weapon out of the Uchiha's chest with a precision that only a high-ranked shinobi could have. Once the needle was free, the group waited with bated breath to see how fast the stoic kid would come around. One minute passed. Then two. Halfway through that second minute, Kakashi began to doubt if he'd pulled it out properly. Just as Sakura began to shake with held back sobs, Sasuke stirred and opened dark eyes, taking in his predicament and surroundings in a couple of seconds. While happy tears streamed silently down Sakura's face, Kakashi looked at the young genius as he gingerly stepped back from Gohan and Naruto's support, swaying a little. How do you feel, Sasuke? Hitaki asked. Like a pincushion, the protege replied evenly his face giving away nothing, he rolled a shoulder, but, I think alive. You bastard! Naruto shouted, getting within inches of Sasuke's face. You damn near gave me a heart attack. If you do that again, I'll kill you. The dark-haired shinobi smirked. Like you could. Even as the two went back and forth, it was clear to everyone that Naruto was relieved to see the grim kid alive and well. The other three members of the group just exchanged glances as the two continued arguing like no tomorrow. Three weeks later and Team 7 stood on the completed bridge that linked Wave Country with the mainland. All of the shinobi were packed to travel and Gohan had on his cape, figuring he might as well get something out of the journey to Konoha no matter how small. See you around, Inari. Naruto called, waving at the young boy with a grin. You better not cry anymore. The kid shot back with a faint retort, but was drowned out by the rest of the village which had turned out in force to see off their heroes, all waved and shouted goodbyes and other various wishes before the group turned and headed off down the bridge, their next destination being Konoha. All too soon, the salty smell of the sea faded, and the deep thumping of the waves on the cliffs faded not too long after. It was just a little past noon and the dirt road the shinobi walked down was dappled with the shadows of the trees that stood thick on the sides of the quiet lane. None of them were willing to break the peace that hung around them and even Naruto seemed to be content to listen to the rhythmic scraping of the group's feet and the warbling cries of various birds. Gohan was felling relaxed to the highest degree, breathing in the pure air, heavily scented with the perfumes of flowers. He tended to reflect on things in utter silence like this and he stayed true to form, lapsing into his memories of the battle three weeks ago, eventually centering on his failed transformation. Why didn't it work? He wondered to himself pondering everything that he'd seen and felt during the process. He'd done it the same way he'd been doing it since he and his father had pushed themselves to the max in the special room in Den's lookout. The lightning had been something new, though. There had been lighting during the switch before, but it was fleeting and never lasted like it had during the fight. The ascended Super Saiyan form, what Gohan had come to call Super Saiyan 2, had lightning, but it was static electricity even at its strongest. What really concerned Gohan, though, was the glass ceiling he'd hit towards the end. He'd hit it and been blown away by his own power. He'd never had this problem before, so why now? Nothing had been strange until, the dimension switch, could that be the cause? The Super Saiyan didn't remember much about the transition, but he did remember being hit by some weird light that had burned him like a branding iron. It was like, it was like his power had been sealed away behind some kind of barrier. Gohan frowned to himself. Seals were unheard of in his dimension, unless you counted the one that had sealed Bojack away, and the one that had kept the old Piccolo locked up tight, Garlic Jr. didn't count, that had been another dimension. In the long history of his universe, there were only two instances of seals that he knew of. Seals were much more prevalent in this dimension, so maybe someone here would know the answer. The young half Saiyan's eyes fell on the Junin he was walking next to down the shady lane. When they made camp, he'd talked to Kakashi about it. He hoped it would be one on one. Gohan didn't mind if the others knew he was a Super Saiyan, but for some reason, he wanted to keep it under wraps for as long as he could. 
Team 7 kept walking until twilight was well underway and the sun was only half visible above the horizon to the west. Camp was pitched in no time at all, thanks to Naruto using a small army of cage bunshins to help set up. Getting a fire going was a snap. Who needed tinder when you had Kaden? Gukaku no jutsu? After that was done, Kakashi sent the four kids to go get dinner while he made sure camp was set up right, meaning he was going to read, Icha Icha. Gohan was no fool and saw his chance. While the others were still fishing, he phased into the stream, grabbed the first big salmon he saw, and phased out before the other three even realized what had happened. Kakashi looked up in mild surprise when Gohan strode back into camp, soaking wet, with a huge salmon slung over his shoulder. Hitaki knew that the young man wanted a word with him, if the looks he'd been tossing Kakashi's way since leaving Tazuna's were any indication. The movements the half Saiyan made while setting up his fish were almost mechanical and there was a faint glaze in his eyes as if his mind was elsewhere. He finished the setup and simply stared into the fire for a minute, contemplating something. Hitaki decided he would make the opening move. Gohan? Something wrong? The formidable fighter stood and nodded, keeping his eyes on the crackling flames. Yeah. What? Remember what happened when I fought that ice guy back in the village? Kakashi blinked trying to remember which part. That whole fight had been full of surprises, from Keke Jenke to a glimpse of Armageddon. You mean the part where the world came close to ending? It was an attempt at humor, but Gohan flinched. That's the one. Listen, I'd appreciate it if you didn't tell the others. Kakashi nodded, knowing that this was something Gohan wanted to confide in him and him alone. Well, he proceeded to tell Kakashi the whole story explaining what a saiyan and a super saiyan were and what had transpired at the bridge at the end the sliver of kakashi's face that could be seen looked pensive hmm you say that this is the first time this has happened right gohan nodded and it never happened back in your dimension gohan shook his head no not even transforming for the first time was this hard kakashi glanced around and decided they were alone show me gohan looked wary but he sank into his stance all the same. Wait. Take the cape and GI top off. I think that whatever this is is probably on your chest somewhere. Seals like this usually are for some reason. The fighter shrugged, trusting the Junin and proceeded to shuck the requested items, allowing the top to fall around his waist. Ready? The kid asked. Kakashi nodded, preparing for the onslaught once again. Gohan began his drawn out Kiai and the blue aura blasted into existence. The power-up continued on, sending dust and stones everywhere and even peeling off the bark on some of the trees in the clearing where the group was camped. The earth beneath Gohan fractured in a lump of displaced air blew a sizable depression in the ground. Kakashi continued to stare, expecting to see the seal at any minute as the Super Saiyan's aura blasted out of existence, though the wind and earthquake continued. A second later, gold energy appeared around Gohan's feet and flashed into a brilliant aura of gold flame outlining the Z fighter and giving off its distinctive high-pitched pulsating chirping noise. Then the kanji appeared. Lighting streamed into the sky, twisting into the double helix from before then the electricity reversed direction and Gohan yelled in pain before a pulse of white light blew him off his feet and sent him flying. He would have been knocked out again from hitting a tree if Kakashi hadn't caught him with a quick shunshin no jutsu. After Kakashi had used his own army of shadow clones to set up the camp again since it had been blown over by Gohan, the Junin looked at the kid again as he pulled on his top and cape. Well? The fighter asked. Kakashi sighed. I think you're right about the mark being a seal. But I can tell you that I have neither the knowledge nor the power required to break it. A downcast look flooded the Saiyan's eyes. He felt crushed. What if he actually ran into a situation that warranted a change? If he couldn't transform, his ass was grass. However, I'm sure someone in Konoha will know. Who? Gohan asked in a forlorn voice. If Kakashi couldn't do it, then who could? There's Suenade Haim and Jiraiya Sama of the Sanin and their teacher, the Sandame Hokage, Serutobi Sama. If anyone will know how to break this seal, it'll be them. Gohan's eyes showed doubt. Kakashi sighed. Look, of those three, Jiraiya is the one who had the best chance. He's a master of Fuenjutsu, but the other two aren't too shabby either. You also have a chance at it. The Demi Saiyan's head tilted. Huh, what do you mean? Seals can be broken through sheer force, and you have more force than anyone I've ever seen. 
You could have given Arashi Sensei a run for his money and I can offer no higher compliment than that. It was true. Even after his sensei's death, Kakashi still held the man on a pedestal, even though he knew that the inventor of Hiraishin and Rasengan was only human. I'll bet if you throw as much key as you can, despite the effects, at the seal, it'll shatter. I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm sure if worse comes to worse, you could break it. After two run-ins with this seal, Gohan was sure that breaking the seal with force would be the last thing he did. So, any ideas on why I got this thing in the first place? Kakashi scratched his mask. I'm not a seal master, not by a long shot, but I do have a theory. Seeing his companion was all ears, the Junin continued. I think that it's all about balance. See, nature is about balance, and I'm sure that tendency transcends dimensions as well. What happens when you put oil on top of water and shake it? It mixes, then separates. Right. In other words, it returns to balance. It's the same with temperature. If I open a cold room and a hot room, one will warm and the other will cool until they're almost equal. Or you could say that they're balanced, Gohan finished. Kakashi nodded, glad the kid had caught on so fast. I think that it was the same with your coming here. If you'd come from your dimension as you were, you would have thrown out the balance of our world. So what you're saying is, the dimension sealed off my power to decrease it enough to where it wouldn't upset the balance. I think so. So what would happen if I broke the seal? Would it just reset? That question gave Kakashi pause. He scratched his mask absently as he compared what he'd seen from Gohan so far to beings he knew in this world. Hard to say, he said finally, my opinion is that you'd be fine. You're strong, there's no doubt about that, but there are creatures here who outclass you. The Kyubi, for instance. Personally, I feel that introducing someone of your strength all at once would have done something bad, so nature decided to prevent it, but now that you're here, if that power were reintroduced, it wouldn't do anything major. He eyes smiled. Aside from giving us all heart attacks from what your transformations do to the world around you. This time Gohan smiled feebly at the humor, but he still felt naked being in a world where his greatest trump card was beyond his reach for now. You're sure about this? No I've seen and done a lot during my time as a shinobi, but you're the first person I've ever met who's from another world. Everything I've said is just speculation based on what you've told me. Kakashi shrugged. I think that it's the most probable theory though, if it's any consolation. Gohan was spared answering by the arrival of the rest of the group, who promptly started bombarding the pair with questions about the phenomena brought by the son of Goku's second transformation attempt. He stared into the fire as Kakashi deflected the questions and made the others sit down and cook. Three days passed by quickly as Kakashi increased the pace to get the team back to Konoha to collect their pay and file the after-action report with the Hokage. The night of his discussion with Gohan, Kakashi had summoned Pakun and sent him ahead with a missive explaining the incident with the Super Saiyan and the request to file the report in private with only Kakashi, the Sandame, and Gohan present. Now the team stood before the gate to Konoha, Sakura and Naruto jabbering excitedly about being back home after almost a month's absence. Gohan was looking through the yawning portal at the bustling street before them, lined with shops and people giving those shops business, and at the most distinctive feature of the village hidden in the leaves, the Hokage Monument. On the ridge that towered over the entire village were four faces, each the size of a house and elegantly shaped out of the rock on which they sat Naruto was the first one to see where Gohan was looking. That's the Hokage Monument, he said excitedly. Every Hokage ever has had their face up there and someday, I'm gonna be up there too. He looked at his instructor. Hey, Kakashi Sensei, can we go? I wanna go find Uruka Sensei and get some Ichiraku. Sure, go ahead. You three are free for the day. I've got to take Gohan here to the Sandame so we can get approval for him to be here. I'll take care of the report and get you guys pay mailed to you. Sakura and Naruto cheered and all three genin jumped away, bounding across rooftops on their way home or whatever they had planned to do that day. Kakashi looked down at the caped teen next to him. Well Gohan, you ready? Sure. Let's go. The pair strode off down the street heading for the Hokage's tower. As Gohan and Kakashi made their way to the tower for an audience with the Sandame, in another world there was also a meeting happening, but it was of a much less happy and casual nature. WHAAT. The shout that came from the small house on the top of Mount Pauzu seemed to shake the world and birds in the forest took flight in terror at the sheer viciousness in the screaming voice. 
Inside the house, Sun Chi-Chi, Gohan's mother was on her feet with a knocked over chair behind her and her hands on the table. She was looking at the blue haired woman straight across from her, who was hiding behind the shoulder of a tough looking man with a widow's peak and gravity defying hair. What I mean that Gohan's gone? Chi Chi demanded, glaring at Bulma as the other woman cowered behind her husband, Vegeta. Vegeta wasn't there because he wanted to be. In all honesty, he'd rather be miles away from Kakaro's house in this situation, but his wife had demanded that he come or he didn't get dinner. It wasn't until Bulma had explained what had happened in the lab that the Prince of Saiyans regretted his decision to come along. Even a Super Saiyan couldn't stand up to the wrath of son Chi Chi where her sons were concerned. Um, well, Chi Chi, it's just like I said, Bulma answered nervously. Gohan was helping me out with an experiment I was running and well, he sorta, fell, through. Chi Chi's face went through a series of angry contortions and she glared at the inventor. So you're saying that there's no way he can come back? She shrieked, making Vegeta wince. Saiyans had more sensitive hearing than humans after all. His patience with the whole situation had reached its limits too. That's what she said, woman he said in a rough and abrasive tone. How many more times do you want it to be said? Why you, you keep out of this, Chi Chi yelled, making Bulma hide behind Vegeta's shoulder again. This was why the prince was here. To be her bodyguard in the hopes that he'd be able to do something if Chi Chi got mad, though privately, both of them knew that there was nothing that he could do if Chi Chi started swinging that frying pan of hers. Now now, Chi Chi, calm down. I'm sure Bulma meant no harm. Ox King said gently, trying to calm his raging daughter down. He'd come by to see his two grandsons only to find that Goten was asleep and Gohan had been missing for a few weeks now. A vein was going in the pissed off mom's forehead as she forced herself into the chair her father had set upright. How long will it take to bring my Gohan back? she demanded. Bulma came out from behind Vegeta, knowing she had to be careful here or she'd find herself with a frying pan sticking out of her forehead. Uh, well. I don't know how long it'll take, Chi Chi. She said softly. A while though. I have to rebuild the generator from scratch. The woman of the sun household's ear twitched and she lunged for a cupboard and pulled out her frying pan. W H A A A T. Ox King lunged and grabbed his daughter around the waist as she raised the pan and got one foot on the table, but even the mammoth man's stupendous strength couldn't stop the wife of Goku. Chi Chi, wait. It was too late and Chi Chi began her swing. Bulma yelped and grabbed Vegeta, pulling him in front of her like a human shield. Hey, wait, Ona, what do you think you're doing? He yelled over his shoulder, but looked back around when a shadow fell over his face. He saw the burnt steel bottom of the frying pan. There was a tremendous clang that rocked the top of the mountain and Vegeta fell unconscious with a square mark on his face. Chi Chi raised her now deformed frying pan for another strike as Bulma heaved her husband up and bolted from the house running as if the devil herself was after her. Sure enough, Chi Chi was following, brandishing the pan and yelling obscenities, her father still clinging to her waist, bouncing along on the ground. Chi Chi! Stop! Shut up, Dad! Bulma reached into her jacket and pulled out a capsule that she threw. The capsule exploded and revealed a sky car, into which she threw the unconscious Vegeta and hopped into the driver's seat. The car bolted into the sky as Chi Chi raged below her father still holding onto her. Get back here, I'm gonna tan your hide, inside the house, the one-year-old Godin watched from his crib as his mommy did funny things in the front yard and he giggled, clapping his pudgy hands in approval. Elsewhere, son Gohan was oblivious to his mother's ranting, but for some reason, a chill ran down his spine and he looked around, as if expecting to see Chi Chi looming behind him with that frying pan in her hands. Kakashi noticed his charge's sudden nervousness, something wrong, Gohan? he asked mildly. Gohan shook his head. No I've just got this feeling that my mother's not too happy right now. He shivered, a look of nervousness on his face. She's got a wicked arm, especially with that frying pan. Even dad doesn't like it. Kakashi quirked an eyebrow. Your father? Isn't he the one that saved your world and others several times over? The Demi Saiyan nodded. Yeah, and mom scares even him. Sounds like I wouldn't want to cross her. Gohan shook his head vigorously. No you don't trust me. But usually she's really nice, it's just when she gets mad that you have to watch out. He shuddered again. The problem is she's got a really short fuse. Kakashi shrugged. 
It wasn't like he was going to meet Gohan's mother anyway. Not unless he decided to visit Gohan in his dimension anyway. Well, never mind that now. We've got a meeting with the Sandane. It's better if we don't keep him waiting. Right. The pair continued their trek towards the tower, Gohan looking around in amazement. He started when a shinobi dropped out of the sky from out of nowhere and vaulted back into the air, landing on the power lines and running off ahead of them. Kakashi noticed the boy's stunned expression and the person who'd caused it. He grinned, the expression hidden beneath his mask. Watch him, the Junin said, making Gohan break his gaze from the other shinobi to look at him. He's gonna get busted here in a minute. Gohan watched and, sure enough, almost as soon as the word left Kakashi's mouth, a cloaked and masked ninja popped out of thin air. The first shinobi skidded to a stop on the lines and looked sheepish. Words were exchanged between the two and the masked ninja reached into his cloak and withdrew a small sheet of yellow paper and handed it to the disgruntled looking shinobi who pocketed it and dropped off the line, heading away on rooftops instead. The masked shinobi watched him go then made a hand sign and disappeared in a burst of smoke. Anbu, Kakashi said with a little laugh at Gohan's expression. The special forces for Konohagakure. One of their secondary duties also happens to be doing some minor police work. His eye darkened. They're good at what they do. Don't cross them and you'll be fine. Gohan nodded with a little grin. Unless he was very much mistaken, that shinobi had just gotten a ticket. Finally the duo arrived at the tower and were waved through by the two ninja at the entrance who were dressed like Kakashi with black bodysuits and green vests. The tower was alive with activity, shinobi constantly entering and leaving, some with exhausted looks on their faces, others with excitement, boredom, or trepidation. Inside there was a massive room with a long table at one end and three or four other ninjas seated behind it, clearly the ones handing out missions. One of them saw Gohan and Kakashi and stood up. Kakashi-san, Hokage-sama is waiting for you upstairs, he'll see you as soon as you get there. Kakashi nodded and clapped Gohan on the shoulder, guiding the boy up a spiraling flight of stairs and past several doors. Finally the stairs ended and they exited into the open air. The half Saiyan could see that they were about halfway up the tower and still had some ways to go. The two headed up a flight of stairs that wrapped around the outside of the tower and gave an unobstructed view of the four heads of the Hokage monument before taking them back inside and down a hall lined with ink paintings and a lush carpet. At the end were two more masked Anbu who nodded to Kakashi as if they knew him and opened the doors for him. Inside was a room with wrap-around windows that showed the monument through them and just in front of them was a finely crafted desk with stacks of paper on it and a grizzled old man seated in a large chair behind it. The doors boomed shut and the old man looked up and smiled kindly. Ah, Kakashi. You've returned from the wave country I see. Kakashi nodded and the old man stood up and looked down at Gohan who looked back with a puzzled look. The man had on a wide triangular hat that was solid red except for a little diamond-shaped patch of white on it on which the symbol for fire was clearly visible. Cloth fell from the underside and hid his ears. The man was swathed in red robes held closed with a white sash and there was a white howry over the red robes. And this would be the mysterious boy you told me about? Yes Hokage-sama. This is son Gohan and he arrived here via means that would boggle even Akami. The Hokage strode out from behind his desk and walked over to Gohan to better take in his appearance. Indeed. He made one round trip around the nervous Saiyan before stopping and offering his hand with a kindly smile. I am Sarutobi Sanosaka, the Sandame Hokage my boy. Gohan grasped the old guy's hand. I'm Sun Gohan. Thank you for letting me into the village, Sarutobi Sama. The old man laughed heartily. Well, at least you have manners. I thought that you'd be like Naruto after reading Kakashi's report. Gohan blinked. You know Naruto? Sarutobi smiled jovially. Of course. That little troublemaker is in here every day of the week if he isn't out on a mission. Gohan grinned. He could get to like this Hokage. He was obviously an honorable man and in Gohan's mind that went a long way. Now the Sandame turned serious. Now, Gohan-kun, we must find some accommodations for you and see about getting you some money for your stay here in Konohagakure. He tapped his bearded chin. We do have a welfare system in place. I suppose we could get some resources out of there in. Please sir, I don't want anyone to be pitying me like this. Three eyes turned onto Gohan after he spoke. I can find my own way and get my own food and things. I really appreciate what you're doing for me, but I can pull my own weight. 
The third smiled. Kakashi, you've got a real independent kid here, he remarked, to which the Saiyan colored slightly. The old man looked at the copy nin. I don't suppose you have a solution to this problem do you? Kakashi blinked a couple of times before speaking. Well, Gohan did help us out with the mission in Wave. I don't suppose that he could receive the pay for the mission could he? The Sandame scowled. That would mean cutting your team's pay again, he warned. How about a compromise then? Once again, all attention turned onto Gohan. You can keep the pay, but I get to live in the village for free as long as I do missions for the village. The elderly fire shadow stroked his beard. Yes, I suppose that could work. It still doesn't cover food though. But the living for free would cut the amount Kakashi would have to hold back from the others, Gohan pointed out. Or you could pay me on commission. You know, I get paid on how many missions I do. That's how all shinobi are paid with the exception of Junin and Anbu. And there's the problem of assigning you to a team. Kakashi spoke up. Put him on team 7. I wouldn't mind having him and I don't think my team would mind, even Sasuke, though he'd never say it outright. Serutobi nodded. Okay then. I'll assign Gohan kun to Team 7. Now there's the matter of the seal you were talking about. He looked at the Saiyan, who was suddenly looking nervous. May I see it? I guess. Gohan pulled off his GI top and prepared to transform. Wait. Kakashi's voice brought him up short. Don't actually try to transform. Bring it close, but only until the seal appears. We don't need Anbu turning you into a pincushion. Gohan nodded and began raising his key a little bit at a time. Soon enough, the kanji for one appeared. The warrior held his power there as Serutobi leaned in, examining the brand with an expert and interested eye. You say you got it from switching dimensions? Yes. The village leader went to his desk and pulled out a pipe into which he tamped some tobacco and lit it, staring out the window as he did. He took a draft and exhaled, the scent of burning socks clawing at Gohan and Kakashi's noses. Well, it is certainly a complex and powerful seal. Kakashi's report describes you as having a fair bit of power and this seal is holding that back. He turned to face them. I really don't see how it's possible to break it. Gohan slumped in defeat. If a wise village leader couldn't figure it out, how could he? Serutobi spoke again. However, if Gohan kun will permit me to make a copy of his seed to examine in greater detail, I may be able to find a way to shatter it. Yes. Gohan exclaimed without hesitation. The Hokage smiled at his enthusiasm and drew out a sheet of paper and a bit of charcoal. Placing the charcoal against Gohan's chest, he quickly sketched the thing, making sure to miss not a single detail. Then he made a set of one-handed seals and the copy shimmered. There. That should do it. The jutsu I just used will copy the finer details, like lines of script that are too small to be seen with the naked eye and too fine to be copied with a piece of charcoal. With this, I'll be able to study the seal closely and hopefully find a solution for you, Gohan Kun. Serutobi strode to his desk again and reached inside, pulling out a Konoha Harai 8, just like the one Kakashi and his team wore. Here, wear this Harai 8. You'll get fewer questions if you wear it around. You're a strange face in the village and people here are understandably wary of strangers, but with this, they'll see you belong in the village and will hopefully leave you alone. The teen took the headband with a word of thanks and tied it to the sash of his GI, making sure the engraved plate faced outward, leaving the stylized leaf obvious and visible. Now, Gohan kun, you may leave. I still have some things to discuss with Kakashi and I'm sure you'd like to explore the village. Gohan bowed and left, closing the door quietly behind him and leaving the tower. He paused outside the gates to the tower, wondering where he should head next. Konohagakir was so big and there was so much to explore. Gohan shrugged, grinning like his father and ran off in a random direction, figuring he might as well get started. Soon enough, the Demi Saiyan found himself wandering down a street, looking left and right as fast as he could turn his head. Then his stomach rumbled loudly, causing some of the pedestrians to pause and look up at the cloudless sky. It was lunchtime, but Gohan hadn't the foggiest idea of where to get some food. Hey! Gohan! The warrior turned at the voice and saw Naruto waving at him with a bright grin, accompanied by a young-looking man with a scar running across the bridge of his nose. Naruto, hi. Neither noticed some of the villagers look at them with disgust and hurry off elsewhere. No one wanted to be near the demon and a stranger. How Amino-san could stand the boy was beyond the comprehension of many. What are you doing here? 
Naruto laughed. Uruka sensei said he's gonna treat me to ramen for helping out against Zabuza. Naruto was telling me how you took on Zabuza and his partner, Gohan kun, the man said with a smile. He stuck out his hand. I'm Amino Uruka, by the way. Son Gohan, nice to meet you, Uruka san. Hey, hey, Uruka sensei, can Gohan come with us? Uruka grinned. I don't see why not, he looked at the Z fighter, would you like to join us? Gohan waved his hands. I couldn't, I don't have any money, he looked away, it wouldn't be right. The scarred Shunin laughed, it's okay, I insist, you probably don't eat as much as Naruto. Gohan still looked doubtful, I dunno. Naruto clapped him on the back, ah come on, Gohan, it'll be fun. The warrior only smiled at his friend's exuberance. Well, okay I guess. The blonde whooped happily and the trio went down the street a ways until they arrived at a small stand that proclaimed, Ichiraku Ramen. Naruto laughed and ducked through the flap. Hey, old man, Ayame-chan, I'm back. The girl working at the walks, Ayame probably, turned around and grinned when she saw the blonde. Hi, Naruto-kun, back from your mission. Yep. And now Uruka sensei is going to treat me to ramen. He plunked himself down and promptly ordered a bowl of miso ramen. Uruka ordered vegetable and Gohan looked over the menu inked out on the pine board behind Ayame. What'll it be? Ayame asked kindly. Uh, beef ramen I guess, Gohan answered. Coming right up, uh, Naruto saved Gohan the trouble, his name's Gohan. Nice to meet you, Gohan kun. Ramen was served at that moment and the three dug in with gusto, though none more so than Naruto, who wasn't so much eating as he was inhaling. The Z fighter could only stare, having never seen someone outside the Saiyans eat so damn fast. Uruka laughed at the look on his face. See what I mean? He asked. The teacher looked fondly at Naruto. Cleans out my wallet every time we come here. An old grizzled man came out from the back door. That kid's the reason we give Amino san a big old discount. If we didn't, he'd starve. Go ahead, Gohan kun, Amino said. Eat as much as you want. Gohan split a pair of chopsticks and shrugged, the movement exaggerated by the wide shoulders of his cape. Well, he replied, still uncertain. If you insist, he trailed off and dug in. Ten minutes later, Uruka, old man Ichiraku, and Ayame were all staring, dumbfounded at what was happening before their very eyes. Son Gohan and Uzumaki Naruto were eating as if it was their last day alive. What was really amazing though is that Gohan was actually outpacing Naruto. The black-haired fighter had three tottering stacks of ramen bowls beside him. Naruto only had two and a half. Uruka's chopsticks, halfway to his mouth, fell back to the table with twin clinking noises. Ayame and her father just looked at each other and then at Uruka before leaning over the table, rubbing their hands together, grinning greedily. Somewhere in the background there was the noise of a cash register opening. Sorry, Uruka-san, Gohan said later as the trio walked down the street, rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. Uruka didn't answer just staring at the limp wallet he held in his hand with a forlorn look on his face. I'll pay you back somehow. That brought Uruka back and he waved his hand dimsigively. Don't bother, Gohan kun, he answered. I just never thought that I'd ever find someone who can match Naruto in an eating contest. The aforementioned blonde was walking beside them and gave a large belch, sighing in relief. Boy that was great ramen. Thanks Uruka sensei. The blonde hadn't even blinked twice when he'd seen Gohan's stack of bowls. If anything it made him eat even faster, his drive to be the best showing even in something as simple as an eating contest. Despite the punishment inflicted on his wallet, Uruka couldn't help but smile when he saw the pair. They act like brothers, he thought with a smile. Gohan kun is probably the only person in the whole village who doesn't already have some sort of previous impression of Naruto. It's something completely new to Naruto and I think he's loving that, despite maybe not even knowing himself. The trio came to an intersection. Well, I've gotta get back to the academy. My class should be coming up soon, and I don't want to be late. I'm gonna go home and take a nap in a real bed, Naruto proclaimed loudly, drawing scowls from some of the villagers. He noticed and leaned forward, slapping his butt with his tongue out and a mischievous look on his face. I think I'm going to train. I gotta work off that meal. Piccolo sensei would kill me if I got fat. Uruka looked at the boy. 
Is this Piccolo your sensei? Yeah. He's gruff most of the time, but he's a good guy deep down. The warrior looked around. Now, is there a training area or something around here? Aruka nodded. Yeah, just go down that road and keep going. You should hit the outskirts. The training areas are all there, you should be able to find one no problem. Thanks, Aruka san. Gohan called as he ran off down the street, eager to actually get the time to work out. He hadn't had the chance to do it since before the battle at Tazuna's village. Sure enough, following Uruka's instructions, Gohan arrived at a wide, spacious training field. It was open, only a simple meadow ringed by trees that grew thickly on all four sides, except for the path that led into the field. The Z fighter grinned. It was perfect, just the open space he'd grown used to back on Mount Paozu and the wilderness where he'd first started learning from Piccolo. He strode to the middle of the field his weighted cape flapping in the breeze and began stretching. Once that was done, he began to run through some katas, exaggerating the movements in order to better improve his form. As he flowed from one technique to another, his mind disengaged and went to drift somewhere while his body took over. He was reaching into that state of no mind that all martial artists strived for. It had been so long since he'd made it to that state. It was the first time since the cell games he'd been there. There was the sound of voices and feet approaching, but the young Saiyan didn't hear them, completely absorbed and consumed by his task at hand. It was a female voice that reached the meadow first. Really, Lee? Did you have to do that pose? You almost blinded that old lady? A hearty laugh followed the statement, poor Tenten Chan. You still have yet to appreciate Lee Kun's burning passion of youth. But fear not my student, for someday you will or my name is not made a guy. From the path burst the sources of the noise. One was a boy with long brown hair held back by a leaf harai aid and a tie at the end of his long hair. He had on a white shirt and brown pants. Bandages were wrapped around his right arm, but he didn't seem to be injured. Probably the boy just liked the look, though his most striking feature had to be his purple eyes. The girl in the group had on a pink Chinese style shirt and her hair was pulled back into twin buns. Looped over one shoulder was a thick scroll that must have weighed a decent amount that left the last two, and what a pair they were. Both had round enthusiastic eyes with thick caterpillar-like eyebrows over them. Both wore green spandex bodysuits with the Harai aid tied around their waists and orange leggings encased their calves. The only difference was the green shinobi vest that the taller of the two clones wore, denoting his higher rank in the Konoha ninja hierarchy. We're not alone, the boy with the lavender eyes said in a soft monotone. The other three stopped their conversation and saw Gohan out in the middle of the field, completely ignoring them and running through his forms. Who's that? Tenton wondered as she looked at the boy with the messy black hair and purple G.I. Around his waist was a red sash with a Konoha Harai aid tied to it. She'd never seen him before and he wasn't a Chunin because he didn't have the vest. The only thing he had was a white cape with wide shoulders and a high puffy neck that gave the impression that his head sprouted directly from his shoulders. She knew he couldn't be a genin because they just passed the latest batch of nine and the next batch wouldn't come through for three months. I've never seen him before. Lee was observing this kid's motions with a professional and experienced eye. He's got fantastic form, Guy Sensei. The taller of the clones, Guy, was watching with a critiquing eye as well. Indeed, Lee. Whoever trained him did a good job. Neji was silent, watching the boy with an unconcerned eye. Who cared who this mystery boy was? He didn't look special. Okay. Lee announced loudly. I wish to spar with him, a test of my skill against a new opponent, could anything be better? Tenton sighed. Oh boy. Here he goes again. Neji just closed his eyes. That's my Lee, Guy bellowed, striking his nice guy pose, seeking battle to better yourself. I have taught you well, my student. Both master and clone ran out into the field making a beeline for the boy. Tenton just sighed, shrugging. Oh well. Those two idiots will never change. She followed after her sensei and teammate at a much leisurely pace, coming Neji-kun. The stoic Hayuga crossed his arms and followed after the Kunoichi. Gohan finished his last keita and exhaled, bringing himself back to the present, just in time to see two green blurs shoot past him and crash into the trees to his right with a loud, crunch, Tenton could almost see the question mark pop up over his head as he watched the two twins lay there with swirling eyes. Don't mind them, she said with a smile as the boy turned to look at her. 
Those two are always like that. They're just special. Special needs you mean, groused Neji as he stalked past, going to revive his sensei and his worthless student. Tenton just sighed at her teammate's rudeness. Uh, don't mind him either. My name's Tenton. Nice to meet you. Gohan smiled shyly at her. I'm Sun Gohan. Gohan? That's a strange name. She shrugged it off. Well, like I said, I'm Tenton and the two clones are Gai Sensei and Lee. The guy with the purple eyes is Hyuga Neji. She watched as her teacher and his protege hopped upright in a blur and began laughing ridiculously, despite the massive bump each was sporting. Neji, task completed, strode over to the tree and sat down, closing his eyes, but Tenton was sure that he was watching with his Baikugan. The smaller clone, Lee Gohan supposed, dashed over to him with a determined fire burning in his eyes. Hello. I am Rock Lee, one of the beautiful green beasts of Konohagakure, and I desire a spar with you, my unnamed opponent. Gohan shrank back a little unnerved out by the kid's behavior. He reminded the half Saiyan strongly of that guy Mr. Satan from the Cell Games. The self-proclaimed world martial arts champion had acted much in the same way. Lee, this is Sun Gohan, and don't you think it's rude to demand a spar as soon as you meet someone? But Tenten Chan, Lee whined in a manner that reminded the young caped warrior of one Uzumaki Naruto. How am I supposed to improve if I never fight different people? The hearty laughing of her sensei drowned Tenten's response out. You see my students? Lee Kun understands the path to greatness and is willing to pursue it, he wagged a finger at Tenten. You have much to learn, Ten Chan. Tenten's eyebrow twitched and she grabbed her scroll and swung it, connecting solidly with Guy's head and sending him tumbling head over heels into the tree next to Neji's. While Lee looked on horrified and raced over to help his stricken idol, Tenten returned her scroll to her back. How many times do I have to tell you? She growled dangerously, making Gohan back up a step. Don't call me Ten Chan. Uh, I'll just go then. Gohan said timidly, edging away from this strange group. And he thought Team 7 was strange. This team was just plain freaky. Oh, okay, Gohan Kun, Tenten said. See you around then? Uh, sure. He didn't get more than five steps before a green blur cut him off. It was Lee, striking the nice guy pose. Not so fast. I still desire a spar. Tenten rubber her forehead. Lee, quit pestering him he probably doesn't want to. Sure, Gohan said, his curiosity getting the best of him. This would be his chance to see what other shinobi in this world could do. And it wasn't like this kid would let him go anyways. Something told the Demi Saiyan that this Lee would follow him to the ends of the earth to fight him. All right. Lee cheered, pumping a bandaged fist in the air. Tenten huffed something that sounded like, boys and retreated to the tree where her sensei and other teammates sat if Gohan wanted to fight so badly, she wouldn't stop him. The three spectators settled in to watch as the two fighters settled into their stances, Gohan's low, leaning forward with one arm held out behind him and the other in front, fingers hooked like a claw. Lee simply held his right hand up at an angle in front of him and folded the other behind him. Huh? What kind of stance is that? Both fighters wondered, each waiting for the other to make the first move. A minute or two passed and the only sign of movement came from the wind as it tousled the leaves of the trees, even managing to rip some loose and send them drifting over the waiting opponents. Neither blinked when the wind whistled past them or when the leaves in the wind drifted in front of them obscuring their view of the other. Why don't they hurry up? Tenton asked. The pair had been just waiting around for close to two minutes now and it was starting to get dull. Lee is waiting for the kid to make the first move, Neji said, looking as if he was asleep. Guy nodded, all pretense of being a fool gone. Now he was watching Gohan to learn what moves the kid knew. Lee Kun doesn't know the abilities of Gohan Kun. To charge blindly in would be inviting disaster. Gohan Kun is probably waiting for the same. The impatient Kunoichi sighed. So we're just going to sit here until one of them decides to take a risk? But Guy was wrong. Gohan wasn't waiting for Lee to move first. He was waiting for Lee's concentration to lapse. Okay, kid, now listen up, the harsh voice of Piccolo demanded. If you ever find yourself facing an unknown opponent of unknown ability, wait for his concentration to lapse. Five-year-old Gohan looked up at his sensei. Huh? What do you mean, Piccolo-san? The Namekian sighed, for some reason unable to bring himself to yell at the kid. Look, 
your opponent will only be able to concentrate for a short amount of time. Watch his eyes, that's where it'll show up. The eyes will slide out of focus for a second. If you strike in that second, your opponent's reaction time will be slower than normal. A cold wind whistled over the barren plateau where the pair was practicing for the Saiyan's arrival in less than a month. I still don't get it. Piccolo slapped one hand to his turbaned forehead. Then stand up and get ready. The rough alien roared. Young Gohan flinched and hastened to stand up before Piccolo San pushed him off the cliff again. He settled into his stance and waited, and waited, and waited. Piccolo's hand was inches from his throat and the son of Goku hadn't even seen it coming. If it had been a real battle, Gohan would have died. See? The warrior asked as he withdrew his long fingernails from the kid's jugular. If you can outlast them in the waiting game, you should be able to take the upper hand. Then the two began going over that exercise again and again until Gohan had it down to a science. Watch his eyes, Gohan said to himself, going over the lesson over and over. When his concentration slips, I'll be able to force him on the defense. It was a risk, because if he slipped before Lee did, and the green clad fighter knew what to look for, then it would be Gohan on the defense. A leaf drifted in front of Gohan's eyes, but not before he saw a shift in Lee's eyes. Ra! Gohan's yell startled everyone as he launched himself forward faster than anyone would have believed. Fast! was the collective thought of the shinobi fighting and watching as Lee hopped back in an effort to get some distance between him and the onrushing Saiyan warrior. The young Z fighter drew back as if he was going in with a right haymaker and Lee prepared his block and counter. Gohan phased out. What? Lee wondered, just as he felt a presence above him, he looked up and saw Gohan dropping towards him, one leg high in the air, getting ready for an axe kick. The leg dropped and there was an explosion that sent rock and dust flying, forcing the spectators to shield their eyes. Lee emerged from the cloud, skidding backwards on the grass. Somehow, he'd managed to throw himself back and get out of the way. The dust cleared and revealed Gohan, the leg he'd used in the kick buried in rock up to the knee and it looked as if he wasn't able to pull it out. Now's your chance, Lee, Tenton and Guy screamed together. Lee rushed in, jumped and threw a roundhouse kick. Konoha Repu. Gohan raised his right hand, as if answering a telephone, and caught the kick on his shoulder and upper arm muscle. Lee's round eyes widened in astonishment as his attack was stopped as if it was nothing. The other warrior struggled for a moment then yelled as he threw his arm out knocking Lee off balance and buying himself the time he needed to wrench his leg free. The caped fighter bounced back in a series of handsprings and skidded to a stop, snapping back into stance. Lee got himself under control and reassumed his pose as well. A wind passed over the field, whipping Gohan's cape into a white frenzy. Neither fighter hesitated before speeding at each other again, eyes burning and fists ready to strike. Well, there's chapter 7. Lee and Gohan are sparring, Chi Chi knows just what happened to her eldest son, and Uruka knows to never ever treat both Gohan and Naruto to ramen. Not bad for a chapter of mostly talk. This should also answer many of your questions of how I'm gonna get Gohan into the Chunin exams. Personally, I can't wait for Orochimaru to show up. A wind passed over the field, whipping Gohan's cape into a white frenzy. Neither fighter hesitated before speeding at each other again eyes burning and fists ready to strike. The two fighters slammed together, then became a flurry of motion. Lee pressed himself as much as he could and sent attack after attack at Gohan, aiming to either slip under the dark-haired boy's guard or simply batter his defense into pieces. Gohan leaned, flowed, blocked, deflected, doing everything he could not to get hit. One of Lee's attacks came in slower than it should have and the young Saiyan was able to catch it in his palm and throw it wide. Lee looked alarmed before Gohan's fist slipped through the opening and bashed into the side of his face, throwing the green-clad Genin back a step or two. While Lee tried to clear the spots from in front of his vision, Gohan stepped in and landed a hard one-two combo in his opponent's midsection, winding him and doubling Lee over. Now the caped fighter threw himself backwards, the top of one fool catching the other boy in the chin, snapping him upright and lifting him off the ground. Gohan followed through with the attack, flipping back onto his feet before leaping forward, driving the knife edge of his foot into Lee's already abused stomach, folding the lanky teen around Gohan's leg for a split second before the force of the attack transferred and Lee was blasted away, slamming into an oak tree hard enough to buckle the trunk and send leaves fluttering like a swarm of incensed bees. 
Gohan landed lightly on one toe, seeming to float before dropping the rest of his weight down and lowering himself into his guard. Guy, Neji and Tenten stared openly and shamelessly at the Cape Z fighter. Neji and Tenten had seen only a blur of movement before Gohan's foot had connected with Lee's chin. The rest had happened slow enough to see, but fast enough that if you blinked, all you would have seen was Rock Lee impacting the tree. Did you see that? Tenten asked to both of her companions at the same time. No, Neji answered, deciding be civil just this once, since saying he did would have gotten him nowhere. The genius cringed as he turned to his sensei. What happened? He demanded of the other green beast. Guy didn't answer, watching Gohan with eyes as big as dinner plates, his jaw hanging and working uselessly. Another, bored, voice answered the Hyuga. Well, it seems that Lee just got his ass handed to him by Gohan. The three stunned members of Team Guy looked up and saw Kakashi lounging on the branch over their heads, perverted book in hand, other hand tucked behind his head, looking for all the world that he didn't even notice what had happened. Guy sprang to his feet, pointing an accusing finger at his rival, great rival Kakashi. What are you doing here? The other Junin held up his orange book. Reading, what's it look like? He flipped the page and glanced over at Gohan, who hadn't moved since his blitz on Lee. Oh, and watching the newest member of my team beat the hell out of yours. He laughed lightly at something the character in the book did, ignoring the spluttering taijutsu master below him. Gohan's on your team, Tenten asked the lanky Junin, sounding surprised, but you already have a three-man cell don't you? Kakashi's half-opened eye regarded the kunoichi below him. Yeah, I do, but Hokage-sama thought it would be the best way to get Gohan money and a place to stay without attracting undue attention. Though, he added, looking at the raven-haired warrior, he seems to be doing that just fine by himself. Then perhaps a little wager, Guy boomed, startling a few birds into flight, which attracted Neji's attention. If my Lee wins, then you will change your wardrobe to that of the splendid green beast and acknowledge me as the better shinobi. There was silence for a moment before Kakashi yawned, Hm? You say something Guy? He went back to his book. Guy whirled and plopped down, muttering about his rival's infuriating demeanor, all attention once again focused on the battlefield as Lee stirred and stood, walking out from his landing spot with a visible limp and some nasty looking scratches, but otherwise seemingly good to go. Guy vaulted to his feet, teeth gleaming as he struck the nice guy pose. That's my Lee, go get him. Lee heard his sensei's encouragement and prepared to strike out at Gohan once again. I will make you proud, Guy sensei. Lee shouted as he sprinted in before launching himself into the air in an airborne axe kick, reminiscent of what Gohan had done earlier in the fight. The Z fighter blocked, and was surprised when he felt his feet sink into the soil from the blow's power. This guy, he's good, Gohan thought with a slight stirring of amazement. This kid, probably the same age as the Demi Saiyan himself was, was actually pushing him to fight at least a little seriously. Gohan had agreed to the fight out of pure curiosity, thinking that no genin would be able to harm him. It was an arrogant thought, right on par with Vegeta at his worst, but it was true. The battles Gohan had been through here had shown him that he was on par with some of this dimension's strongest. Or so he'd thought. Gohan stopped Lee's sandaled foot with both hands before it could drill into his abdomen, the force from the strike actually pushing him back a few inches. The green-clad genin planted a bandaged hand on the ground and brought his other leg scything up and around, the heel of the foot catching Gohan off guard and throwing him away, a line of dirt raising up as the Saiyan skidded along the ground. Lee, contrary to what most would expect of him, didn't give off some joyful exclamation at hitting his opponent. Instead, the bushy-browed shinobi rushed forward, hoping to light into Gohan while he was down. The Z fighter was able to vault to his feet, just in time to catch a flash of green and a head back fist. Gohan reacted on instinct, and that reflex almost cost Lee his life. The warrior's hand flashed out, smacking away the incoming blow. Lee lurched and managed to stop himself, looking upright as Gohan's hand reversed direction and stopped right in front of his face, a ball of blazing yellow something shining in his palm. For Lee, Time stood still as he realized that he was staring his demise in the face, his blood running cold when he saw the look in Gohan's onyx eyes. There was no compassion, no light. Hell, it didn't even look like Gohan was aware of what he was doing, it was happening so fast. Then the energy was gone, along with the hand holding it. 
Gohan hissed with discomfort as his arm was wrenched back and locked high on his back. The fighter struggled for a moment before recognizing the key that was behind him. Easy Gohan, Kakashi said bracingly as he struggled to hold onto the thrashing kid. The struggle ceased and the masked Junin saw and felt the tension leak out of the black-haired boy as his brain caught up with what his body was doing. Kakashi. What are you? But the Junin didn't hear him, instead looking at the green-clad shinobi, who was sitting on the ground and shaking like a leaf in a hurricane, watching Gohan with eyes that held fear and questions in them. Kakashi shook him, but the genin didn't move, so the lanky shinobi stood and came back over to the caped fighter. I think that's enough for today. He clapped Gohan on his shoulder and began heading away. The newest member of Team 7 watched for a moment before turning to Lee, who was by now surrounded by his teammates, all of them watching him with suspicion. The warrior bowed. Sorry, Lee San. It was a reflex from my training. The excuse sounded hollow, even to him, but Gohan knew that it was true. Not wanting to be stuck there any longer than he had to in that awkward situation, he turned and hurried off to catch up with Team 7's Junin. Gohan. The teen in question looked up at his team's captain, the Junin's face cast in shadow by the thick trees on either side of the lane that they were walking down to get out of the practice area. Huh? What happened back there? Gohan's face became downcast. It was a reflex. I saw green in a fist. His hand clenched. It was what he'd seen when he'd fought with Cell during the games. It was so fast, I just reacted like I would have in a real battle. He looked up, black eyes pleading. I didn't mean to almost kill Lee San, honest. Kakashi regarded him somberly, but then his eye curved. No big deal. You reacted on instinct like a good warrior should. This piccolo person who trained you did a good job. His gloved hand clapped the teen on the shoulder. Just try not to let it happen again. You're not mad. No it was a normal human reaction. You should see some of the sparring matches the Enbu have sometimes. Now that's a spar to see. The Junin began walking away, but Gohan's voice stopped him. Hey, Kakashi. The masked man turned back. What? Why were you there anyway? It couldn't have been just to watch me was it? Hitaki just I smiled mysteriously. I have my reasons. He resumed walking, tossing a casual wave over his shoulder. See you tomorrow Gohan. Team 7's going to be at the Memorial Stone training ground at 10 a.m. Right. I'll be there. Kakashi nodded then disappeared in a burst of shinobi smoke. Gohan spent the rest of the day crisscrossing Konoha, just looking around and browsing through the various shops and stores that lined the roads. He quickly learned that there was a form of symmetry to the sprawling village. At the center of the village, abutting right against the Hokage Monument was the Hokage's Tower. Surrounding that were the official functions of the city's government, like taxes, license bureau for the various shinobi licenses, the Anbu base, and other things. Up against the financial and official district was the business district. This was where the majority of the shops and stores were located. Farther out from that were the residential areas, which extended from the business district all the way to the walls. At the walls were three gates, each one creating a gap in the protective structure that, along with the cliff the monument sat on, formed a half moon around the village and its inhabitants. A road led from each gate to the tower allowing shinobi and visitors in a hurry to get to the center of government quickly. The districts themselves weren't cut and dry, with each one blending into the next, but you would know when you were in one by what the majority was. Gohan found the mix of chaos and order to be refreshing, along with the open skies and wide training grounds, which were located both inside the walls, in cases like the meadow field and memorial stone, to huge grounds like the forest of death which were located a few miles beyond the walls. Now it was dusk and the son of Goku was looking for a place to stay. Before parting ways, Gohan had been given his share of the pay that he'd earned by helping out with Zabuza. Most of that money was gone on dinner and now the teen was hunting for an apartment. He knew that he would be able to stay at no charge to him, but first he had to find a place to stay at. Gohan was wandering through one of the more rundown spots in the residential district, still looking for a place to call his own. A lighted window caught his eye and before the Saiyan warrior could float up to check it out, Naruto emerged from the sliding glass door and set out a decrepit looking plant. Gohan figured he could impose on the blonde for at least one night, so he soon found the door that led to the apartment and knocked. The door slid open and Gohan found himself staring a surprised Naruto in the face. Eh? Gohan? What are you doing here? The black-haired boy scratched his head sheepishly. 
Sorry Naruto, but I need a place to stay for the night, and I can't find anything. I saw you put your plant out and I figured, he trailed off, not wanting to sound rude. Naruto's face lit up. Sure you can stay here, I don't mind having a roommate, he looked over his shoulder, but the place isn't that great. I don't mind, it'll be fun, and Gohan really didn't care either. Night had long since fallen and the Demi Saiyan, though he was capable of it, really didn't want to rough it in a city. Naruto grinned and stepped aside, allowing his teammate inside. Sorry, but I don't have any spare blankets or anything. He gestured around the simple room. I live alone, and money's always been tight so, now it was the blonde who trailed off looking sheepish. The Saiyan grinned, the simplicity of the kitchen, dining room, bedroom reminding him of his own home on Mount Paozu. It's great. The other genin grinned. Really? Well, you can stay for as long as you want. But, he added, get your own ramen. Gohan grinned as he and his new roommate got ready for bed. Soon Naruto's loud snores filled the tiny apartment and Gohan, using his cape as a makeshift blanket and pillow, soon followed. Both boys awoke a little past nine the next morning and went about their daily rituals for the day before Naruto made some instant ramen for himself and Gohan decided, after seeing Naruto's bare cupboards, to go into town to eat. The Z fighter emerged from an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet a while later, followed by a stuttering owner who switched the sign from, open, to, closed. He was about to head for the training grounds when a familiar voice cut him off. Hi Gohan-kun. Gohan turned to face who the speaker was. Huh? Oh. Hi Sakura. The Kunoichi on the team was dressed as she'd been during the mission and she seemed to be out on a morning stroll. What are you doing here? Oh, I was just going to walk for a bit before heading to meet Kakashi Sensei. Want to join me? But isn't it almost time now? The pink haired girl snorted. Right. The day Kakashi Sensei's on time is the day hell freezes over. He's always late, and keeps making up dumb excuses why he couldn't make it. Gohan shrugged. I'm still going to go now. I could use a bit of a workout. Sakura put her hands on her hips with a puzzled look. Huh? You're going to train now? Sure. Why? Well, Kakashi Sensei usually trains us and it isn't easy. The girl shuddered. I couldn't work out beforehand. She passed him and headed down the street. Well, it's not my business. See you later, Gohan kun. Bye, Sakura. Gohan waved after her, then jogged off for the training field using the light run as a warm-up for the training he was going to do when he got there. He arrived at the field and began to limber up with some basic stretches. Before too long, the other members of the team arrived and found Gohan with his face in the dirt, completely oblivious to them as he did push-ups at a speed that even the most fit of shinobi would have a hard time keeping pace with. Kakashi had yet to arrive, so the four settled into wait, Gohan dangling upside down on a tree branch and doing sit-ups. You're a beast Gohan. Naruto remarked as the boys murmured counting past the 250 mark. And you haven't taken a break since we got here. Gohan grunted in response, focusing all his energy on pulling his elbows to his knees, fighting the pull of gravity and the added weight of the snow white cape on his shoulders. Half an hour later, Kakashi finally arrived. After Naruto and Sakura had thoroughly abused his ears, the Junin called them over and handed the four sheets of paper. Recommendation for entry into the Chunin exams. Naruto read off the fancy calligraphy at the head of an official looking memo. What is this Kakashi Sensei? Just what it looks like, Naruto. I've entered the four of you into the Chunin exams for a shot at passing and moving higher up in the ranks. Naruto and Sasuke exchanged eager looks while Sakura looked apprehensive and Gohan looked puzzled. The Junin continued. You have until the end of the week to decide. If you want to take the exams, bring those letters to the academy and take them up to room 301. The elder shinobi looked at his charges. I'm giving you the week off in order for you four to train on your own or just take it easy until the exams. The decision to enter is yours and yours alone. If you don't want to enter, then don't. With that Kakashi made a seal and vanished in a puff of smoke. Well I'm going to enter, Naruto shouted the moment Kakashi left. How about you Sasuke bastard, Gohan? The Uchiha smirked. Yeah, sounds like this'll be fun. Gohan looked at his teammates with a puzzled look. Hey what are the Chunin exams? Sasuke snorted. Well, seeing as you're from a different dimension, I guess I'll have to explain. The aura of a Y prodigy fell away and the Uchiha looked Gohan dead in the eye. 
it's an exam that consists of three portions. No one really knows what the sections are because it's held in a different village every six months. The third exam, though, is a tournament that everyone and anyone can come and watch. My dad took me once or twice, but I don't really remember it. Gohan grinned. A tournament? Well, that sounded a lot like the strongest under the heavens tournament from back home. It would probably be fun, and it wasn't like he had anything better to do. He regarded the parchment in his hands. You're right, Sasuke. It does sound like fun. He grinned excitedly. I'm in. Naruto whooped in delight and Sasuke smirked. Then the three began discussing what the exams would be like. No one noticed Sakura slip away. Sakura found herself far away from her comrades, clutching her recommendation like it was a bomb about to explode. What was Kakashi sensei thinking? She wondered. They were just a new team of genin, they hadn't even been on active duty for three months yet and already their sensei expected them to pass the exams. What was going on in that silver head of his? Her worrying took her all the way to another training ground that was on the other side of the village without her even noticing, as lost in her thoughts as she was. She really started thinking at that point and realized that, if she didn't take the exams, Sasuke-kun wouldn't be impressed and Gohan-kun and Naruto would think she was a coward. Sakura knew she wasn't a coward, but in her distress she twisted her logic and made it seem like she was. The Kunoichi plopped down under the lone tree in the middle of a field that was flat except for a middle-sized rock ledge that ran along the west side. She heaved an impressive sigh and began debating with herself. Back at the training area, Sasuke and Naruto had gone off, the Uchiha presumably to find his own training field and Naruto had said it was impossible to spar on an empty stomach. That left Gohan with no one to fight against, so he slid into a stance and began shadow boxing like he'd done back in Wave Country. Before too long, it was getting dark, and Gohan came out of the trance he tended to sink into when he was training, starting when he saw that the sun was well on its way down and a few stars were already out. He was just leaving when a voice cut him off. Well well. Another little Konoha nin who's getting ready for the exams. Gohan stopped and looked around, obsidian eyes growing serious as he flung his senses out wide, searching for the key signature the voice belonged to. He appeared to be alone but Gohan knew better. All right, he commanded. Come out, I know you're there. The river across from him exploded as something shot from its depths and sped towards the Demi Saiyan. Gohan caught the flash of a kanai and he jumped, soaring a fair distance above the onrushing object's attack and touched down in the same spot he'd started from, spinning and dropping into a stance. His assailant turned as well and Gohan blinked when he saw the foreign engraving on the Harai 8. It was a simple four lines, but for some reason it reminded the unofficial genin of rain. Who are you and why are you attacking me? The man was much taller than Gohan was, but then, the Saiyan hybrid was kind of short for his age. He seemed to be made up of nothing but cloaks and bits of cloth that were sewn haphazardly together, and his face was obscured by the Harai aid and a scrap of cloth that acted much like Kakashi's mask did. The stranger's head was topped off by a wide and flat straw hat that looked as if it extended well beyond the nin's shoulders. The shinobi laughed at the boy's demand. Who am I? Well, I'm just a genin like you, he said, his voice sounding like wet rags being dragged over gravel, with a bit of a smoker's cough thrown in as an undertone. You don't need to know my name. A kanai appeared from nowhere and the man sped at Gohan again, because you're already dead. The rain nin lunged. His attack passed through thin air. What? The boy had been there one moment then the next, he wasn't. Was it some kind of jutsu or was the brat just amazingly fast? I haven't done anything to deserve you trying to kill me, the shinobi whirled and there was his target, crouching on rail of the ornamental bridge that spanned the small river that marked the boundary of the training grounds. Gohan's opponent snickered as he pulled out some shuriken. I never said you did, the man said with a dark chuckle. I'm just thinning out the competition. The shuriken flashed from his hands, their blades making an ominous noise as they slashed through the air. The boy's eyes darkened. Well if that's the way it's going to be, he called with a warning note in his voice, then I guess I have no choice but to fight. He phased out right as the throwing stars reached his position. The rain shinobi looked around, but couldn't find the brat anywhere. Just how fast was that guy? Up here. The shinobi looked up and his eyes widened when he saw Gohan dropping toward him with a yell, moving faster than any freefall should have allowed. It was as if the kid was controlling he descent willingly. The shinobi jumped back, timing his evasion perfectly, 
forcing the boy's attack to smite the ground instead of his skull. What he hadn't counted on was the sheer force Gohan was capable of. The boy's fist collided with unforgiving rock, but instead of breaking the boy's fist, the ground just shattered, throwing slabs of rock skyward, making a sound like an explosion, and putting a massive crater in the earth. The rain nin's eyes went wide as he felt his feet drop into space, but he caught himself of a chunk of airborne debris and rebounded, bouncing from fragment to fragment until he cleared the lip of the depression. Not bad, for a snot-nosed kid, the shinobi taunted as Gohan glared at him from the bottom of the crater and threw a rain of falling rock, ranging in size from sand to small boulders. I'm going to give you one last chance, the caped warrior called. Leave me alone, or next time I'll go all out. The shinobi laughed outright. Yeah right, like I'll believe that. Gohan sighed. Well, I did warn you. He sank into a standing crouch and cupped his hands at his side. Kamehame, the darkness was lit up as a blue-white ball of ki formed in between the Z fighter's palms, glowing brighter with each passing second. Ha! The boy thrust his hands forward and the Kamehameha blasted off, throwing dust and gravel everywhere as it raced for the shinobi at the lip of the crater, who was suddenly rigid with fright. He was lost from view as the blast of power passed over him, then continued out into the dark sky, its progress never even slowed by the presence of the rain nin. Unlike in wave country, there was no spectacular thermonuclear like detonation. The beam of key just lost its brightness and width, becoming nothing but a blue line in the sky before fading from existence. Gohan stood panting, lowering steaming hands, before looking up at the dark, diamond studded sky, knowing that somehow the shinobi had escaped, because he never felt the man's key snuff out. All that proved that Gohan had managed to attack him was the U shape that had been sliced out of the crater's lip, as if with a scalpel. The Z fighter took one last look around to make sure he was alone before lifting into the air and blasting off towards Naruto's in a flash of blue flame like Ki. In Konoha's business district, on top of a pagoda like building, Hitaki Kakashi stood facing the training area where the whole battle had taken place, glancing up from Icha Icha Paradise only when the Kamehameha arced into the sky, lit up the village for a brief moment, then vanished. He chuckled but it wasn't obvious if it at the amorous antics of the character in his book or at Gohan's apparent reluctance to hold back in battle. So, the Junin said to Thin Air, how did it go? The shadows shifted and the rain nin that Gohan had attacked appeared from out of nowhere. That kid is something else. There was a burst of smoke and Aruka appeared, massaging his neck after being under a henge for so long. The schoolteacher stepped up beside his superior. Gohan-kun sure does know how to make an impression on someone. Kakashi laughed as he flipped the page. You really should take the Junin exams, Uruka, he said, seemingly out of the blue. A glance showed him the Chunin's puzzled expression. Why? Because. The last shinobi that went toe to toe with Sun Gohan was out of action for a week with broken ribs, more bruises than I care to count, and was on the receiving end of that Kamehameha of his. Hitaki looked at his companion. You managed to get away with hardly a scratch. Silence reigned for a moment before Aruka answered. Yeah, maybe, but if you hadn't warned me what the setup for the attack looked like, I would have been toast. Kakashi shrugged, noncommittally. Once again there was silence between the two men before the Junin spoke again. So, he said, does this little test put your mind at ease? He was referring to when the various Junin instructors had referred their charges for the exams. When Kuranai, Asuma, and Kakashi had all put their teams up as examinees. Uruka had been the most outspoken against it, even breaching protocol by speaking out of turn in order to voice his objections. Kakashi, on his part, knew that Gohan, Sasuke and Naruto would jump at the opportunity to strut their stuff, but he wasn't so sure about Sakura. So, to ensure that both his own doubts, and those of Uruka would be assuaged, he'd enlisted the scarred Chunin's help. Uruka, under the guise of a hostile foreign shinobi, would attack each member of Team 7, both to gauge their abilities for himself, and to convince them that they could make it in the exams. The result? Sakura was just as hell bent on winning the exams as her teammates, Sasuke and Naruto were both fired up even more than they had been before, and Gohan. Well, Gohan hadn't disappointed, delivering more than enough evidence that he wasn't about to be stopped either. Uruka nodded at Kakashi's question. Yeah, this does help my state of mind, a little. I can see that they're not the kids I used to know especially Naruto. The teacher grinned as he remembered how Naruto had taken one look at him after his threat, 
made about a hundred cage bunchens and proceeded to mob the man. But Gohan Kun, man, I didn't think Gohan Kun was capable of that kind of sheer power. The silver haired Junin next to him nodded. Yeah, I know what you mean. I thought Gohan was just a kid with unusually high stamina. When we first met, he was beat up pretty badly, but he woke up just a few hours after we got him treated. Then came the whole bit with Zabuza. When I got caught in the Swiru Jutsu, I thought the mission was done. I was wrong. Uruka was all ears listening to the Junin. Apparently, Gohan hadn't even shown the Chunin half of what he could do. Kakashi continued, Gohan didn't show any sign of fear about facing the Momochi Zabuza. He just attacked. Beat the hell out of that bastard too. So, do you think they'll pass? Kakashi shrugged carelessly. Hard to say, but my pride demands that I answer yes. His dark mask shifted a little, the only sign of his smile. If you're worried about Naruto, though, don't. He's more like his father than even he realizes. Uruka grinned. He is a lot like him, isn't he? The Junin actually laughed outright. You have no idea, Uruka. Your father and Arashi sensei were neighbors, so you actually know who Naruto's father is. The teacher smiled wistfully. Yeah, dad and Yandaimi sama were pretty good friends. I remember being at his and Kashina san's wedding. Kakashi laughed again. Yeah, never thought I'd get to see my sensei in a suit. That guy hated to dress up. I wonder how he was convinced to wear a suit anyway. Both men knew of the Yandaimi's hatred for fancy clothes. The blonde Hokage had repeatedly said that they were restricting an Ichi, even going out of his way to avoid wearing the Hokage's ceremonial robes when he didn't have to. Kashina. Uruka made a noise of understanding at Kakashi's answer. That woman could convince Arashi sensei to do anything. The Junin rubbed his head. I think her threat was to either wear to tux or she'd do horrible things to him. Uruka laughed now, and with Kashina san that always meant, he trailed off as he remembered the chaos and mayhem Naruto's mother had sown when she was a teenager. Well, that sort of thing must be hereditary. After all, Naruto is known as the village's biggest prankster. Both men chuckled before falling silent. At last Uruka broke it. Well, I've got to get going. I have a lesson plan to get together. Kakashi nodded and the chunin disappeared in a burst of smoke. Kakashi waited a minute then he too poofed away. The day of the exams dawned windy and sunny. The four members of Team 7 were walking down one of the main streets on their way to the academy. Naruto and Gohan were talking about what they had done to get ready for the examinations. Sasuke was participating as well, though his was more of poking fun at Naruto and riling the blonde up. Sakura wasn't doing much of anything, just walking behind the three boys and keeping her eyes down and her mouth shut. She felt like she'd hurl if she opened her mouth or met anyone's eyes. All too soon, for Sakura anyway, the four arrived at the academy. Naruto and Sasuke led the way, because Gohan had no idea where to go. They went up the stairs, and entered into a hall that was packed with people. They were all seared around a room with the sign 301 above the door, but two chunin were barring the way. Gohan thought something didn't feel right. Hey, he murmured to his friends, didn't we only go up one floor? Yeah, Sasuke agreed quietly. This is the second floor, not the third. The Uchiha prodigy smirked. These guys are using a genjutsu. The other black haired boy agreed. In the day or two prior to the exams, he'd been all but living in the library near the Hokage's tower, literally up to his ears in scrolls and books as he feverishly studied various tactics, jutsu, and other aspects of the shinobi way of life and how the ninja did battle. Genjutsu had been only one of the facets of combat he'd read about. The Z fighter thought it was a real shame that he couldn't use chakra. It would have been so easy to trick Cell into thinking that there'd been so many copies of Gohan, or that the boy himself had been critically wounded. Killing the android would have been so much easier that way. After showing the Chunin that their tricks weren't working, and getting to meet Team Guy, Team 7 reached hallway that led to a set of double doors. Kakashi was there before them, for once, and was leaning against a window customary smutty book in hand as his team made their way over. He put the orange thing away and stood up, giving his team an eye smile. Well, looks like all four of you have decided to take the exams, he said without preamble, then explained, much to the team's chagrin, that if all four of them hadn't shown up together, they would have all been disqualified on the spot. But, Kakashi said happily, you're all here, so feel free to go on through, 
he gestured to the door and the members of Team 7 grinned, or made a valiant effort to, and pushed the doors open wide, stepping through to confront whatever lay on the other side of the threshold. Well that's that, and this is the first chapter of summer vacation. Hell yeah. This means that, until I get home and actually get to summer classes, I should have a lot of free time to spend on writing fanfictions. Don't get too excited and start expecting me to update daily, cause it ain't gonna happen. I'm staying at my school for two extra months to finish up something that pertains to my degree then I go home for summer classes. But, despair not, for I shall have copious free time when not, slipping the surly bonds of earth to dance on laughter silvered wings. Kudos to whomever can figure where that passage is from. Whatever Gohan had expected on the other side of the door, what he found wasn't it. Inside were upwards of a hundred shinobi, every single one of them glaring at the new arrivals. The Saiyan glanced left, then right, knowing that this wasn't going to be a pleasant experience. That feeling was intensified when his senses were slammed, as if by a hammer, by some monstrous blood that stole Gohan's breath away. The warrior he was, the teen's gaze swept the room again and centered in on the culprit. The source was a kid, looking to be about the same age as Naruto and the rest, with red hair and a brown outfit that was crossed by a leather sash, then again by a white linen one. The Harai 8 that identified the village the guy came from was tied to the leather sash and reminded Gohan of an hourglass for some reason. His most striking feature, though, was the kanji that was etched into his forehead and represented, love, and his harsh teal eyes were ringed by dark circles, like he hadn't had a decent night's sleep in his life, a massive gourd propped on the floor beside him. The guy caught his eye and the key that he seemed to be leaking out from sheer desire to kill intensified almost double and the Saiyan target felt his breath begin to shorten, heart begin to pound and adrenaline begin to flow, ramping up his senses into, flight or fight, mode. Then the shinobi turned and the spell was broken. The dark haired teen didn't know it, but he just gaped at Sabaku no Gara and lived to tell about it. Sasuke kun. The high-pitched cry split the silence of the classroom and a purple and blonde streak flew from nowhere and latched itself onto the raven-haired Uchiha, whose face showed that he was less than happy about being glomped by a fangirl. The attacker was a tall and wiry, but pretty, blonde, with sea-green eyes to rival those of Mr. Creepy with the gourd was hanging from Sasuke's neck as if she and he were one and the same. The mysterious girl's gaze played over Gohan for a second and took in the chiseled arms and chest on him clearly visible because of his G.I. and the Saiyan thought he saw a flicker of interest in the girl's eyes. Eno Pig. Get your filthy hands off Sasuke-kun. Sakura's livid shout brought Gohan out of the daze that the guy with the gourd had placed him in. The pink-haired Kunoichi was glaring daggers at this, Eno, and if looks could kill, the girl would have been a smoldering crater in the ground. But, looks couldn't kill and the girl just smiled confidently. Oh, hey, forehead. You made it into the exams. Wow. Your Junin sensei must be pretty thick if he let a loser like you in here. Sakura made a noise like a cat growling, which made Ino smile all the wider and tighten her grip on fidgeting Sasuke. Ino's glinting eyes landed on Gohan. Who's this, forehead? You couldn't get Sasuke kun, so you got yourself someone else? Gohan opened his mouth to protest, but he never got the words out. Ino, just shut up. A drawling voice murmured with a heavy lethargy. Ino bristled and released Sasuke, who slipped away without a sound to get Naruto and Sakura in between himself and the now angry blonde Kunoichi. The speaker turned out to be a guy with a grey v-necked t-shirt with greenish trim and a circle divided in half by a line. His eyes were droopy and bored looking, but Gohan was used to trying to see through strategies by eyes, and this boy's eyes were backlit by a sharp and analytical intelligence. The boy's mouth opened and his tone was just as lethargic as before. We don't have time for your Sasuke fetish. His teammate turned colors faster than Cell could move. What did you say, Shikamaru? Shikamaru winded at Ino's piercing tone and muttered something that sounded like, troublesome women, before turning to the young Saiyan, who was just watching. You are. Gohan stuck out a hand. I'm son Gohan. Shikamaru looked put out by having to shake hands, but he did anyway thinking to himself how troublesome it was. Nara Shikamaru. Crunching sounded behind the genius Genin and he stepped aside to reveal an obese boy who was happily shoving chips into his mouth. And since his mouth is too full to answer, this is Akamichi Choji. We're team 10. What's your team? 7. 7? 
Shikamaru's eyes flicked over the three original members of the team, then cast an appraising eye over Gohan. What, you here to keep Naruto from being too much of a troublesome dumbass? Hey, wait, Ino broke in. If you're on Team 7, doesn't that mean that they have four members? Isn't that kind of unfair? A new voice cut in, this one was as loud and abrasive as Naruto's. What? A four-man team? What makes you guys so special? The speaker was a kid with a gray parka with a fur lining that looked as if his hair was shaggy black and not the sandy brown it really was. Perched on his head was a small white puppy and there were red marks under his eyes that almost gave the impression he was crying tears of blood from his slit pupiled eyes. The puppy gave a sharp yap. Kiba laughed rudely. Say what, his feral eyes looked over Gohan. He grinned, revealing longer than normal canines. Akamaru says you smell like a monkey. K Kiba kun. T that's not nice, a timid voice said from behind the parka wearing Jenin and the other guy on Team 8 who was wearing a trench coat and sunglasses. The sunglasses kid stepped aside and revealed a girl with short hair and an oversized hoodie with a stylized purple flame stitched into the right arm of the garment. Hanada chan? Kiba asked. You actually agree with these guys' four man cell? It's not our idea, Naruto said aggressively. Living with Gohan had been great the two talking about life in their dimensions and other topics. At times, Naruto felt like Gohan was the big brother he'd never had. Sometimes he wondered if this was what having a family was like. The old man put him on our team because he's got nowhere else to go. The blonde got up in Kiba's face. So you and your yappy hairball can take it up with old man Hokage. Kiba backed up, a nervous look in his eyes, but was stopped from retorting by yet another new voice. You know, it would be wise to tone it down. All of us here are rather nervous and they wouldn't mind taking out a piece of you. The speaker was a guy with silver hair that was like Kakashi's and pulled into a tight ponytail and round glasses sitting in front of a friendly looking face. True to the guy's words, the genin in the room were glaring bloody murder at the rookie nine, looking as if they would attack and shred them at any moment. Everyone looked subdued, with the exception of Naruto who got his usual defiant look on hopped up on the desk and shouted that he would beat all of them in the exams and become Hokage. The looks, if possible, only darkened. Sakura clobbered him on the back of his head. Shut the hell up, you idiot, you want us to get killed? She yelled in his ear, throttling him at the same time. Kabuto proceeded to show Sasuke some weird cards. These have data on every shinobi in this room, he said with a distinct note of pride in his voice. I know everything about anyone. Sasuke looked intrigued, but he would never say it. Well, what data do you have on Gara? Sabaku no Gara. Yeah. Kabuto pushed his glasses up in a superior manner and swiped a hand across the deck of cards, one of which sprang into the air and floated to his grasp. He looked at it, then held it out for Sasuke's inspection. Here you go, all the information on Gara you could ever want. As the Uchiha looked over the card, Kabuto added, it's odd. All the information I have on him says he's never gotten so much as a scratch on a mission. Why would you be interested in him? I have my reasons. The ice in his tone was enough to get Kabuto to back off. Sasuke glanced over at Gohan and noticed that the raven haired teen was off in his own world, not noticing what was happening in the world around him. Sasuke lowered his voice. What information do you have on Sun Gohan? Sun Gohan. Let me see what I have. Again he swiped the deck, but this time, no card sprang into the air. Kabuto was obviously puzzled. I don't have anything on him. The Avenger scowled then thrust Gara's card back to the bespectacled Genin. Thanks anyway, he said, rather rudely if anyone cared to listen in. Across the room, a mummy-like shinobi with grey camouflage pants and a fur shawl or something similar, sneered at his comrades. So, that guy thinks that he's hot stuff does he? Let's show him otherwise. His Kunoichi comrade, a rather plain looking girl, sneered as well, yeah, let's. The two others chuckled darkly then darted into the crowd of Genin, slipping among them, nothing but soundless shadows that darted in three different directions, two to either wall, and one straight up the center. Kabuto's eyes flickered, unnoticed by his companions or the onrushing Otto Nin. A small smile, no, more of a smirk, crossed his face. Gohan caught a shadow of a key spike just as a something shot by him. In that moment, he knew that sensing key would only take him so far in the shinobi world. The rest would take subtle observation. He had work to do. But first, 
he twisted and watched Kabuto spring back, dodging a deft right hook from what Gohan thought was a mummy. Then he realized it was a genin wrapped in bandages from head to foot. Kabuto smirked as the fist passed harmlessly by his face, but the look faded as his glasses cracked. The movement had drawn the attention of everyone in the room and a few snorted at the sheer stupidity of the Otto Nin. Then the silver-haired leaf Nin dropped to his knees and spewed his breakfast all over the floor. The mummy, Dosu, planted a heavy boot on Kabuto's head. So, you know everything about everyone huh? So, did you see this coming? The boot vanished and the genin stood up, wiping bile from his mouth and glaring the best he could with shattered lenses. The other guy, a ruffian by name of Zaku, snorted and thrust at Kabuto. A hand shot out of nowhere and seized his arm in an iron vice. That's enough, Gohan announced with a dark look on his face. He didn't do anything to hurt you, so leave him alone. The last word was spoken with a ringing force that had nothing to do with his voice and everything to do with Ki, as he spiked it briefly and allowed it to lace his voice. The Z warrior allowed the shinobi to go, whereupon he retreated to his two teammates and glared at Gohan as he massaged his almost crushed wrist. Who are you? Zaku demanded roughly. My name's Son Gohan. Dosu chuckled darkly. Son Gohan, huh? Well then, Son Gohan, he pointed a threatening finger at the fighter, now you're on our shit list. We'll meet again, and you won't get off easy next time. The trio turned and trooped back to their desks. Gohan simply scowled after them then looked at Kabuto. Are you okay, Kabuto-san? Yes, thank you, Gohan-san. There was an explosion at the front of the classroom and when the smoke cleared, it revealed a whole band of chunin, led by a tall and imposing man who had his harai aid tied like a bandana and a vicious scar running down his left eye, almost like Kakashi's. All right, you whelps. Shut the hell up and listen up, I'm Morino Ibiki and I'm the proctor for the first portion of the chunin exams. The attention of every genin in the room focused on him and the bare whisperings of some comrades vanished within the first few words. Okay, come up here and take a number and wait for the instructions. All the shinobi in the room took a number and sat down at their seats. Gohan found himself by another person that creeped him out. The man was tall, feminine, dressed ornately with a wide grass hat that had a dangling tag on it. The son of Goku wasn't sure what it was about this guy, but he was suddenly unnerved by the guy. He felt like a bird being watched by a snake. Ibiki began explaining the rules and the man spoke with a tone that was high and girlish but seemed even more sinister than if he'd had the same voice as Cell or Bojack. That was quite the display earlier, the man almost purred in Gohan's ear. This guy, Gohan thought, this guy's dangerous. Uh, thanks. How'd you do it, training, or, something more? There was a keen interest underlying the purr. Uh, a brutal sensei. That seemed to be the answer as the man looked slightly put out, I see. Well, there's nothing like a good teacher to make one strong. After that, there wasn't any more time for conversation, thankfully, because the tests arrived at that moment, forcing Gohan and this other guy to shut up. If the Saiyan warrior knew that he was sitting next to one of the worst villains in Konoha's history, he would have either tried to stop him, or just run away. You may begin. Ibiki called to the room. There was a shifting of papers then the rapid, talk talk talk, of pencils hitting paper. Gohan looked at the first question, which said, decipher the following code. The code wasn't legible to the team, so he skipped it and moved on to the next one. It was just as hard. If Shinobi A throws Shuriken B at an angle towards Shinobi C at a height of 10 meters, at what speed would he have to throw it to hit the target? The young Z fighter grinned. This was the kind of problem that his mother pounded into his head on a regular basis. With a deep breath, he put pencil to paper and began to write. Naruto was flipping out. This was a test. He sucked at tests. He was doomed. He was screwed. He was going to fail, and Sasuke Bastard, Sakura Chan, and Gohan were going to fail with him. How was he going to get out of this? The questions and what ifs began building in his head as he raked his hands through his scraggly blonde hair with increased frustration. That's it, he shouted to himself. I'm going to cheat so damn well, they'll never even know it. Number 54. Get out of here, that's the last cheating you'll ever do. The voice of the Chunin Proctor, loud in such a quiet room, made everyone jump as the disgruntled candidate stood and slouched out the door. Take your team with you, cheater. The Shinobi's team also stood and headed out the door. As it closed, 
Gohan caught the man's teammates begin to berate him about his carelessness. Naruto blanched. Well, maybe I won't cheat then. Pissed. Naruto-kun. The blonde looked at Hinata out of the corner of his eye. You can copy mine if you like. I'm already done. She slid her test toward him, hidden under her elbow. Naruto looked at the answers, then slapped himself mentally. I can't, Hinata. That'll get you disqualified too, I can't be responsible for that. Instead of telling the headstrong shinobi that that was the objective of the first exam, Hinata instead went red with embarrassment and awe at Naruto's supposed valor. Meanwhile, Sasuke was just as stumped as Naruto was. This is ridiculous. How do they expect us to answer these? These are chunin level questions for crying out loud. There's no way a genin could answer these, not unless they were expected to cheat. The rules of the test, the chunin proctors, the high level questions and the genin all seated so closely together, it all added up. The environment was designed to promote cheating. This wasn't an exam, it was a test of how well they could gather information without getting caught. Sasuke smirked. He had the perfect way to gather information, and the best part was, it was completely invisible unless someone looked him straight in the eye. Sharingan. The Avenger's eyes warmed as the Keke Jenke activated. Now all he had to do was find a suitable target. Hmm, that guy who was writing like a madman would do nicely. Sasuke focused on the one genin and began to mimic his arm movements. In the front of the room, Ibiki smirked at the movements of the Uchiha kid. None of the chunin in the room would catch it. The brat had all but passed this exam, but Ibiki had worked with Kakashi for too damn long not to recognize the signs of Sharingan use when he saw them. He wasn't going to bust the kid, he wasn't a proctor, just a supervisor. Unknown to most people, the chunin in the room were taking a test for the junin exam. Whether or not they passed this first exam was how well they caught all the subtle signs of cheating in the room, compared with what Ibiki saw. If they caught half the errors that Ibiki did, then they passed. It was a pretty genius setup on Konoha's part. Promote their own chunin without anyone noticing by using the chunin exams as a front. The shinobi had to hand it to the Nidame for coming up with this. It was sneaky and underhanded, just like a shinobi should be. All around the room, signs of shinobi cheating began to crop up, some were more obvious than others, but only two, Uzumaki Naruto, and Son Gohan were taking the test in earnest, Naruto because he was too thick to notice otherwise, and Gohan because the distraction from Orochimaru had prevented him from noticing the subtle hints in the rules. However, unlike Naruto, Gohan was actually done with his test, simply because of his education at the hands of his mother. Now all he was working on was that code, and it was addicting, like a crossword or sudoku puzzle. Alright. Listen up you brats, Ibiki's rough voice cut through the silence, as the twin exams halted, and the Anbu interrogator took control of the exams. Now it was no longer a test, but a quest to root out the mentally weak. Ibiki grinned sadistically to himself. This was the kind of thing he was good and just loved to do. Now I will give you the tenth question, and with it, since it's a special question, or a couple new rules. If you answer wrong, you're done, and what's worse, you will be stuck as a genin forever. The scarred man took a feral sort of pleasure at watching them squirm. Wait for it. What do you mean we'll be stuck as a genin? There are people here who've taken the exams more than once. Bingo. It's just your bad luck you got me as an examiner. He grinned. Anyone want to drop now and not risk a permanent demotion? A couple hands went up. That seemed to be all, then another few popped up, then some more and more. In no time at all, 30 genin had been dismissed. Five minutes passed, during which time, Ibiki let the silence spiral horribly. Just as his own pressure could be horrible, so too could be the pressure from not saying anything. Sure enough, five more dropped. Five times three per team, fifteen genin gone. Another five minutes passed. No one moved. Ibiki wasn't sure if anyone even breathed. I wonder what it would be like to be stuck as a genin. No respect, all that crappy pay and missions. Ha! Huh. Another couple of teams dropped. Sakura was feeling the pressure. She didn't want Sasuke kun to think she was a wimp, to be sure, but at the same time, the raven haired Avenger was the last thing on her mind. She was thinking of that blonde knucklehead on her team. The Kunoichi didn't want to deprive Naruto of the dream that he was working so hard for. If they answered wrong, they would be trapped as genin forever, and that would effectively crush Naruto's dream, 
and quite possibly, crush the blonde himself. I'm sorry, Naruto, Sasuke-kun, Gohan-kun, but I can't just let Naruto's dream go because of his stubbornness. Her hand trembled as she began to raise it. Naruto and Sasuke would be livid. Gohan probably wouldn't care seeing as he was so laid back about stuff. Naruto's hand beat hers into the air, shock rippled through Team 7. Naruto's hand dropped back with a loud thud, screw you and your question, he shouted in his characteristic loud fashion. I don't care if I'm a genin or chunin or an academy student, I'll become Hokage through sheer will if I have to, you're not going to stop me. Ibiki blinked in shock at the declaration, then he realized that the speech had galvanized the rest of the shinobi in the room. They wouldn't be going anywhere. He smiled. Well, if none of you are going to leave, the tension skyrocketed as Ibiki paused as if getting ready for the question. He grinned, only a little maliciously this time. Congratulations. You've passed the first exams. Right as his words left his mouth, a mass of black passed through the window, shattering it. Then the shadow expanded setting all the shinobi on edge, as the banner was pinned to the ceiling with kanai, and a gaudily dressed woman, wearing little but a fishnet bodysuit and a trench coat to protect her modesty as civilized society demanded, stood before them, in front of the banner which read, Second exam Proctor Mitarashi Anko, sit down, shut up and pay attention. The rookie nine had one collective thought, she's like Naruto. All right, listen up you maggots, she barked, just as rude and abrasive as Ibiki. Follow me to the training ground for your next exam. Still shocked from the abrupt entry, the genin lined up and trooped after her like ducklings. They left the village, heading out towards the walls, exited the village and arrived at a training ground that was used for mission simulations. The ground was fenced off, with massive trees that were scraggly and gnarled, their bark moist with slime and dew, curtains of moss hanging from the upraised roots. Even the leaves seemed more sinister somehow as if they were a danger in and of themselves. Gohan even saw a Venus flytrap that was more massive and monstrous than anything he'd seen before, which told the young Saiyan that the insects in the forest must have been either huge or numerous or both. Spooky shrieks sounded from the dark and shadowy trees, then a massive snake, probably six feet high and eighty feet long, emerged from the trees, tongue flickering at the assembled ninja for a moment before it reared and snapped a haggard-looking falcon out of the air in a spray of feathers. The bird shrieked once then was silent. The massive reptile turned and slithered back into the shadows. Anko grinned at the paling of several of the ninja. Welcome to training ground number 44, also known as the Forest of Death. This will be your home for the next five days. Now, before we get started with this fun little exam, you have to sign a waiver. Why? Sakura asked. Anko smiled viciously. So Konoha won't be held responsible for your deaths. More than a few got even whiter, if that were possible. Anko held up a thick stack of papers. Come and get one then wait until you're called to the tent to get your scroll. I'll explain while you fill these out. She thrust them roughly into Naruto's hands where the blonde took one then handed it to Gohan and so on. Alright, now listen. This next exam is designed to test your ability to transport captured intelligence back to friendly territory. This ground is circular with gates stationed at regular intervals. You will take a gate then, on my signal, you will take your scroll into the forest and get it, and a second scroll that you'll have to take from another team, to a tower that is exactly in the center, some 10 kilometers from here. During those five days, you must 1. Stay alive, 2. Get to the tower within the five days and finally, get the second scroll from another team. Rules? It was the raspy voice of Gara. Anko grinned again. None. Use every jutsu, trap. And strategy you know to get the second scroll. You've signed the waiver, so deaths will not be investigated, only bodies will be recovered. That seemed to excite Gara very much. Tamari and Konkuro exchanged nervous glances. This lady had signed more than a few Genin's death warrant. All right, now, everyone get a scroll, and get ready. Within the hour, with dusk rushing towards them, all the Genin were in position. Anko's voice came over the radio that was on the hip of the shinobi that was escorting Team 7. All right. Listen up you maggots. The second exam has begun. The Chunin unlocked the padlock and the chain that kept the gate secured clinked to the ground and the four-man Team 7 flew into the forest that was already dark, since it was a thick canopy. Orochimaru and his team flashed through the trees as well, though their objectives weren't the scrolls, 
but a certain team with a certain Uchiha that was in possession of a certain Keke Jenke. Split up, Orochimaru hissed to his teammates. Find Uchiha Sasuke quickly. We only have until the end of the second exam to mark him. Behind him, the two disguised members of the Sound Four, Jurubu and Tayuya, branched off and headed into the forest. They would locate Uchiha Sasuke then they would inform Orochimaru-sama of their results if he didn't get to Uchiha before they did. Only a mile or two away, Naruto shouted, Stop, Team 7 dropped to the forest floor, Gohan landing with easy grace. Since he knew that Ki would be sensed by other shinobi, he'd taken the shinobi's approach and had been bounding behind them through the branches. It had been a nice change of pace for the fighter. He would have preferred to fly, but that took a decent amount of Ki, enough that it would light him up like a torch in the forest full of enemies. Not something he wanted to do. Naruto, what is it? Sakura griped, hoping it was serious otherwise she was going to clobber him into next week. I have to go to the bathroom, the blonde replied, moving to unzip his pants. Sakura promptly cracked him over the head. Not in front of me you don't, go find a bush or something. Grumbling, and massaging the new lump on his head, the loud genin moved into the foliage. The members of Team 7 waited for the blonde to return, then there was scuffling in the foliage and Naruto reappeared wearing his usual bright grin. Man, I had to go. I managed to write my name. While Sakura once again berated the shinobi on his lack of tact, Sasuke and Gohan exchanged covert glances. Sasuke nodded minutely, confirming Gohan's worries, this wasn't Naruto. Gohan phased out, reappeared behind Naruto and seized the genin under the arms and lifted into the air, holding the struggling and swearing shinobi ten feet above the floor of the forest. Hey. Let me go, you bastard, Sasuke blurred into the false Naruto's vision and landed a hard right into the orange teen's gut, making him spit up bile. He coughed violently, gasping for air, right as the teen holding him airborne let go and allowed the ninja to collapse in a heap. Sasuke and Gohan bracketed the fake and waited for him to stand. Gohan-kun? Sasuke-kun? It wasn't that bad was it? Sakura asked. It had happened so fast that one moment. Naruto had been in front of her, then the next, he'd been floating above her head by Gohan and Sasuke had landed the blow. I mean, it was just. This isn't Naruto, Sasuke said shortly. That shut up the Kunoichi fast. Naruto's not left handed. Sure enough, the Kanai holster was on the wrong leg. And his key is wrong, Gohan added. His eyes weren't friendly. This Joker had messed with Gohan's friends, and that was one thing you did not do. Cell had found that out the hard way when the Z fighter had reacted violently to Android 16's death and had tapped his latent power, ascending to the explosive new level, Super Saiyan 2. Sasuke's right, Sakura. This isn't Naruto. Naruto's face split into a malicious grin. So, you whelps aren't as easy to fool as you look. There was a burst of smoke and Naruto was replaced with a shinobi with a yellow wetsuit, shadowed eyes and a rebreather that made his voice sound like Darth Vader. Looks like I'll have to kill you now. He lunged, a kanai appearing in his grip and lunged for Sakura, who looked frozen with fear. Gohan was in front of her, and caught the kanai on an open palm. The weapon strained to breach the Z fighter's skin, then it shattered into so many metal slivers. The rain nin's eyes widened. Shit. I can't handle this. I'm out of here. He leapt away, whipping another knife to cover his retreat. Sasuke was right at the end of the trajectory lifted his foot, and caught the weapon on his heel, forcing it to stick to his sandal. His sharingan blazed to life, the red eyes tracking the nin perfectly as he followed through and hurled the kanai back at the nin with a kick. The assailant dodged it and tried to escape, Sasuke and Gohan chasing. Hey! A little help here! Gohan looked down and saw Naruto trussed up like a Christmas present, squirming to try and get some purchase against the ropes that bound him. Naruto! He shouted, channeling a little key into a finger and firing an exact blast that sliced cleanly through the ropes and freed the blonde. Thanks, the loud kid vaulted to his feet and joined the pursuit of the escaping nin. The rain shinobi stopped for a moment and looked back, there was no sign of the brats. Lost him. That's what you think. The enemy whirled and saw Gohan, hovering just a few feet away, hanging in thin air, as if it was something he did every day. Unlike actually moving with flight, Hovering took only minimal effort and didn't alert everyone around. 
The man turned to escape another way. Sasuke was there, smirking. Going somewhere? He asked. Another turn. Naruto was there, arms crossed and a Y smile. Yo, behind the nin was just a tree trunk and he wasn't good enough with chakra to run up it without running the risk of slipping. He was trapped, like a rat. Well, that shinobi's about to get it. Now, for a little ranting. Enough with the reviews yelling at me about how Gohan could destroy Naruto, or Naruto would destroy Gohan. I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm well aware that Gohan would obliterate any shinobi, but honestly, what's more interesting, Orochimaru versus Gohan in a massive all-out slugfest, like what's coming up fast, or Gohan went Super Saiyan 2, waved a hand, and destroyed the world. The end. Personally, I like the first one. When I began this fiction, I swore to myself that I'd avoid making Gohan overpowered, and I've avoided it so far. The trapped shinobi looked desperately around for a way out, but there was none. As much as it grated on his ego to admit, these Konoha bums had him stuck. He'd grown up being taught that the Rain Village was the best village in the world and that Konoha was one of the weakest, not worth the second thought. Now he realized that was all conditioning so they wouldn't run from a war with the Leaf. The three teens were encroaching on him now, making him sweat bullets as he backed up until his wetsuit touched moist, rotting, and slimy bark. He held his hands up in a pleading manner. H hey, come on now, he pleaded, hoping to appeal to the kid's better side. Maybe we can cut a deal. Sure, Sasuke said, smirking the whole time. You can give us your scroll. Uh, but I don't have it. Wrong answer, Gohan said brightly. He was actually having a small degree of fun watching the guy squirm. He wondered if this was how his mom felt when she caught him running off on some adventure with his dad. My thoughts exactly. Sasuke replied. He looked at the blonde in the group. Naruto, you're the village prankster, maybe you can come up with an inventive punishment? Naruto thought for a second, then he grinned his fox grin and laughed in an almost sinister manner. Sure, I've got an idea. The rain shinobi shrank back under the encroaching shadows of the three boys. No, stay back. No. Five minutes later in Team 7, Sakura included, were all staring up at the struggling and swearing rain nin dangling some twenty feet over their heads. Was that all necessary? She asked, deadpan. Think of it as a morale booster, Sakura chan. Naruto answered brightly, draping an arm over her shoulder. At his expense. There was a crack of bone on bone, and then Naruto's twitching feet were where his head should have been. Hands off, Baka, Sakura said, allowing inner Sakura to seep through for an instant. The reason for the conversation in the first place was that their assailant was hanging upside down from his ankles, arms bound behind his back, and a massive gash cut into the back of his wetsuit, from which his boxers, white with red polka dots, had been pulled out and the waistband stretched until it was covering his eyes. Sasuke had been almost dismissive when he saw it. Real original, Naruto, he'd remarked. Shut the hell up, Sasuke bastard, it was the best I could do, it's not like we're in Konoha or something. Gohan and Sakura just looked at each other and shrugged, knowing there was no way to break the two bickering friends up. A strange feeling surged through Gohan and set him on edge, but before he could do anything, a massive wind swept through the area they were in. Everyone was a tangle of flying limbs as they all tried to dodge one way or another. Sasuke and Sakura got clear, but Gohan and Naruto weren't so lucky. Gohan would have made it too except that Naruto had jumped into him right as he was getting ready to phase away and knocked him over, then both of them got slammed and swept away by the rush of chakra that followed the wind. Sasuke emerged from the bush he'd managed to hide under right when the wind hit. He'd noticed Gohan's sudden tensing, and so far, when Sun Gohan tensed like that, it generally meant something bad was on the way. Thankfully he'd managed to move fast enough. Sasuke-kun. It was Sakura, her own bush rustling as she emerged from it, he held a single finger to his lips, making her be quiet. Something, some indefinable force, was making the last of the Uchiha's neck hairs stand on end. A shiver, like cold water wending its way down his spine, caressed his body, raising goosebumps on his arms. Whatever was out there, he really didn't want to meet it. Unfortunately, it seemed the thing wanted to meet them. The bushes parted and a figure emerged, and it wasn't Naruto or Gohan. Who are you? Sasuke demanded rudely. The figure, an effeminate man, merely cackled before lunging at them. 
A mile from that particular encounter, Gohan's wild head over heels tumbling along the mossy forest floor finally came to a stop as the warrior got his feet under him and dug in, even crouching and digging a hand into the soil to slow his wild skid. The Saiyan warrior straightened up and looked around the dank forest, which was cloaked in perpetual twilight from the thickness of the canopy above them. In the distance he could feel Sasuke's key clashing with that of another's, and something about that second signature felt oddly familiar, like he knew it from somewhere. Sakura was near Sasuke, and Gohan figured that the Uchiha would manage to keep her safe for the time being. Throwing his senses even farther out, the young warrior caught a slight feel of that bloodthirsty guy from before, the one who looked like an insomniac raccoon. He was a ways off, though, which was good, Gohan really didn't want to mess with him unless he had access to his transformations again. Now, where was Naruto? Gohan couldn't sense him anywhere, and that worried him. He didn't know if the hyper blonde was dead or just out of. Oh, there he was, and his key was shining strong. No worries there. So, what to do now? He had several options before him. He could check up on Naruto and make sure the blonde was mortally wounded or had a broken limb or something similar, or he could go and see just what had gotten Sasuke so riled up that he was fighting as hard as he was. In the few scant minutes Gohan had been deliberating with himself, Sasuke's key had moved all over the area they'd last been in. Then it had flickered and moved again, though this time it felt more like a retreat than anything. That made the Demi Saiyan frown. If this threat was good enough to make Uchiha Sasuke retreat, then Gohan should go and help. He looked in Naruto's direction. On the other hand, though, if this threat was that bad, then Gohan, limited as he was, would probably have a tougher time than usual in dealing with the menace. Plus, there was the fact that he was still unfamiliar with the world of the shinobi. Charging headlong into battle like he usually did was probably going to get him pummeled all the faster. Sakura, Sasuke, he whispered to the air, hoping that the verbal plea would have at least some effect, even if it was to bolster his own confidence that his teammates would hold out just a few minutes more. Hang on. I'll get Naruto and we'll both come to help out. There was a flicker and Gohan was gone. Sasuke grunted as he took a hard blow in his midsection but he stuck it out and latched firmly onto the offending limb of his adversary. The man's face showed not surprise but a mild curiosity about what the young man was planning. That became obvious when he pulled out a kanai and stuck it firmly into the man's wrist, drawing blood and forcing the shinobi, who claimed to be from the grass village, to pull back and remove the knife. Ho! The man said, looking over the injury, which bled profusely. Despite being a small incision, it was deep, nicking several veins and arteries. Not bad, Sasuke-kun, not bad at all. There was an odd note in his voice. To Sasuke it sounded almost like, satisfaction? What was there to be satisfied about? He was bleeding for Kami's sake. Shouldn't he be at least a little wary? A long serpentine tongue emerged and licked the wound clean. However, it'll take more than a mere scratch to stop me. Sasuke gulped, taking a step back by instinct. Something about this guy was foul, and the Uchiha didn't want any part of it. His hands flew together, forming a familiar sequence. Kaden. Gukaku no Jutsu. The shinobi blinked as a raging fireball spewed from Sasuke's lips and engulfed the ninja in the immediate area where he stood. The raven-haired avenger chalked the flow and waited for the fire to burn itself out. At the center of the affected area, the moss and dead leaves burned away and the soil turned to glass, was the shinobi burned to a crisp and unmoving. Sasuke smirked. There was evidence of what happened when you underestimated the Uchiha. A noise like breaking bone filled the air as the corpse cracked and fell to pieces. Sasuke started. Kawarimi. Gukaku no jutsu at your age? Very impressive, Sasuke-kun, said a silky voice in the Avenger's ear. Sasuke-kun. Sakura shouted in alarm. The Uchiha was frozen in place. This guy had switched places with something and Sasuke didn't even notice until he'd spoken. What the, what the hell are you? Sasuke asked, knowing not to turn around, not if he wanted to keep his head. Kukukukuku. The presence vanished as the man took a couple of steps back, allowing Sasuke to turn. Me? Why, I'm a shinobi, just like you. Don't screw with me, Sasuke growled. This man sounded too much like Itachi for Sasuke's liking. You're not a genin. Not by a long shot. The man snickered again. Intelligent too. My my, you are just like your brother. 
Rage erupted inside Sasuke and formed a molten ball that sat like white phosphorus in his gut. What was that? He snarled, Sharingan blazing to life, reacting to his emotion. The man sneered. Such eyes. Fine eyes, Sasuke kun. Full of rage, hatred, a for power. You could be great, Sasuke, very great indeed. Yet you're nothing but a puppet. A puppet of the Hokage and this worthless, troublesome village. Sasuke could almost hear the creepy organ music in the background as the man held out an inviting hand. Serve me, Sasuke kun. Join me, and I can show you the greatest power. The Uchiha relaxed his stance and stood tall, regarding this guy with his crimson eyes. Power? He asked, sounding tempted. Sasuke kun? Sakura asked hesitantly from the sidelines. Sasuke wasn't about to join this nut job, was he? He was a Konoha nin, loyal to the village, raised that way from birth, just as she had been, just as Naruto and Gohan kun had decided for themselves with no one to instruct them otherwise. Yes, power! The shinobi exclaimed in a purring hiss, an insane light shining on his face, arms still extended. More power than you could ever imagine and all you have to do is cast off your ties to this cesspool of a village. Cast if off, Sasuke-kun, and pledge your eternal loyalty to me and I can give you this power. He smiled malevolently. Itachi will stand not a ghost of a chance. Itachi? Sakura whispered. Was he the brother the shinobi had mentioned earlier? At least Sasuke-kun hadn't taken the offer yet. And he would never do it, would he? The kunoichi realized that she really didn't know Sasuke like she thought she did. Naruto would never do it, he would work on his own until he had power. Gohan kun had power, and had probably worked his ass off to do it. Sasuke? Sasuke had natural talent, but if he was tempted like this, she didn't know. The power to kill him? Sasuke asked. Yes? The shinobi hissed, eyes turning from brown to gold. That and more, he spread his arms wide. The power to crush him under your heel and grind his memory into dust. The power to surpass Uchiha Madara himself. The shinobi leaned forward, the insane light growing stronger, amplified by the shadows of the forest. Think of it, Sasuke kun. You would be known as the greatest Uchiha since the founding of the clan. You would go down in history as the one who restored his family to prominence. The songs and scrolls would tell of your brilliance for centuries to come. Every child would grow up knowing and idolizing your name. He seemed to calm down and regain control of himself. And all you have to do, Sasuke kun, is join me. Sasuke's head lowered, shadowing his eyes. Slowly, he began to walk forward, sandals scraping over the dirt with an ominous slowness. Sasuke kun. Sakura shouted, tears welling in her eyes. No, Sasuke kun. Ignore her, the shinobi said. She is nothing but a liability to your greatness. You don't need her. You don't need anyone. You're right. Sasuke said in a monotone, I don't need anyone. His head snapped up, Sharingan blazing, and his hand lunged forward, a kanai sliding out of the coverings that wrapped his forearms, the knife driven to the hilt in the shinobi's stomach. I don't need anyone to kill him, the avenger repeated. And I especially don't need you, he blurred away, reappearing next to Sakura, scooping her up bridal style and vaulting into the trees, ignoring the blush that was coloring the kunoichi's cheeks. The shinobi fell forward, wheezing and bleeding out from the wound in his abdomen. The gurgling continued then all color bled from the shinobi and he turned into a mound of mud. The trunk of a tree rippled and Orochimaru stepped forward, totally unharmed. He snickered in delight. Ingenious, Sasuke-kun. Simply astounding. You almost had me. A feral, predatory grin lit his face. I'm going to enjoy this. His ominous chuckling filled the clearing long after he'd disappeared in pursuit of the Uchiha and the Sharingan he possessed. Naruto. Are you alright? Naruto. The snake that Gohan was shouting at raised its triangular head and hissed at the hovering Saiyan in agitation. A muffled shouting could be heard coming from the sizable bulge in the middle of the sixty-foot-long creature, whose scaly hide was tan and dappled with green spots so dark they were almost black. Inside the snake was Naruto. He could hear Gohan shouting for him, but there was nothing he could do to answer, as mashed and compacted as he was. It was all the blonde could do to even breath. Shit, if I don't do something soon, I'm Snake Chow, Naruto thought angrily. There were two ways for him to get out of there. He could cut the snake open, or he could wait, 
be digested and then come out as a huge snake turd in a few weeks. Naruto liked the first idea better. He dug into his holster and pulled out a kanai, digging the blade into the snake's gullet as best he could. The slimy insides were too wet, though, and the knife slid off the flesh and out of Naruto's hand. In the lightless environment he was in, there was no chance at all he'd be able to find it again. Fine, Naruto said to the snake, you don't want to be cut open? Well then, get ready for plan B. He made a hand seal that he didn't need light to make sure he was doing the right way. Outside, Gohan watched helplessly as Naruto moved further down the snake's reptilian length. He could blow the snake open with a key blast, but that ran the risk of killing Naruto from the shockwave and heat. But after running through all other potential options, Gohan decided that it was the only thing he could do. He charged a blast and took aim at the snake's head, but stopped when he noticed the bulge acting funny. It was rippling and contorting like some kind of fluid-filled creature you might find in a horror movie. A muffled cry reached Gohan's ears. Taiju cage bunshin no jutsu. The snake bulged like it was an overfilled water balloon, then it exploded in a spray of blood and thicker things, covering Gohan in slime. When the chaos subsided, hundreds of Naruto's filled the area where the snake had been resting. There was a massive explosion of smoke and there was only one Naruto left. Naruto. Gohan cried with a laugh as he floated down to his friend. Wow. You showed him didn't you? I hate snakes. Naruto shouted to the world. What am I, a snake's entree? He sniffed his jacket. Damn it, now I smell like snake gut. Hey, Gohan, didn't you get eaten? The dark-haired fighter laughed, almost, but he got a little more than he bargained for. In the forest canopy, Team 8 was seared around a grisly sight. Keikiba kun? What is that? Hanada asked, sounding a little faint. That wasn't really a good question. It was quite obvious that it was a snake, a massive one at that, impaled through the roof of its mouth from the tip of the pine tree that had been rammed through the top of its skull. The lower jaw was propped open by the tip of the tree, making the snake look rather surprised. A strong wind whipped the canopy and made that tree from which the corpse was dangling sway and at the same time kicking up a foul scent. Looks like a snake, Shino said simply. We should steer clear of whoever did that. There was a thud and a cry of alarm from Hinata. Oh no. Kiba kun. The boy was laying spread eagle, his eyes swirling, and obviously out cold. What happened, Hinata? Shino asked. I don't know, he just passed out. Another wave of stench washed over them and Shino covered his nose with the sleeve of his coat. Must have been the smell. The bug user sighed. Sometimes, Kiba could be so pathetic. Thud. Oh no. Akamaru too. Shino sighed again and moved to help Hinata with his teammate. Wow. Snake skewer. Naruto said with a laugh when Gohan told him what he'd done to the snake. Remind me to never piss you off, Gohan. Sure, now let's get back to the others. I have a feeling that they're in a tight spot. Right. The two blurred away, moving to rejoin their other comrades. Sasuke slammed into the tree with enough force to make him bring up blood. The situation had gone from bad to worse. The creepy shinobi with a huge ego had caught up with them and now Sasuke was totally on the defensive, struggling to just keep breathing as the grass nin played with him. Just acknowledging that he was being toyed with set the Uchiha's teeth on edge, as much as it grated on him to admit, he really missed having Naruto and Gohan by his side. Well, this has been fun, Sasuke-kun but now I think it's time to call it a day and move on with my plans. The nin pulled back his sleeve and revealed an odd-looking tattoo on his forearm. He raised a thumb to his mouth and bid down, and then swiped the bloody digit over the tattoo, leaving a red smear. The shinobi's hands folded together in a series of seals. Ninpo. Kachiyose no jutsu. A tremendous explosion rocked the trees and when the smoke cleared, the shinobi was standing atop a mammoth snake with horned eye ridges and mud brown, rock-like scales that looked like stone armor than anything else. The man smiled. I warn you, Sasuke-kun, he likes to play before he eats. He shrugged in a gesture of mock helplessness. I just don't know what to do with him sometimes. The massive snake let off a deep and rolling hiss then lunged for him, mouth gaping wide, revealing fangs that were taller than Sasuke was. The Uchiha found himself so frozen that he couldn't do anything but sink to his knees and close his eyes waiting for the end. 
there was a noise like a collision and Sasuke found himself thinking that if this was death, then it wasn't so bad. Then he realized he wasn't dead and his eyes snapped open to see what had saved him. An astounded sight greeted his eyes. Gohan, muscles bulging and straining so hard that he was shaking, had a hard grip on each of the snake's fangs and was holding it back with just muscle power alone. The snake pushed and forced the Saiyan back a few inches, the warrior's feet digging furrows in the hard and hoary bark of the tree limb they were on. Gee Gohan! What are you waiting for? The other team ground out through gritted teeth. Get out of here! Sasuke didn't move. Gohan swore, something Sasuke had never heard him do. The Uchiha didn't even realize Gohan knew the words to use. Naruto! Get Sasuke out of here! He skidded back another few inches. Hurry, I can't hold this thing much longer. Right. A pair of arms encircled Sasuke's chest and he found himself flying through the air to land next to Sakura, who'd been paralyzed with fear ever since the Nin had used some kind of weird jutsu to show them their own deaths. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.